Good morning, everyone. My name is Sally Abella, and I'm the current president of the Washington Lakes Protective Association. I want to thank you for coming to our 33rd annual and our first ever virtual conference. We have the theme, Lake Diversity from Ponds to Reservoirs. We're very excited over the number of registrants we got and also the possibilities that are offered by using this format. But we do recognize that we're going to be missing the warmth and the in-person networking that we usually get with our um, live conferences. So we're hoping to have one next year. And we do have a contract to go to the Tri-Cities, which we've never been to, so we're excited about that. But still, it's really wonderful to know that we can connect with people this way. We're welcoming your feedback. So please do send comments, um, corrections, ideas to our email address, which is info, I-N-F-O, at walpa.org. Um, I'd next like to read a statement that we think is very appropriate to the theme of our conference and plenary this year, and that is diversity and social justice. So this is a statement and acknowledgement of American indigenous peoples. Although this conference is in internet space, we all live and work in indigenous homelands. We want to acknowledge those who walked here before us and those who are here today and also into the future, respecting their presence in their native home. We are grateful to them and we want to be respectful. This acknowledgement today is just one small act in the ongoing process of learning to care for this land and be in harmony with all of its peoples. Now for some conference housekeeping. Each of the presentations you're going to see may be either pre-recorded or live, but it will be followed by a live question and answer session. As you watch the presentation, you can send your questions to our email address, which again is info at walpa.org. We have someone who's monitoring that mailbox constantly, and that person will send your questions to the live moderator who can read them to the presenter for comment to all after the presentation. If your question isn't addressed, or if you have further questions, you can email info at walpa.org after the conference is over. Please include the session name and the presenter's name, and we can forward your question to that person for consideration and a direct reply to you. We're now going to start the conference, and I'm going to do that by turning the meeting over to Angela Strecker, who chairs our Diversity and Social Justice Committee. She will be the moderator for our plenary session this morning. Again, thanks for your attendance, and I hope you enjoy this conference and come away with some new thoughts and ideas. Angela. Thank you, Sally. <clears throat> I'm really pleased to welcome our plenary speaker, Dr. Melissa Hafner, who is an assistant professor at the um, Environmental Science and Management Department at Portland State University. Dr. Hafner received a BA, MA in Sociology from DePaul University a Master's of Science through the Department of Environment, Urban Studies and Planning from um, MIT, and a PhD from Colorado State University. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> um, her work focuses on uh, water and how social, political, and biophysical factors structure access to water, using the concept of environmental justice to draw attention to issues of fairness, inequality, in the ways different social groups gain access to natural resources, which is a really important um, conversation that we in Walpa are interested in having. She is also an author of the book, uh, Water Walkers, about portraits of Ghana street vendors um, based on her qualitative field work and has um, several scientific papers. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Hafner. My name is Melissa in the Environmental Science and Management Department at Portland State University in Portland, Oregon. Thank you for watching. And thank you, Angela Strecker, for inviting me to be here today to talk about racial and social justice in freshwater systems. I will begin my talk with a land and water acknowledgement, 
The water I research is intimately tied to the original indigenous caretakers of this area. Portland State University is located on the unceded lands of the Multnomah, Kithlamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, Chinook, Kalapuya, and many indigenous nations of the Columbia River. I honor and give thanks to the many indigenous peoples who are here today and who are connected to these ancestral grounds and water bodies. In this talk, I will define the terms environmental racism and environmental justice. I will go over three of the components of environmental justice to show how you can view your work in terms of distributive justice, procedural justice, and recognition justice. Using this framework, I will propose how you can apply this framework to your research and water management work. Finally, I will talk about how I use this framework in my own research and my, my goal of building a water injustice detection system. First, environmental racism is a term originally coined by the Reverend Dr. Ben Chavez, Dean Angelio Whitaker, a member of the Colville Confederated Tribes, defines environmental justice as any policy, practice, or directive that differentially affects or disadvantages individuals, groups, or communities based on race or color, whether intentional or not. So the issue isn't whether it's deliberate, but whether or not it exists. And scholars have found that environmental racism exists across the United States. People of color in indigenous communities are frequently and statistically more exposed to environmental hazards than white residents on a number of issues. Robert D. Bullard was one of the first scholars to study people's proximity to environmental hazards and found that over 50% of residents who live less than two miles from toxic waste facilities are people of color. Communities below the poverty line have a 35% higher exposure to particulate matter emissions compared to the overall population and it's 54% for Black communities. Right here in Oregon, community water systems serving higher proportions of Hispanic residents are more likely to exceed the arsenic maximum contaminant level, and nationwide community water systems serving a higher percentage of Hispanic residents are three times more likely to exceed nitrates as systems serving a lower percentage of Hispanic residents even when controlling for agricultural effects. You are probably familiar with the US EPA definition of environmental justice, the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin or income with respect to the development, implementation and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations and policies. I argue that this is a good start but it is not comprehensive enough to advance racial and social justice in our freshwater systems. Instead, a framework that has been used in environmental justice scholarship covers, among other things, distributive justice, procedural justice, and recognition justice. And I will give three examples to demonstrate. In terms of distributive justice, this is just one example that maps violations of the U.S. Safe Drinking Water Act, where dark blue are counties where violations are increasing and populations of people of color are increasing. Fedenik's analysis revealed that communities of color and low-income communities had higher rates of violations than other communities and Race alone have the strongest relationship to time out of compliance in which places with the highest proportions of people of color tended to spend more time out of compliance for more contaminants. People of color have unequal access to clean water. From studies like these, we can find where unequal access to clean water exists. We can combine social data with hydrological data to show us where we need to invest and think about new policies to improve distributive justice. In terms of procedural just, justice, 
We can look at who is and who is not at the decision-making table. Consider the Columbia River Treaty. There are 32 sovereign tribes that assert interest in the Columbia River watershed. And yet, as we renegotiate and remodernize the treaty for 2024, United States, Canada, Bonneville Power, and others have been holding key negotiation meetings. It wasn't until April of last year that Canada gave the three First Nations observer status. Ensuring that people have the power and information they need to fully participate in decision making is called procedural justice. Part of that is making a conscious effort to look around the table and notice when systematically and historically minoritized people and women are missing. It's not just about meeting quotas, but about the realization that there is no team without them. For example, I conducted surveys with Jola Ajabadi and Elida Cantor in the geography department here at Portland State and with some other colleagues at other universities. And we found that women who work in water-related careers report more discrimination than their male colleagues, and they do not see women in leadership positions in the water sector. We need to look at what impacts that might have on policy and implementation when not all voices are represented. In terms of recognition justice, as well as considering who is at the table, we also need to consider who is able to set the table, who has the power to set the agenda. In understanding recognition justice, it is important to understand how our history shapes where we live and how we live today, including how we live in relation to our water systems. I would like you to consider intergenerational wealth and intergenerational health and how it's racially disproportionate in the United States. Intergenerational wealth refers to the fact that some communities, like indigenous communities, were dispossessed of land and were, pre were prevented from passing wealth to their children, or how black families were prevented from home ownership despite their income level, which prevented families from accumulating and transferring wealth in ways that many white families at their income level were able to do. Also, in terms of recognition justice, as researchers and as scientists, we should recognize that data are not neutral or objective. One example in U.S. history is how data were collected and modeled in order to redline communities or prohibit Black families and people of color from buying in the quote, unquote, desirable neighborhoods, like the map here on this slide from the 1938 Home Ownership Loan Corporation in Portland. We should remember these examples to be cognizant of how we collect data, for whom does it benefit, and for what purpose, and how might it reproduce inequity. To recap, distributive justice asks, who has access? Procedural justice asks, who's at the table, and recognition justice asks, who sets the table? You can apply these ideas to your own research and work. For example, if you have your own data on cyanobacteria or emerging pollutants, you can ask, are, in, are, are low income communities and communities of color disproportionately exposed to environmental contaminants? In terms of procedural justice, you can ask how are residents, for example, Latinx farm workers, currently consulted on water quality issues? How can residents become more involved in decision-making in issues that concern them? In terms of recognition justice, you might ask, how might data or modeling perpetuate injustice and how to prevent it? And when I say that racial injustice racial justice is for everyone, what I mean by that is that it is our responsibility, those of us who have already have seats at the table, to bring up these issues in our meeting. My students, and particularly my white students, tell me that they are uncomfortable talking about racial injustice because they haven't personally experienced it. 
However, it can't be on the shoulders of those already burdened by environmental harms. It is us up, it is up to us to look around and notice who is now seated at our tables and invite them in and to listen to what they say. I would like to demonstrate what I found in my own research and how I am applying this framework to my research at PSU. First, I found that where people live in relation to environmental benefits and burdens is not always just about proximity, but it can be more complicated than that. For example, in my postdoc work at Utah State University, we calculated how far people could walk to their nearest waterway. The hypothesis being that living near waterways and green space should translate to health benefits. We found that low income and Hispanic households actually lived closer to these waterways. But when we surveyed the area, we actually found that higher income and white respondents spent more time at them and reported being more familiar with them, which would mean that they received the most health benefit. So we have a lot to learn about who has the time and the information to be able to get the most benefit from these places to access environmental benefits. It's not just about proximity. And that opens up a lot of new research questions. Secondly, this summer, we just published a paper on some work in Tillamook, Oregon, where I studied a stakeholder engagement process that met many of the procedural criteria in terms of engaging the community as equal participants. Now, this may or may not be an environmental justice issue, but what I found is that stakeholder engagement works. According to the American Community Survey of the Census in 2018, Tillamook County was 92.5% white and under the national median income level, which was about 62,000 in 2018, whereas in Tillamook County, it was 47,500. I interviewed residents who experienced chronic flooding but had a high distrust of government and scientists. Despite this, they told me about a process that lasted several years where the state county and city officials sat down with landowners to design a plan to move flood water out to the ocean quicker, causing less property damage and trauma with the extra benefit of restoring the estuary. When government officials first came in and proposed the plan, they called it Project Exodus, and it was not very popular. But after years of negotiations using Oregon Solutions as a mediator, one of my interviewees said he felt he earned a PhD in hydrology because of all the meetings and learning he had to do to truly understand the hydrology in the situation. And eventually they agreed on what is now called the landowner's preferred alternative, the Southern Flow Corridor, which was completed in 2017. Luckily, they've only have had one flood since and it seemed to have worked according to plan. What I learned through this case study is that stakeholder engagement works. We need to do this more, and we need to do it with communities of color and low-income communities that have been prevented from being a part of this process in the past. Using the environmental justice framework, I am building what I call a water injustice detection system to see if we can identify where residents can, uh, where water issues are and what residents consider are their main issues. We are mapping media stories describing water related events. We are collecting stories from Oregon residents about their perspectives and experiences with water. We are creating a database of socially and culturally informed data to understand the lived experience of how people live with floods, boil orders, algal blooms, etc. We're talking to unhoused street vendors in Portland, the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, dairy farmers on the coast, groundwater well users, irrigators in the high desert, and forest conservationist in the southern uh, Josephine County. We want to reach every corner of Oregon. I'm building this with the intention that
that we might detect emerging issues earlier and identify opportunities for fair and just solutions. With Janet Cowell in the Applied Linguistics Department at Portland State, our students are analyzing these data to look at how issues of trust and power influence decision-making on water issues. Our research questions are, what water injustices are occurring and where? What are factors that enable or hinder water justice? How has water justice and injustice changed over time? How can water injustice be prevented or mitigated? How can water justice be supported? Can water injustice be predicted or anticipated? With social data, we will have a more nuanced understanding of the lived experience of how water infrastructures and policy affect people and their daily lives. We can make more strategic and equitable investments to ensure that our water future meets these criteria. Here are some resources if you would like to learn more about water equity issues at the federal level, the Water Equity and Climate Resilience Caucus, a database of people of color in water research, including hydrologists, and one organization that is working towards data sovereignty, the data for Black lives, to ensure that the people of whom data are being collected on are benefiting from that data. I am also including several readings to learn more about environmental justice so that we can educate ourselves and determine what we want our water future to look like. Thank you very much, and I'm very much looking forward to your questions. My name is Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Um, thank you so much for that such a powerful talk. Um, and I think there's some really, you know, interesting examples and um, that you use to illustrate uh, environmental justice in water. So thank you so much for that. Um, so just to remind our, our audience that you can send questions at any time to info at walpa.org and those will get passed along to me. So um, I'll kick it off by asking, I had a question uh, about, you know, what do you see as some of the major data gaps when it comes to um, environmental justice and, and water systems? So what, you know, what don't we know? Yeah, thank you, Angela. Um, yes, there, there's quite a bit we don't know. Um, one issue that I continually come up against is having a continuous data set that, um, uh, so, um, that has uh, social data variables included in it or that can be overlaid with um, the census or social data. Um, so there's an issue of you have spatial and temporal issues when looking at um, social data versus hydrological data. Um, hydrological data might be flow data that are collected minute by minute or hour by hour, but we tend to only have, well, we only have snapshot data of human populations. So there are temporal um, issues that we need to think about and um, as well as spatial issues. So data, uh, social data like the census tend to be collected or are collected by census blocks, census tracts, and that doesn't respect watershed boundaries. So it can be very difficult to put the to put these data layers on top of each other. So we really need more high resolution social data. Um, like I said, socially informed and culturally informed data. Um, some um, issues that I run into in terms of um, understanding uh, differences in gender impacts are that things like the Bureau of Labor Statistics doesn't uh, collect uh, gender data, um, but they do collect really high resolution occupation data. Um, but then the American Community Survey 
is the opposite. They collect gender data, but they don't collect the very um, nuanced occupations. So we found it very difficult to figure out just when we asked um, how many women are there in the water sector, just um, trying to triangulate data sets in that way. Great, thanks so much. So um, I have a question from the audience. So uh, excellent presentation. Um, my experience working on lake and marine shoreline issues is that shoreline landowners tend to be higher income and white and their issues tend to get oversized deference by elected officials. Would you consider this to be a form of environmental injustice and um, do you have recommendations for how to deal with these politics? Yeah, that's a great question, and um, and that's tricky. And it's um, why I don't like to use the term environmental justice or injustice um, of, of when I talk about Tillamook, Oregon. Um, first of all, environmental justice is has legal and political consequences. Um, so I um, so. Uh, that is should be taken into consideration when talking when saying something is or is not an environmental justice issue. I tend to, if the community is saying that it is, then I uh, you know I listen to the community. Um, what I do see though on the coast um, are these instances of stakeholder engagement. Are these instances of procedural justice where? a lot of groups are trying to be better about engaging stakeholders, getting them at the table, not just consulting and informing and educating, but also really getting participation and engaging and really listening to people. And so in those terms, I really think there are a lot of lessons to be learned that we can transfer to other communities. And if we could do this process in one place, then we can replicate it in other places. Thank you. So uh, another question that I kind of wanted to kind of pose to you was thinking about, you know, the kind of next generation, you know, are we, are we training students to, you know, um, be you know, competent and um, conduct research in these fields? And, you know, how do we, you know, engage people um, in, in this, um, you know, environment with around water issues? We could always do more. Uh, I think at Western Washington University, the students actually led a process to create an environmental justice minor or major. It was student led, it was bottom up, and that is an excellent example of what we could do more in terms of educating our student population is really listen to what students want and what students need. Um, at Portland State, we um, we are trying to build our social, um, uh, just social science in general and in the interdisciplinary work in the environmental sciences and management department. Um, but I do see a lot of silos um, still to this day in the disciplines. That's great, thank you so much. Um, so uh, if there are any, um, people, panelists that want to, you know, um, ask any questions, this could be a good opportunity as well. Um, I would say that, you know, I've actually known um, Melissa for several years, and it's been a real pleasure to get to learn more about her research and how it integrates with um, freshwater, you know, freshwater systems and ecology. And I love the ideas about, you know, thinking about, um, you know, cyanobacterial toxins and, and who that's affecting. I think that's really, really key. Sally, it looks like you might have a question. Yeah, I um, actually sent it to uh, info, but I can say it here. Uh, I'm wondering how you can encourage people of color to participate in the procedural level when there's such a well-deserved level of distrust about being used in these kinds of committees. Yes, that is, it's absolutely an issue. We really need to do the work um, to educate ourselves first. And, um, and we, I feel like that we really need to have a con conversation about compensation. Um, this, we live in a capitalist market economy and uh, that is based on being paid for labor and time. 
And we need to recognize that um, our BIPOC leaders, our Black, Indigenous, and people of color leaders are and people are being asked to do a lot of unpaid labor all the time. And so coming to um, these tables is work, is time. People need childcare. Um, uh, there's, uh, we need to create the infrastructure um, to make it possible and then to do the work within ourselves to make it inclusive and equitable. Great question, thank you. So with that, um, oh, Mark, looks like Mark has a question. Looks like you're muted, Mark. Hi, um, Jim, thank you very much. Um, uh, regarding um, uh, what I was thinking about is a lot of our land use policy is predicated on how much that land can generate an income from grazing from hunting licenses from uh, farming and that um, that is pretty uh, focused on a, a, a pretty small subset of people that use that land and i was wondering how what would be a way to shift that towards a more equitable representation of land users so that um, indigenous populations could be um, more accurately represented for how they use the land. Yeah, that that's a great question. And I think that it would be a case by case basis. I'm not sure if I could um, speak to um, blanket statements. That is when the voices, you know, getting representation is so important because that should be a question of, um, you know, identifying um, who the right stakeholders are, how, how to get them engaged, how people interact with land in other ways um, than just using the land. Um, and especially with indigenous populations, like you said, the historical uses of the land too, people are still connected to the land, um, even if they have been displaced from that land. Thank you. So I think we'll switch gears and um, kind of move into, a, a, oh, well, here's another question. <laughs> oh, they're coming up on the chats. Okay. Um, does anyone collect information on who uses a lake other than lakeshore homeowners? What are methods to do this to capture communities of color? That's an excellent question. Off the top of my head, I don't know of data layers for lake users. When I come across these data, they seem to be one off kind of projects where a restoration project is trying to, you know, is monitoring or evaluating um, a restoration project that they did. So they ask people, but that would be great. That, um, there's a concept called missing data of like, what are the data that we don't even know that we don't have? Because as scientists, we collect data on what we think we need, but um, there are a lot of other people who are not scientists who also need data. So that's a question that we should be asking of what are the other data that we need? Um, and, uh, and, uh, yeah, and having comprehensive data over time that's consistently taken, uh, that's consistently gathered is a big issue. Um, I don't know of one for lakes, but that would be a great data set to have. This is actually a great um, question and segue because um, the panel discussion tomorrow is going to touch on a lot of these issues about um, like having access to lakes for the public and, you know, not knowing who's um, not being captured, you know, by um, our current collection data or information. Okay, so um, let's change gears a little bit here. We're going to have kind of a more of a panel discussion. And so um, uh, for the UW Tacoma folks, if you could queue up the, um, the PowerPoint, I'll just give a quick introduction. So uh, WALPA formed a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee in response to the tragic events that unfolded this spring and summer. 
in organizing this plenary session, which we are so um, you know, grateful to um, Melissa for attending and, and speaking to us, we wanted to shine a light on the challenges faced by members of marginalized groups. One of our first acts was to conduct a brief pre-conference survey to better understand our members. And so I wanna lead off by presenting some of these results. Again, this was just a really brief survey. Um, we had, you know, quite a bit, a pr pretty good response. So I'm really, you know, thank you to everyone who responded. Um, and so uh, I'll kind of walk through some of those results and then I will uh, introduce the panelists um, at, at the end of that. Okay, so next slide. Okay. So the first question we had was, um, I need to make this a little bigger, um, is, you know, how valuable is it to increase diversity and equity within the WALPA membership if that should be a priority focus area? And, you know, we see pretty strong agreement, either most responses in this agree or strongly um, agree category. Next slide, please. Uh, next question was, it, it's important that WALPA works to make public access to lakes equitable for individuals from all backgrounds. And again, we see pretty, you know, um, a lot of responses in the strongly agree and agree. And so that's um, kind of speaking to some of those questions that were arising from, from the, our, our plenary talk. Next slide. Uh, at a WALPA conference, have you experienced any discrimination, microaggressions, or other behavior that made you uncomfortable? Um, you know, overwhelmingly no, but still a small percentage of folks that were not sure or answered yes to that. So. That's something that we want to um, kind of try to better understand and be a more um, inclusive uh, society. Next slide. Thank you. <laughs> um, have you been harassed or discriminated against based on race, gender, sexual orientation, disability status, or identity while working professionally or as a student in lake and watershed protection, restoration, or management? And um, this uh, resulted in kind of a stronger response in terms of, you know, more than 20% of respondents said yes, and another kind of chunk said not sure. And so this is um, something that we, I think, is really important for us to understand um, within our um, professional and student ranks. Next slide. And so the last question was ideas about making WAPA a more diverse and inclusive organization and it's a little difficult to capture our, all you know the many responses and there were lots of terrific ones and um, so I used a word cloud here to kind of reflect some of those responses and and we see that you know um, we got there are a lot of responses about getting students engaged earlier on in the field and um, engaging more diverse communities at you know through different types of um, approaches and different mechanisms and access is on there as well so that kind of you know ties in nicely for what um you know both of today and 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 our discussion tomorrow so um let me uh introduce our panelists here um so if the panelists can turn on their videos okay i think we're still missing marco Marco, are you there? Hello, it's not letting me for some reason. <laughs> it okay. says you cannot stop your video because of the host has stopped it. Okay, oh. okay. I'll, um, I'll see if the technicians oh. can do that. There you go. We're good. Okay. We're live. <laughs> Hello, I'm Marco. <laughs> um, okay, so here's our, our, um, our distinguished panel. So we have um, Marco Barajas, who's a recent graduate of UW Tacoma. Dr. Avery Shineman, a faculty member at um, University of Washington in Bothell. Uh, Mark Rosencrantz, a water resource specialist at the Lake Oswego Corporation, and um, our, kind of our connection to the, um, our parent organization, uh, the National, or sorry, North American Lake Management Society. And then of course, Dr. Hafner, our plenary speaker. So welcome everyone. Okay, so just to remind you, the audience, you can submit questions to the panel um, for us to discuss. Uh, I have some kind of to get us kicked off with. So um, the first question, thinking about, you know, our regional societies like Walpa, but also Oregon Lakes um, and our national societies, you know, what should they be thinking about when it comes to issues of diversity, equity and inclusion? 
So maybe why don't we start? Um, I know this is something that Mark's been thinking about for a little bit. So why don't we let him start and then um, just maybe people flag me if you know if they want to jump in. Thank you, Angela. And um, this is a very important issue these days, and I'm I'm glad that uh, Walt is is speaking to it. Um, Noms has been working on this um, issue a lot this year as well. And we have um, we started a few uh, programs. Uh, we've, um, we've had a code of professional ethics for a couple of years now. And that is uh, something geared more towards our conferences so that uh, uh, participants, if they do experience any um, discrimination, um, or anything they feel uncomfortable with, they have somebody that they can come to to report these issues and we'll, uh, we can follow up on them. And uh, this year we, uh, we established a diversity tax task force for trying to um, include more uh, diverse voices in the organization. Um, as, as you know, NOMS, uh, if, if anybody has been participating in NOMS, they know that it's a um, pretty white organization and not a whole lot of representation from, um, from people of color. So we're working on that this year and we've taken some, um, uh, some steps towards uh, making, uh, making our organization a little bit more representative and we put out a, we have a diversity page on our website that uh, that includes our diversity statement in support of Black Lives. Um, we have a task force and the task force is working towards trying to bring in those voices of um, historically marginalized communities and starting by reaching out to historical Black um, colleges and universities and um, seeing if they would want to participate in our, uh, in our conferences, how NOMS can help them in uh, fostering an interest in the aquatic sciences. And uh, we are participating in the Consortium of Aquatic Sciences, which is a group of about a dozen or so um, organizations that all are working on these diversity issues as well. Um, next week, there's the um, SACNAS conference, which is the Society for Advancements of Chicanos, Hispanics, and Native Americans in Sciences. And NOMS has um, partnered on sponsoring a booth at that conference, and I'll be attending um, during some portions of, uh, of the conference next week. And what I think the on the ground things that we need to do in working with the um, working with the affiliates like WALPA and NOMS is we need to really foster an interest in the aquatic sciences from those that are considering college or considering graduate school. So for instance, um, providing resources to high school and college teachers or high school um, science teachers so that uh, they have uh, resources to be able to teach aquatic sciences, to be able to uh, reach out to the, uh, the high schools in underserved, historically underserved communities and have them they may have an interest in the aquatic sciences. They may love doing that. They may love going out and playing in streams and ponds, but have no idea that that is a location that they can pursue. So just providing, I guess, um, um, reducing the barriers to entry for this field. Because a lot of the times it's, um, it's people that have been, uh, their parents are interested in the field and and they've always they've known about it they've kind of been fostered in that direction along the way so we need to try to pull some of these folks in and and teach them about the uh the, the um opportunities for this uh, vocation and the same thing with university level two undergraduates trying to encourage them to um 
to look into the aquatic sciences. And when I say this is something that the affiliates are going to have to do, it's because a lot of these universities and a lot of these schools are, uh, it's not something, there's so many of them that there's, it's not somebody at home that can go through and that can go through and do this. It's going to require work at the individual state level to compile this information so that NOMS has um, contacts that they can um, that they can reach out to. So that's kind of an overall um, uh, the overall effort that NOMS is doing to try to um, first off increase the diversity in aquatic sciences in general, and then um, more specifically um, to increase the diversity of our organization um, and the membership of NOMS. Thanks, Mark. Um, Melissa, do you want to jump in at all? Yeah, that's great. These are all good steps. I um, this I might be jumping ahead, Angela, to a future question that you may have, but you brought it up um, when I was watching your PowerPoint and saw how um, uh, I believe that people um, were had experienced some form of discrimination or harassment as a student or professionally this is something i hear a lot from women um particularly and um and in field work when they're in a remote site there isn't that uh, infrastructure and there's more opportunity um for um for bullying for harassment and for um trying to repress people from reporting it um i and even and even within academia when there are those infrastructures that are readily available um people um are still hesitant because they don't think that it's going to do anything they still think that the victim is going to be the one who pays the price um that there aren't going to be consequences that um uh, things aren't going to get be investigated so there's a history there um that um we really need to look at across the board and really think about how we can strengthen our protections um strengthen our systems really show demonstrate that um reports are being investigated and something is happening um I, I, people need to see that i think uh, especially because uh, there is a history there that um, things were not taken as seriously as they should. And I think that will have ramifications down the line for people feeling more included, feeling more like they belong. Absolutely. Um, Marco or Avery, would you like to weigh in here? Yeah, I kind of want to circle back to um, the inclusion part. And I had a really great idea, and this is from personal experience at UW Tacoma, is that we actually do not have like a club or a registered student organization where we can have a group of students that can be part of maybe the logical field. And this is a great step into maybe some sort of an advertisement or having more students engaged in the limnological field and freshwater system. And the biggest barrier is that maybe not a lot of people don't know about this field. Uh, you often hear about maybe other degrees, but this is like the underdog of the degrees. I agree with that. <laughs> yeah, and I'll, I'll add um, that I think coming back both to what Mark and Mark were saying, for the role of WOLPA or a regional society, um, it can feel maybe like we don't have a lot of role because we don't, we're not the gatekeepers to very much. We're not the gatekeepers to admissions to anything. We don't have money that we're funding things with, but we are kind of a, a gatekeeper in some ways to networking, right? This is a great organization for networking across academia and industry um, and government. Um, and that's a place where we can really bring, for example, make a big effort to reaching out to student organizations that are trying to start up and making sure that we're being really active in bringing them in, making sure that we're connecting with other regional organizations um, and not just not just NALMS or not just the Oregon Lakes Association, but maybe looking um, for other places that we can bring in networking because that's 
that's really a place that we hold some um, power to make a change that, that maybe we don't have a lot of keys in other places. Great. Thanks, everyone, for those terrific and um, thoughtful statements. Uh, we're getting some good questions in from um, the audience, so I'm going to kind of talk, circle around to some of those. Um, there's a question about uh, if um, it says, I'm curious if you could speak on the racial makeup of the field. In my experience, it seems like the water resources, water quality field is primarily highly educated white folks. Um, what are ways we can work to diversify this area without tokenizing people of color? Anyone want to take a stab at that one? Yeah, I can. Um, I can speak a little bit to that, and that's that's um, that is something that we at Gnomes have um, we have considered because we didn't want to um, we didn't want to just start to defar diversify our, um, our, our board participation at NOMS for that reason that we didn't want to just tokenize it. We wanted to take some ac actual steps to increase the diversity of the field in general by working through, um, through the educational system, I guess, to try to uh, reduce the barriers for people that wanted to enter the field. Uh, and like Marco mentioned, um, a lot of people don't know about limnology. They don't know, uh, you know, they know about biology, they know about chemistry, they know about physics, but all of that is wrapped up into limnology. And being able to um, reach out to these universities and even if they have a biology um, program or a chemistry program, encourage them to go the step farther and integrate those into a limnology program because there probably are students that would really love that field. So that's, that's kind of the, uh, and that's, that's really a great question. And, and we, we, that's kind of where we're starting at NOMS at the national level is to try to diversify the student base entering the field and then um, incorporating those voices into like the student organization. We have a student committee um at, at part of as uh, as part of norms and uh, we have student membership that's actually quite affordable and uh, to bring those groups in and start to really um, hear their voices and hear their concerns um and and bring that into the organization thank you mark anyone want to jump in on that if um Sure, I'll just say that I think it's, um, yeah, it's similarly as a, from a position at a um, university, I think a lot of students do, uh, we see most of our students who come in knowing that they want to do environmental science majors are coming from high schools that maybe offered AP environmental science um, that had some prior exposure. Um, and so yeah, you have to make a really, uh, an effort to reach out to K-12 schools, but also an effort, um, as you said, to, to do some integration with biology and chemistry programs, maybe where students would be drawn first to make clear what some of the applications are. And I think, again, a role that WALPA or NALMS could play is um, making the career paths really apparent, you know, making uh, some, some public, you know, videos, appearances, uh, speaker series, visits to schools, whatever it might be. Um, to let people see what those jobs are like. I know one of the experiences I've had in teaching limnology uh, and some of the, some folks probably who are here from some of the different county agencies, we take students out and introduce them to limnologists who work and the students are like, oh, that's, that's a job. That's not just a class, that's actually a job, right? Um, but we don't see limnologists the way we see doctors and dentists and, and even biologists you know, on TV. So making that really clear, I think is, is an important piece that seems a little bit, um, egocentric maybe, but I think is actually really helpful. Great, thanks. Um, I think, so we, yeah, we're getting lots of great questions. So I'm gonna maybe try to get through a couple more of those, um, but I definitely wanna hear from everyone. So is anyone trying to engage the tribes around lakes? They have worked hard on access to rivers and marine shorelines, but I haven't heard as much around lakes, especially those that are on identified reservations. and. Um, yeah, I'd love to hear from anybody on that. I don't, I'm not aware of um, that much with lake access. Anybody? 
<laughs> no, yeah, I'm getting a bunch of shaking heads. Um, <laughs> I, think, well, I, I can say something about that if you want. Right. Um, actually, when I was at the University of Washington, so this would have been back in the 90s, we were engaged with the Quinaults because um, they were very interested in monitoring water quality at Lake Quinault. But I don't know if that's still ongoing. We uh, basically helped them with limnological methods and with phytoplankton identification, that kind of thing. And then they took it over themselves. So they were being proactive um, at that time. And I, I don't know where that went, but just wanted to report that. <laughs> Thank so you, I'll go Sally. away now. <laughs> Thanks, Sally. Melissa? Yeah, I, um, I just want to point out that um, in indigenous ways of knowing and traditional ways of ecological knowledge, um, don't often appear in academia in the academic sense and in the lake science sense. However, indigenous communities are very interconnected with wa water in general, water as the first of the first foods. Um, and I am not indigenous, so I cannot speak on this, um, but I, it would be interesting to ask the question in, um, in which ways are indigenous trying to engage us and um, to, to flip that question and really um, think about the spaces in which we can learn about um, lakes and um, traditional ways of knowledge from them. Thank you. And I think that's a, that's a really good point in that um, traditional limnological instruction should include some of the um, historical no knowledge from indigenous populations who have who have lived on these lakes and with these lakes and survived as in in concert with these lakes for millennia so um, their knowledge is certainly useful um, they're certainly beneficial and could uh, provide real insight into um, into how to how to manage the resource Okay, I think we have time for one more question um, before we wrap up. So there was a question, I wonder if making data widely available to the public could play at least a minor role by lowering the barrier to data access for exploration mm -hmm. by students and researchers, regardless of status funding to some extent, which I think is an important recognition that, you know, research can be really, you know, expensive. Um, perhaps someone on the panel could speak to that. So, Marco, I, hate to, I don't want to totally put you on the spot, but um, I would love to hear your input here as a, you know, a recent, recent graduate. I think it, it is a great idea to have the data accessible to the public. Um, maybe that's something that we can work closely to with lake associations and see what's going on with their local urban lakes and maybe with that they can have a closer connection or relationship with the lake and maybe somehow make it appreciate more for uh, the aquatic life. Thanks. I, and I, if I can just comment a little bit on that, I think that that also ties really well in with, uh, with, this, Nash, with, this, with this goal of trying to um, encourage folks to go into this field and providing that data to high school or undergraduate um, uh, professors and teachers so that they can use that as a case study. And, and like Marco was saying, that if the students in the area are looking at data from a local lake, then they really can, um, they can really make a close connection and that, would, and, and that would be something that would really kind of trigger an interest, I would think, um, to want to learn more and to to really seek out this uh, uh, this educational path. Thanks, Mark. Avery, Melissa, do you want to weigh in before we wrap up? All good. <laughs> okay, I think um, I'm. What? Well, yeah. Thank to, uh, thanks to everyone for participating in the panel. We had lots of great questions and lots of great input from everyone. I'm really pleased um, to 
hate, you know, to hear such um, a broad range of voices. And so um, just wanted to kind of quickly remind everyone that uh, we'll restart again at 9.10 for the lake restoration session. And so um, just I, I will applaud <laughs> all of our panelists. And um, thank you for being here uh, this morning.
Hi, everyone. We are back with our first session of the day. It's entitled Lake Restoration, and we have three speakers. The first two will be pre-recorded, and the third one will be a live presentation. We will have a question and answer after the first presenter, and then the next two will happen consecutively with a question and answer at the end for both presenters. So our first one today is Rob Zazette from Herrera Environmental. Rob? And so on, so I'd like to thank you all for coming to the uh, Walpa 2020 virtual conference. Um, Those lakes are Anderson Lake and Lone Lake. Anderson Lake is located in Jefferson County, just south of Port Townsend, shown on this Google Earth map to the west. And east of that, on the same latitude, is Lone Lake on Whidbey Island, uh, just east of Coopville. Further to, further the, east to east the east Everett, and further to the east is Storm Lake. You may wonder why Storm Lake. Well, that's because that's now uh, my lake. I just bought a house on Storm Lake, and I thought you might want to know where that is all on the same latitude. So uh, both projects were funded by Washington State Department of Ecology. Thank you very much. Uh, with the Algae Grant Program, this is a fabulous program we're lucky to have here in Washington. Jefferson County Public Health uh, administered the Anderson Lake uh, Algae Management Plan, while Whidbey Island Conservation District administered the Lone Lake Algae Management Plan. We had a one-year monitoring uh, period uh, for the diagnostic study to collect all the nutrient inputs and water inputs to do our water and phosphorus budget and characterize conditions in each of the lakes, beginning in March of 2019 and ending, ending in February of 2020, uh, and producing the plans or reports in June of 2020. Here are the watersheds. Uh, on different scales because Lone Lake is four times larger than Anderson Lake. Anderson Lake watershed is under 600 acres, very small, uh, located 100% in the Anderson Lake State Park. But both watersheds are dominated by forest cover with the um, addition of uh, low density residential and some farmland uh, development or land use in the Lone Lake watershed. The Lone Lake watershed is uh, drains from the north principally into two uh, main tributaries that drain to the north shore of Lone Lake, whereas Anderson Lake is fed by much smaller intermittent tributaries, primarily along the west shore. Both lakes drain to the south out of outlet channel. Here's the bathymetry uh, maps of each lake. Anderson Lake is about two thirds the size of Lone Lake, which is about 100 acres. Um, however, the volumes are similar because Anderson Lake is deeper. Anderson Lake is a maximum depth of nine meters, almost twice that of the five meter depth in Lone Lake. Thermal structure uh, is um, different because of this different morphology. In fact, Anderson Lake is monomictic. It's deep enough to stratify. Uh, in the summer, uh, shown in the upper left isopleth of temperature. The uh, stratification is a rather thick metal inman rather than a sh narrow thermocline, whereas the Lone Lake is polymicnic. You can see from the vertical temperature profiles in the upper right that it never uh, stratified at all in 2019. Uh, oxygen, however, is also very different because of the stratification in Anderson Lake. Oxygen is lost below the thermocline um, and uh, all summer long it was anoxic uh, below a depth of 15 feet from June through September. Whereas Lone Lake uh, did see some oxygen depression, I would say, during the summer, but it never really reached a level of anoxia until, except for one bottom sample on one sampling date in July. Trophic State, uh, Lone Lake 
takes the cake there at 68 as an average index approaching uh, hypereutrophy. But they're both eutrophic lakes. They do also have the similar pattern of increasing trophic state index from uh, SECI transparency to chlorophyll algae biomass up to the highest index for total phosphorus, indicating that phosphorus is in abundant supply, uh, more so um, than uh, would be expected for the amount of algae in the lakes. It turns out phosphorus is the limiting nutrient uh, primarily in Anderson Lake, although both nutrients can uh, appear to have uh, been limiting through part of the summer, whereas Lone Lake was almost exclusively limited by nitrogen during the summer, I should say, uh, during the summer algae growing season. Here's the cyanotoxins. This is why we're here. Um, Anatoxin A uh, is clearly uh, the problem child here. In uh, comparison to the one microgram per liter guideline, it's a, as you may know, it's a, a neurotoxin and has a very low uh, concentration tolerance for uh, humans and mammals that consume it. In fact, uh, a dog died in Anderson Lake during our study year, and you can maybe see why. Uh, the concentrations of anatoxin A in Anderson Lake exceed 100 times on average um, this guideline, but so did Lone Lake um, and even had a higher maximum, uh, at least among the last four years that we compiled data here in this table. But microcystin is present in both lakes, didn't exceed uh, the guideline in Anderson Lake in 2019, but has uh, the past three out of four years in uh, Lone Lake um, but at, at lower levels, obviously, in, in comparison to anatoxin A. The major toxin producer is Delicospermum, and in both lakes, um, it's been well documented by Theo Dreher, and who you should see his presentation later on, in Anderson Lake. Um, microcystis, though, is also present and abundant and dominant at times in Lone Lake and responsible for the microcystin production there, apparently. The causes are different. Uh, Anderson Lake has clearly had a toxic algae problem for a long time. And in fact, it's Will Hobbs' paleoluminological study that he presented at WAPA last year showing that cyanobacteria had been present in that lake for over a century and really kicked off in high gear based on pigment analysis in the mid 1900s when coincidentally cattle were grazing in that watershed. They have had a sense declined, but are obviously clearly at high levels. So you can imagine how high they were in the mid 1900s when they were um, pigment analysis in the sediments at any rate were hundreds of times that we are today. But moving over to Lone Lake uh, is a more recent phenomenon. In fact, just over 10 years ago uh, has been um, the problem. Uh, anatoxin was first detected in 2010, microcystin a few years before that. Um, it really was primarily, in my opinion, initiated from the grass carp plant in 2007. Unfortunately, Lone Lake um, used to be the best fishing lake um, in Washington, healthy aquatic plant community, until Egeria densa invaded that plant in the early 2000s. And uh, following that with herbicide treatment uh, that didn't work to the grass carp, uh, the plants have since been lost entirely in that lake. They're coming back, but uh, the grass carp took, uh, took them out. Moving forward is the water budget. So a lot of work went into this water budget, a lot of monitoring of flows and rainfall, and you see it is rainfall. It's a direct precip. It's out of the sky where these lakes get most of their water. A stormwater runoff is small. They're very um, pervious, undeveloped forested soils, therefore not generating a lot of runoff. Uh, the retention time is about two years in Lone Lake and three times longer than that in Anderson Lake because of its smaller basin. Uh, most of the lake is lost by evaporation and not much out the outlet stream. However, on the balance, it's really going out by groundwater. So we see this negative groundwater input at the bottom of about 100% in both lakes during the summer because those lakes uh, levels dropped as that's what the, the, the negative uh, input minus the, you can see the lake storage change uh, decreased in the summer and the outlets dried up and the water um, exited the lake through the soils, wetland soils and out to the south 
of the lake through the ground. The phosphorus budget uh, has a very different picture. Um, despite all that water coming in from the sky, not much phosphorus is less than 5% uh, in both lakes on an annual or summer basis. Um, the very limited base flow and very uh, small amount of stormwater runoff. Uh, similar, uh, Lee, there is some groundwater inputs uh, on an annual basis, which are reasonable, but not on in the summer. So it's in the summer where you're getting this sediment phosphorus release. All the sediment phosphorus releases occurring in the summer. We calculated several ways. The average shown here showed 97% of the um, phosphorus input to the lake during the summer came from sediment release of phosphorus and 83%, not quite as much, in Lone Lake. Uh, as a result, um, the clearly shows this high internal phosphorus loading is from a legacy of input um, from the watershed that uh, would necessarily require in-lake management to reduce the phosphorus and hence the algal biomass to meet water quality goals. So here are uh, algae management objectives we developed for Lone Lake. You won't, they are similar to the ones we developed for Anderson Lake, but those aren't shown here because they were removed from the report. Um, Seattle, I'm sorry, Seattle. The uh, Washington State uh, Parks, which owns the uh, Anderson Lake and decided that they didn't want to manage algae or cyanobacteria blooms in the lake because it's a natural phenomena. As shown by Wills, they've been growing in the lake for over a century. And their policy, uh, the state parks, is to not manage natural phenomena. Therefore, uh, we turned it into a water quality report and not any management objectives. So let's proceed with Lone Lake, which was very similar to what we'd originally proposed for uh, Anderson Lake with some nuances. But at any rate, Lone Lake here, uh, these objectives were to reduce the trophic status from eutrophic to mesotrophic with these summer average um, uh, thresholds uh, presented here, which would require a phosphorus reduction load overall of 90% in the summer to achieve an average phosphorus phosphorus concentration of 24 micrograms per liter in the lake. This would unnecessarily reduce toxic algae blooms, the amount of algae and the toxins um, produced by them. Um, this is intended to take this shift um, from by reducing the nutrient loading in this graphic to the left to reducing algal biomass down uh, from the top and providing a more uh, healthier aquatic plant community and moving the lake from its current turbid cyanobacteria dominated state to its previous uh, clear water aquatic plant community state. These are the feasible management options, in lake management options. I don't have time to show the infeasible ones or the management, uh, the watershed management ones, but looking at a couple of options for phosphorus inactivation, uh, some mixing either by aeration or the newer nanobubble technique technology or the solar beam, uh, along with LG Sonic, another new, uh, newer treatment a device that uh, restricts algal cyanobacteria migration and cell formation, uh, but along with the uh, traditional algicides. Our recommendation was to further evaluate a no action alternative versus three of the treatment alternatives, including alum, nanobubblers, and LG Sonic. The community elected to go with the no action alternative, principally because they don't have funds for a technological management solution, um, but to continue also to conduct uh, water quality monitoring to see if in fact the lake is continuing to improve in water quality as the citizens are removing grass carp with their bow and arrow and as they, as they die off with age, um, but to also assess the watershed nutrients um, from either manure uh, applications and fertilizer applications and septic source control. And with that, I have plenty of time for questions. So thank you. Hi, um, please send your questions in. 
We haven't seen any yet, but I do have one. And uh, Rob, I'm wondering about the, uh, the state's assessment of the condition of Anderson Lake as being natural. Wouldn't you consider that this, what Will found before the cattle farming would actually be the natural state? So I'm wondering what the basis was for that decision, or, or if you know. Well, it's their decision. Um, but I will say I, I didn't show the uh, graph, a Will's graph, which is high level. Well, uh, the, the current levels of pigments in the sediment um, in the recent sediments near the surface are at the same as they were before the cattle. So the cattle was a blip. So it's okay. arguable that it's back to natural conditions today, I guess. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, the other thing would be, um, ah, lost my train of thought. Sorry. Anyway. Um, so if you have further questions for Rob, please do send them to info at walpa.org. We've been finding that there's sometimes a lag between when you send it and when we get it. Um, if you will put the session name or number and the presenter along with your question, we can direct them to the presenters and they can respond to you. So we're going to move on to our next talk and that will be Shannon Bradabo. And she is with Tetra Tech. She is giving the first of two consecutive talks um, about a tale of two lakes. So Shannon, you want to unmute and put on your picture and we will run your presentation. Thanks. Oh, I'm an environmental engineer with Tetra Tech and I'm going to talk about a project that we just finished with Snohomish County, uh, looking at the nutrient dynamics of two small lakes. And we did this using a cost effective approach. I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors, Dr. Harry Gibbons with Tetra Tech and Marissa Bergdorf, Jen Oden and Katie Ruthenberg with Snohomish County Surface Water Management. A little bit of background. We um, looked at the nutrient dynamics of two small residential lakes located in Snohomish County. Both of these lakes have a history of toxic algae blooms. Sunday Lake, which is the lake located in the top upper right corner of your slide, is 49 acres in size and has a maximum depth of 6.1 meters. The lake stratifies very strongly in the summertime, starting usually around April or May and going until October. Uh, the same happens at Lake Loma, very strong stratification in the summer. Lake Loma is slightly smaller than Sunday at only 23 acres, but has a slightly deeper maximum depth of 8.5 meters. Lake Loma is shown um, in the picture in the lower left-hand corner of your slide. Both lakes have very active and concerned groups of lake residents who wanted to do something about the declining water quality of each lake. Snohomish County obtained funding from the Washington Department of Ecology Freshwater Algae Program to develop algae control plans for both of these lakes. And I'm going to be talking about the um, nutrient component and understanding the nutrient dynamics which of each of these lakes which went into the development of the algae control plans. This graph just gives you a little bit of background in terms of summer average total phosphorus for Sunday Lake and Lake Loma. Um, it, this graph shows the long-term average of epilimnetic summer total phosphorus. You can see that Sunday Lake has a, a long-term average of around 39 micrograms per liter and Lake Loma is not far behind with an average um, long-term average of summer epilimnetic TP of 33 micrograms per liter. Both of these lakes are um, pretty productive systems. This graph uh, shows you uh, a summary of average uh, hypolimnetic phosphorus for each lake compared to other lakes within Snohomish County. Both lakes have high average um, hypolimnetic TP during the summer and experience a buildup through that uh, occurs throughout the summer. 
which is indicative of internal loading or the release of phosphorus from the sediments under anoxic conditions. As I mentioned, both of these lakes stratify very strongly. And um, once stratification uh, sets up in early spring, the dissolved oxygen at the bottom of these lakes almost instantaneously goes to zero and remains at zero or very low throughout the entire summer. So the project goals, the overall goal of the project was to identify the most suitable strategies for reducing phosphorus and subsequent toxic algae blooms in each of these lakes. Um, we developed algae control plans for each of the lakes and the goals for each of those plans um, were to determine the major sources and magnitude of phosphorus loading to each of the lakes, uh, was to determine the best alternatives that could be implemented to reduce that phosphorus loading, and then to work with the lake community to determine what their preferred alternative uh, strategy would be. The focus of this talk is centered on that first goal of each of the plans, which was to determine and estimate the major sources and amounts of phosphorus loading to each of the lakes. Our project approach was maybe slightly different than we had used in the past. Um, it used more of a cost effective approach and relied on a combination of historic data, recent water quality and sediment studies, and did not include a full hydrologic model, nutrient budget or mass balance model. The funds um, just were not available for that type of, of project. And the costs for doing a full hydrologic budget and detailed study were potentially greater than most of the restoration options for these small lakes. So we determined that the we could accept a higher degree of uncertainty in our findings of our study in order to develop a more practical plan to proceed with lake restoration for Sunday and uh, Lake Loma. So I'm going to be focused on talking about the nutrient dynamics and how we uh, kind of ana uh, analyzed and estimated the loadings to each of these lakes. And this is just a simple graphic showing the different components of the phosphorus loading to each of these lakes. So we have uh, phosphorus loading from surface runoff from the watershed. We have loading from direct precipitation onto the lake surface. Uh, we have loading from groundwater, which was uh, the most challenging to determine. We have internal loading from the uh, lake sediments, and we also have loading from waterfowl, which turned out to be a significant contributor, um, especially in Sunday Lake. So first, let's start with looking at the phosphorus load from direct precipitation onto the lake surfaces. So we used the same rain gauge data for both lakes, and that was data from a uh, gauge at Lake Crabapple, which is actually the downstream lake um, from Lake Loma. And this graph shows you annual total rainfall from 2008 to 2018, with a 10 year average of just over 38 inches of rain. Most of that rainfall occurs between October and April, with a minimum amount of precipitation during the summer months. We assumed a phosphorus concentration uh, in the rainwater of 24 micrograms per liter, and that was based on an ecology study done in 2013 for Lake Loma. And so using an average of 38 um, inches a year of rain and the 24 micrograms per liter of phosphorus, we determined that direct precipitation contributes just over two kilograms of phosphorus per year to Lake Loma and about four and a half kilograms of phosphorus a year to Sunday Lake. So the surface water runoff or the external loading of phosphorus from the watershed was very challenging to estimate given that we did not have detailed information on the hydrologic inputs and outflows of each lake. And we had very limited data on phosphorus concentrations uh, within the seasonal ditches and creeks and inlets to the lake. So we estimated external loading based on land use classifications and phosphorus runoff coefficients for each land use. The map here on your screen shows you the land use classifications within the Sunday Lake watershed. And most of it is light urban residential with some forest and pasture lands and a little bit of light rural residential. And of course we have the uh, streets or transportation uh, land use as well. 
And um, we know that the majority of inflow to these lakes occurs between mid-November and early April, which is typical for lakes in this region. So most of this external load from the surface uh, watershed is going to occur during those months. Now, the way that we did this using uh, land use and runoff coefficients does not include any phosphorus loading from groundwater or on-site septic systems within the watershed. So this slide just gives you um, the results of this uh, external loading exercise that we did. And the uh, surface water runoff into Lake Loma contributes about 16 kilograms of phosphorus per year, most of that coming from light urban residential land uses. And for Sunday Lake, it contributes about 64 kilograms of phosphorus per year. Again, most of that coming from light urban residential with some forested and light rural residential con contributions. Now, the timing of this surface runoff and loading and external load is very important. Most of this occurs during the fall, winter, and early spring months because only 14% of the precipitation falls during the summer. So um, this loading uh, is coming into the lake during the winter and most likely some of it is leaving the lake uh, with increased outflows, but some of it is also being retained. Groundwater. Groundwater was the major unknown for both of these lakes and contributes the most uncertainty to our analysis. We know based on observations and historical information that groundwater is an important part hydrologically to Lake Loma, but not so much to Sunday Lake. So we really kind of dug into the archives at Snohomish County looking for previous studies or any kind of information that we could get to help us determine groundwater inputs into Lake Loma. We discovered two studies that were very helpful. The Seven Lakes Water Quality Analysis and Management Plan done in 1986 by Entranco uh, calculated a groundwater load to Lake Loma and had a full hydrologic budget, which was helpful to look at. And then there was a phosphorus screening level assessment done for Lake Loma by the Department of Ecology in 2013. The ecology study calculated the phosphorus load to groundwater and ultimately to the lake from on-site septic systems within the watershed. So we use that same approach to then calculate a groundwater load from septic systems from sun, around Sunday Lake as well. So as I mentioned, the Seven Lake study for Lake Loma had a much more robust data set for us to kind of dive into, and it included some shallow groundwater well monitoring, and they estimated a groundwater load to Lake Loma at six kilograms per year. The ecology study that actually calculated a load from on-site septic systems using a per capita loading rate uh, and failure rates, they estimated the groundwater load to Lake Loma at 27 kilograms per year. So that gave us a, a nice range to use in our analysis. And then using the same method that, uh, that Ecology did for Lake Loma, we estimated and the load to groundwater from on-site septic systems at about nine kilograms per year for Sunday Lake. Now we know most of this groundwater loading is most likely going to occur during the fall, winter, and spring months when the soils are saturated. And we do have a very limited amount of lake level data for these lakes that show us that the lake level declines throughout the summer, which is indicative of very limited to no inflow from groundwater in the summer months. We looked at the internal loading of uh, that occurs in both of these lakes because um, we do know that the hypolimnetic, uh, the hypolimnion goes anoxic and that there is a release of phosphorus from the sediments. So we use two methods to calculate the sediment release rate or the SRR. The first method looked at the increase in hypolimnetic to uh, total phosphorus concentrations during the time when the lakes were stratified. And the two graphs at the bottom of the slide show this dramatic increase in both total phosphorus and soluble phosphorus throughout the summer, which is indicative of internal loading. We also then looked at um, established relationships between sediment mobile phosphorus concentrations in the actual sediments and phosphorus release rates. And uh, we had multiple years of data for Sunday Lake that we could use that we used to calculate a range of sediment release rates. So this graph here shows you Lake Loma sediment phosphorus concentrations, which are the blue lines compared to other lakes within Washington. 
And we were surprised to see that Lake Loma has a significant amount of total phosphorus in its sediments, more so than what we saw at Lake Ketchum, which is the gray line. And as we dug into the data that was available to us, we found out that past management practices have contributed to this um, very high amount of phosphorus in the sediments. This is a table that we found that um, summarizes the types and quantities of fertilizers that were used um, in Lake Loma during the 1950s. So no doubt contributing to that high amount of phosphorus in the bottom sediments. This graph shows you total phosphorus in Sunday Lake sediments, which is that bright blue line. And it ended up being actually higher than what we saw at Lake Loma, which is the orange line. And again, we then started digging into some of the history and discovered that the historical practices and management and uses of the lake, um, including logging and possible, there have been accounts of cedar shavings from the logs settling and being deposited onto the lake bottom at Sunday Lake are most likely contributing to these um, high phosphorus concentrations than bottom sediments. So this slide has a lot of numbers on it, um, but what we were able to do was calculate sediment release rates from both looking at the increase in phosphorus in the hypolimnion, which is method one for both lakes. And then we also looked at the relationship with sediment mobile phosphorus, and we were able to get good um, uh, good agreement between the two methods. And so we used the average sediment release rate and the hypolimnetic surface area to calculate a total phosphorus release from the anoxic sediments. We also assumed that there was some aerobic release of phosphorus and we applied and we assumed that was 10% of the sediment release rate for the anoxic sediments. So we applied that aerobic phosphorus release rate to the eplomnetic sediments and came up with a total amount of internal loading for each lake. So just over 18 kilograms of phosphorus per year for Lake Loma and about 115 kilograms of phosphorus per year for Sunday Lake. So a large amount of phosphorus. So uh, one interesting and surprising uh, source of phosphorus for these lakes, for Sunday Lake in particular, was waterfowl. Um, the waterfowl loading for Lake Loma was very small. We have some counts of uh, waterfowl from volunteer monitors, but the counts were very low. However, for Sunday Lake, Sunday Lake supports a very large population of overwintering trumpeter swans, snow geese, and ducks. And the main overwintering time is November to March. And Snohomish County had volunteers out for a whole um, uh, season counting uh, the waterfowl on the lake. And it ended up being that there were 21 geese, 51 ducks, and 320 swans that utilized Sunday Lake each day on average. So that ended up contributing 350 kilograms of phosphorus a year to Sunday Lake, most of it in the winter time, November to March. And we assume that of some of that leaves the lake through the outlet, but a large portion probably settles to the lake bottom, enriches the sediments, and then is recycled back into the water column. Swans and snow geese are expanding in the area and have already started to increase their overwintering populations at nearby Lake Armstrong. So is this due to climate changes? Is there a management solution to this? Um, we're not sure what to do about this large source of phosphorus that there really doesn't seem like there's a lot of options in terms of management solutions. So this slide is, shows you the summary of the nutrient phosphorus or the nutrient loadings for phosphorus for each lake. With Lake Loma, because we had those two, a high and a low groundwater estimate, we using the low groundwater estimate, we have about 43 kilograms of phosphorus a year going into Lake Loma. The high estimate bumps that up to 64 kilograms per year. And for Sunday Lake, waterfowl, 64% of the total annual load is coming from waterfowl. And so that's a huge, huge portion of that uh, annual budget. Um, with these groundwater water estimates, the uncertainty doesn't really change how we calculate and cost out the alternatives, but it does change how effective those restoration alternatives will be in the long run and how long they will last. 
So for both of these lakes, internal loading is a large contributor, both annually, but more importantly, it's a very significant part during the summer load. 70 to 85 percent of the summer load to these two lakes is coming from um, internal loading and the bottom sediments. So in conclusion, we were able to use this cost-effective approach to understand the nutrient dynamics in each lake and, um, and the sources of phosphorus that are most likely contributing to the growth of toxic algae in these two lakes. Um, we have some certainty. There's a little bit of uncertainty, but really it's not going to impact um, the management alternatives that we uh, look at. Um, we were able to save the county and the lake residents money that could then be used towards implementation. You know, if the county had opted to spend $150,000 on each lake to do a more detailed study, would we have reached a different outcome and conclusions? Would the recommended alternative be different? Probably not. It could be, but most likely it would be end up being the same. So stay tuned for part two. Marissa is going to talk about how we use the understanding of the nutrient dynamics of each lake to help meet our project goals in identifying restoration alternatives and how the county worked with each community to then choose a path forward. Thank you. Actually, with that, I think that we're gonna have you hold questions, Shannon. And uh, we are going to go directly to Marissa's talk. Uh, we have been finding out, because this is a learning process, that uh, there is a lag time between when you type your questions and send them to info at wapa.org and when we receive them here in the Zoom chat room. So if you still have questions for Rob, please send them in. And we're going to collate questions for all three presenters and do a comprehensive Q&A at the end. So uh, thanks for your consideration on this and uh, take it away, Marissa. Good morning, uh, I'm Marissa Berkdaw from Snohomish County Surface Water Management and I'll presenting the second half, which I swear we did not uh, come up with this title uh, after we saw Rob's. We independently came up with the Tale of Two Lakes. So as Shannon said, uh, if we could start the presentation then, um, uh, going to the next slide. Uh, we are talking about Loma and Sunday Lakes, which are two small lakes that are mostly in rural settings with a lot of people that live right on the shoreline. So next. Uh, and they both have lots of toxic algae and really high amounts of phosphorus is their big common factor. And next. Um, and the most important thing here is they have residents that are really committed to their lake. They've lived there, many of them for years or are new to it. And they see a system that's not healthy. They're concerned about their children and their grandchildren being able to use it like safely. And they come to us and for these are the reasons that we are developing these algae control plans are for the residents. So next. And um, the three major steps to doing that is to determine the major sources of pollution, which we just found out about. And I'm gonna be really focusing on how we identify those best solutions and then working with the community to select the alternatives. Next. Uh, I'm just going to kind of skip over this one. We just heard the sources, so you can go ahead to the next one. Uh, we're really going to be talking about finding the solution. And when we talk about finding the solution, there's three main components uh, that you'll see on the next slide, which is, is it effective? Is it affordable? And is it embraced by the community? Because if it doesn't have any one of these components, it will not be implemented at these lakes. So we're going to dive more closely into the effective on the next slide, where what does that mean? So our goals were to have lower total phosphorus concentrations. In these lakes, this is what drives the algae bloom and less than 20 micrograms per liter would be ideal based on the ecology's action values for this region. Most importantly, we want less frequent toxic algae blooms. Ideally, we wouldn't have any. Uh, and when you fix those problems, you end up with higher dissolved oxygen concentrations and improved water clarity. And most importantly, you want it to be safe for aquatic life and lake recreation. So next. Uh, so we looked at several options. You heard some of these in Rob's presentation. The first is to directly try and control the algae. So there are options uh, for algicides, physical inhibitors, such as ultrasonic devices and that sort of thing. But ultimately these were rejected, uh, which you'll see in the, you wanna do the animation here. So rejected and in our uh, terms that we've were found not to be effective long-term. So this might be a good short-term solution, 
But if you kill off the algae, they basically decompose, release nutrients, and you'll end up with future algae blooms. They are embraced by the community, a lot of these, um, but like the another lake community put in these sonic solutions, but it didn't work. So the next solution is to really look at phosphorus and controlling the underlying problem. So you can break up phosphorus into two uh, components. The first is external. Next slide. The animation doesn't really work well in this, I'm realizing, and you can't control it. Uh, but in external phosphorus, we're really looking at the runoff and the groundwater. And for Sunday Lake, we're kind of lumping the waterfowl into external phosphorus as well. So if you go to the next slide. So external phosphorus control, where does it come from? And in these lake watersheds, if you want to push the animation, we're really finding it's coming from people. In these watersheds, it's just residents living around the lake, and the little actions they do from many little sources add up to be a big problem for the lake. So when we look at solutions, if you click on the animation, it's outreach. So outreach is really the only way to encourage behavior change to solve these problems. And in Snohomish County, we have a program called LakeWise, which you'll see is our logo on the next slide here. And LakeWise started in 2012 for just this problem, and it's across the county working with lake residents. At the Corbett's program, the next slide, you'll see that it's lake certification program. This is where landowners who make small changes on their property to prevent pollution are recognized with a lakes wise certified sign. It's completely voluntary. It's open to shoreline and upland landowners within lake watersheds. So you can go to the next slide. It starts with a site visit with our watershed steward. Uh, these are free site visits. Um, and again, it's voluntary on the next slide. They go over a checklist. So they answer any questions about their property, give them ideas on how to best implement the checklist. And if landowners decide to do it, they get a lake-wise certified sign. Next slide. It also includes educational workshops and rebates. We have workshops on lawn and septic care. This is the main reason or how people get involved in the program. And this is really where they learn about those best management practices for septics and lawns. And next slide. We have Healthy Shores. Uh, we offer technical uh, help for shoreline restoration, as well as free native plants. And if you go to the next slide, you can see an example of a before and after restoration project. So this is a super quick summary of our Lake Weiss program. If you go to the next slide, um, we've had high success. So first at Sunday Lake, you can see the statistics here uh, when the box shows up. Um, we've had basically one in three house or four households at Sunday Lake across the watershed involved. And on the lake shoreline in particular, one in three households have been involved and they've restored uh, 550 feet of shoreline. Loma is similar, about 30 or one in three households have participated in the program and even more shoreline restoration there. So overall, this was accepted as a restoration solution, is effective, embraced by the community, and it's affordable because the county is already paying for it across the county. Okay, next slide. But this doesn't get at the whole problem, especially at Lake Loma. We found from Shannon's presentation that groundwater could be a potential big contributor to this system, particularly from septic systems. So we wanted to um, see if there's anything else we can do to encourage changes and improvements in septic systems. So we looked at several options. The first one is on the next slide about showing sewers. Or this is what every resident asked for. Well, can't we just put a sewer in? And it's been a pipe dream since the 70s. And that study that Shannon referred to in 86 was actually to assess the ability to put in a sewer system not just for Lake Loma, but the seven area lakes um, in this region. They found that it was extremely expensive. And in most cases, septic systems were not significant pollution contributors um, with the Loma Lake being um, one of the higher ones that had groundwater value. So the cost versus benefit wasn't there. So this was rejected um, basically on the cost. The next solution that we looked at was septic retrofits. So this is where you take an old system you add some newer technology, such as um, media filters or other things to polish and remove phosphorus. Uh, but this was also rejected uh, because it was not affordable. So this was thousands of dollars for each system to add this technology. It might be a good option when there's no other uh, ability to help such systems on an individual basis, but overall was rejected. The last idea we looked at was a septic savings program. Now, this was a, an idea that came from a different lake, Lake Rossiger, that had had a previous study done to help protect the lake. And basically, it was a, worked out with a water provider 
that each month, depending on how much water you used, they would charge you a small amount that kind of went into a savings account for your septic inspection. And so when you had enough water usage, then you would get a notice that you're due for an inspection and you would then, uh, it would already be paid for. And so the whole goal is to increase the regularity of maintenance and it affects every single resident, not just it, we were thinking at Lake Loma, but potentially all of those lakes in the area that could benefit from this program. So this was accepted for a recommendation because it would be effective because everybody would have to participate, affordable because they're already paying for it. We weren't sure if it was being embraced by the community, but we did find the Loma residents thought this was a good idea. So the next issue was the uh, swans and Shannon already addressed this a little bit, but basically people like Trump or swans <laughs> don't want to get rid of them. They're protected. So there really was no good solution. Um, if you want to click on the thing, uh, for the next thing, actually one more, even though they had such a huge amount, there was no good solution. So we decided to treat this as internal loading rather than um, an external load that we could actually do something about. So just each year, whatever was left from the swans would become part of the problem that had to be dealt with as a legacy pollution source, which moves, we now need to look at internal phosphorus controls. So internal is that sediment piece, what comes up each summer, which was about 70 to 85% of the load in those summer months and um, would need to be addressed for a long-term solution. So we looked at several options, starting with our first one here, which was dredging. This is what every landowner asked first, can we just dredge a lake, especially shallow lakes, but because it's unlikely to get permitted, um, you would need additional treatment after dredging because they're still released from the underlying sediments and it's extremely expensive on the scale of millions of dollars. This was rejected mostly from um, the cost aspect of it. So we looked at our next solution, which is aeration. So at Loma, in fact, the residents liked this solution so much that they went ahead and installed three aerators without getting any permits or approvals, um, which it was an admirable uh, effort because their thought was it will it would add oxygen to the water and help out the lake. Unfortunately, in both these systems, the sediment study shows there was simply not enough iron to bind with the phosphorus, even in the presence of oxygen, plus the systems were undersized. But um, because there's not enough iron, it actually just stirs up more and more like sediments and would increase the phosphorus and associated algae blooms. So this on its own was rejected, uh, mostly because of the effectiveness of it. And so next we looked at phoslock. This is something uh, I'm sure if you've heard of uh, in other conferences. It's binds phosphorus with minimal impacts to lake chemistry. However, for these two lake systems, there was a big question of efficacy because they had a very high humic acid and low alkalinity. And there has been some studies to suggest that it would not uh, settle out as well in these systems and not be as effective. Um, plus there isn't a good studies on long-term efficacy of this product yet. We're hoping to see more of that. Uh, and also based on the huge amount of sediment load in these systems, it looked like it would be a higher cost for equivalent dose than a comparable alternative. So this was rejected, uh, mostly on the questions of efficacy, but a little bit of affordability. The next solution is alum. Alum is, uh, you heard about a little bit in Rob's talk, but basically it's, um, you, it's a al aluminum sulfate is put into the system. It creates a flock that sinks and binds lake sediments permanently. There's a lot of research done and it's been proven to be the most effective and appropriate method to bind sediment phosphorus. Uh, but you have to be careful. It's an acid, so you have to put it with a buffer to prevent changes in pH. And if it's not dosed and applied properly, it can affect aquatic life. So this solution was accepted because it was effective, embraced by the community, but there is some question of affordability. So next slide. The last solution we looked at was aeration with alum injection. So the layout residents were really, especially at Loma, interested in aeration. So if you combine aeration and inject alum, it can be really effective, as well as can be fine-tuned for it to be adaptively management or manage the lake. But it does require property, a place to um, uh, create housing for the alum and requires annual maintenance. So the solution was initially accepted uh, as a recommendation to the community because if it's effective, um, but there was some questions of affordability and eventually the Lake Loma community at least rejected this option. Although at Sunday Lake, it became comparable to the alum treatments alone and what is with the final recommendations. So how much alum do you really need? I'm not gonna go into this a lot, but the dose was 41.3 milligrams of aluminum per liter at alum 
or at Loma. And um, I can't read that number, but you all can 60 something milligrams at Sunday Lake. Um, so this is a lot of alum. So the next question on our next slide is how do we spread that out? So we don't want to on such small systems put all this alum in at once. So we recommended to the Lake community that they have a large initial dose of so about half the total and then spread the remaining doses throughout the year. And there were a lot of benefits because they would see an immediate improvement. It would allow for adaptive management and you could also treat new inputs. So on the next slide, many of you are wondering how much this cost. You can see the first year for Loma, it'd be about $141,000, $35,000 afterwards. At Sunday Lake, it was $325,000 um, with about $90,000 afterwards. And this includes all the monitoring and permitting that goes along with that. Um, so this was disappointing. This was extremely expensive, uh, especially for Sunday Lake and, um, and difficult for when you look at the per cost of parcel basis. So um, the next slide, we ultimately ended our plans with the three recommendations of Lakewise, the septic savings program at Loma, and alum treatments or alum injection with aeration. Although Sunday Lake, we initially said to take a, basically a no action approach on the alum and wait and see if conditions worsen. Okay, next slide. I'm gonna conclude here to talk about our community outreach. Community outreach is probably the most important thing because these plans are ultimately for the Lake communities. They're the ones that will need to make changes and in Snohomish County at least, to gather most the majority of the funding, although we may be able to help secure grants. So our approach in the next slide uh, was to work strongly with the community leaders, involve the community leaders um, from the very beginning in helping to develop the plan and promote it with the Lake community, and then carefully presenting the plan to the broader community. So at Loma, they have an informal organization, so it was a lot more challenging. There were just some active community members there, and we had a water quality meeting with them, which kicked this all off. They were upset that the aerator was considered illegal. And um, so we worked with them and that's how we ended up applying for the grant to develop the plan. To promote the plan, we had an ice cream social. This helps to get people in that might not be involved otherwise. And then at that time, we announced that the plan would be coming out and there would be a water quality meeting. And unfortunately, not many people came to that water quality meeting. Even though there was a lot of interest and a lot of people said, I really wanna be there, but can't make it. A lot of people didn't. Um, if you wanna click on the animation here, um, we found that at Loma, we found little interest in moving forward, mostly because a lot of people had never found out about the plan or there wasn't a strong leadership to figure out what the next step was. In contrast, Sunday Lake has a more formal organization. Sorry, there's a typo there. Over the years, they brought several attempts to the county to start restoration for anything from floating wetlands to other ideas and it ultimately led to this plan development. And they were one of the first lakes to embrace LakeWise got really involved. They helped us host a social event. People got excited about it and um, also helped to really promote that this plan was going to be developed. We had a water quality meeting attend, uh, planned and then COVID hit. So instead we did an online presentation and survey. However, we found this to be actually more effective. More people showed up to this presentation uh, or watched at their leisure at home. And we did a survey with it. Next slide. And from that survey, we found some real benefits. We really got to hear what each resident felt. At community meetings, sometimes the vocal members can kind of take over the meeting and you don't get to hear from everybody. So we really got to hear their thinking. And surprisingly, even with the high cost, Sunday Lake community leaders, or sorry, respondents, wanted to move forward with the ALM treatments or at least planning for them, um, which was not even our recommendation. So it was really helpful. So in conclusion, um, we found the lessons learned at, Solutions are not always straightforward. We thought with these small lakes, it would be a lot more uh, forward, straightforward, but it wasn't. And those that allowed for adaptive management were the most helpful because it can manage some of that uncertainty in our estimates for things like waterfowl and septics. The online presentation and survey was one of the best mechanisms we found. And we also found that lake communities with more formal structures equal a higher likelihood of success. So we might've encouraged that first. And then finally, I just wanted to acknowledge um, the contributors, the Lake Volunteers, my coworkers, Tetra Tech, and the Department of Ecology for funding. And now I'm going to questions. Thanks. Thanks, Marissa. Um, we now have about six minutes to do a question and answers. Rob, could you unmute and put your picture up? So we have all three presenters available. I have some questions that have come in and I'm gonna direct them to you. So first, a question for Shannon. The waterfowl data is very interesting. 
Can you talk about what data was used to estimate the phosphorus mass in the waterfowl excretions and what would the forms of nitrogen and phosphorus be? Yes, so we um, went and kind of dug through some literature data and um, used a couple equations from, uh, one of them was actually from a Green Lake study uh, that Harry had done, but it looked at the, you estimate the weight of the waterfowl droppings, uh, that's based on species, and then there are some literature values for the amount of phosphorus in uh, each of the droppings, and then there was also some factors including like probability of the actual droppings getting into the lake. So there were some assumptions that were made. Um, in terms of the forms of nitrogen and phosphorus, it would be mostly soluble. So um, if, you, if you think about it, and if you've got a bunch of swans on a lake surface uh, doing their thing, um, all of that waste and droppings would be going directly into the water column and would be mostly soluble. And um, this had been one of the first years that Snohomish County had done any monitoring during the winter months. So we actually got some really interesting results and some uh, high chlorophyll values in the winter uh, that were um, a little bit of a surprise. So, um, so we're thinking that the soluble phosphorus, some of it probably goes out, but some of it also is probably um, taken up by algae during the winter months and then settles out into the lake bottom. Okay. Thank you. Another question. Um, and this is again about the waterfowl. Um, what are the discussions around resident waterfowl inputs to the nutrient picture? Um, obviously, there's regulatory complexities and real, wor real world efforts and time needed to deter the birds. This is a real problem all over lower elevation lakes in Washington, especially with um, the, the Canada geese? Uh, I think I can probably speak to that one in terms of the community response. Um, so it should, I should mention that the majority of the issue is the swans. There's actually thousands that come in. The average is only 300. And overall, the community loves them. Um, I mean, they're concerned because they poop a lot, but they, they generally love them and they don't really want to do anything. The geese uh, that are there are more seasonal. They don't have a lot of the resident geese. There's a few, and there has, I think, been issues in the past to do egg addling and other things when they've been worse. Um, and there is not really a strong issue of waterfowl feeding or other things. But we have been encouraging shoreline restoration, and just in terms of that's what people are frustrated with geese. So that's been the main strategy used is to have higher vegetation at the lake shorelines and a couple community that's one of the main reasons community members did implement shoreline restoration it's a strong motivator that okay it, hopefully <laughs> <laughs> oh. so now i have one for rob and that is uh, could you summarize your findings uh with respect to the nano bubbling technique do you have anything well, to add I don't have much to add. Joy Mashad did that research, um, and there isn't that much uh, in the literature on the effectiveness. But I would encourage you to attend uh, a session in this uh, conference by Christian Ferentz uh, this afternoon. And he's going to talk all about nanobubblers, so you'll learn more about them uh, probably than I even know here today, I'm sure. But uh, they're a really interesting technology, and we, we support them principally by the theory that they provide such a higher uh, oxygen transfer rate because of the small bubbles and the surface area to volume thing going on. And they're also very energy efficient and um, they just have a lot of promise. They haven't been used that much on small lakes, but I think, um, I just think they're a really exciting technology and that's why we recommend them. I think we have time for one more. And uh, I think this is one that a number of people would be quite interested in. This is a question for Marissa. How does Snohomish County fund the Lakewise program? And can you give an estimate on your budget? Uh, so the Lakewise program, so Snohomish County Surface Water Management is funded through a surface water utility fee. So it's something charged to each property owner as a, um, a fee on their tax bill. So we're very fortunate to have uh, uh, sustained funding for that. Um, I should really know a budget offhand. I probably don't. It's probably on the order of seventy to eighty thousand dollars a year across the county. 
when we've had grant funding, we've definitely done more um, in terms of incentives for like restoration and other things. But um, for the core program of site visits and other things, um, that's my best estimate, but I can provide further information on that. Or if Jen, I think you're on, you want to chime in on that, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, also, I should mention too, if anybody is interested on um, the plans, they're on Snohomish County's website published in the technical appendices on those calculations and that sort of thing, you can check them out. Okay. Jen, do you have any of that? I think Marissa is about correct. I think it's okay. around $80,000 per year, including oh. staff time. Okay. Great, thank you. Well, for those whose questions didn't get answered, I'm sorry. Um, we can figure out which ones were not and we will convert them to emails to the, these three participants. Thank you very much. Uh, we're now going to go to a break and we will reconvene at, it looks like 1020, so you get 10 minutes and session two will be water quality. Thank you very much. Yay. <laughs>
Hi, we're back. This is Sally Abella, and we are starting session two entitled Water Quality. We have three presenters today, and we are going to go straight through their presentations and deal with questions at the same time for all three presentations at the end. Um, that's because we're having a lag time between when you type in and send your question and when we receive them. So our first speaker today is Emily Deerdorf from the University of uh, Western Washington University Institute for Watershed Studies. Thank you, Emily. Hello, my name is Emily Deerdorf. I'm currently a master's student at San Diego State University, and I'll be presenting to you some work that I did this past year at Western Washington University in the Institute for Watershed Studies. I'll be talking about how we've been exploring the spatial dynamics of algae blooms in Lake Whatcom, Washington using satellite imagery. So Lake Whatcom is located in Northwest Washington. It's in Bellingham and it's located on the historical homelands of the Coast Salish people. This is a developed watershed the watershed is home to about 85,000 residents. Um, it's also a drinking water source, um, and it provides drinking water for about 95,000 people. In the area, there's a history of logging, um, which has impacted the watershed. And um, in 1997, it was placed on the list of impaired water bodies by the EPA due to low DO and high bacteria risk. Um, as you might expect, monitoring has been a very important part of how the city of Bellingham has managed Lake Whatcom. Um, the Institute for Watershed Studies at Western Washington University has monitored this lake for about 30 years, 10 years of that, more recently also monitoring the tributaries that go into the lake. And there have been some really good findings from this. Um, they found that in this lake, primary productivity is generally nutrient limited um, and that human impacts have probably increased these nutrient inputs. Um, another big factor in the lake is that it's susceptible to summer algae blooms, which drive down summer oxygen levels. And so for my study, um, the goal of this study was to determine whether we could expand the scope of this monitoring by incorporating satellite imagery modeling into the process. So satellite imagery modeling is a feasible monitoring tool because algae-laden water has shown to be to have a different spectral signature than non-algae-laden water. And you can see that in this image adapted from Victor Clemus 2013 on the left. These known spectral differences are incorporated into band indices that are de designed to emphasize the signal of algae in the water. Um, some examples of these indices you see on the right are NDVI, 2BDA, and SABI. For this type of analysis, there are several options for what satellite imagery to use. We decided to use Landsat 8 imagery because it met our requirements of spatial resolution, temporal scope, and availability. However, MODIS, MODIS and Sentinel-2 are also commonly used for this sort of study, so if you end up looking at the literature for this, you'll see those around a lot. In order to create a model to predict chlorophyll, we pulled satellite imagery that corresponded to dates where we had in situ water quality data already collected. We then removed imagery with clouds and atmospheric haze and extracted the brightness of the different color bands of the satellite imagery for our five different monitoring sample sets. This was done in the cloud-based Google Earth Engine API. We then used linear regression to determine which of the six indices predicted chlorophyll most effectively and then we use the three best linear models to study the spatial dynamics of algae in the lake. Along the way, it became apparent that a handful of factors impacted how well we could predict chlorophyll concentration. One was the date difference. We found that it was very important that the satellite imagery was captured no more than a day before or after the in-situ water quality data had been taken. Um, also, the sample depth of the in-situ water quality data was, also, was important. Uh, the satellite imagery models were much more effective at predicting surface level chlorophyll values 
than chlorophyll concentrations at five meters, even when the chlorophyll maximum was at the five meter depth. A third factor was atmospheric haze. Chlorophyll A predictions improved when we manually went through the satellite imagery and removed dates with atmospheric haze or wildfire smoke from the training data set, even when these dates may not have been removed by our cloud filtering algorithms. This necessary filtration resulted in a smaller but largely representative data set um, that we used to then train the prediction models. As you can see here, the data used in the model um, is certainly less complete than that of the full data set, but it still covered a large amount of the range that we had in our original data set. So in this study, we tested six different chlorophyll indices. Um, anyone, interest, anyone who has worked with terrestrial remote sensing will recognize NDVI, um, which in this case can also be referred to and in the literature as normalized difference chlorophyll index and used in aquatic remote sensing. Out of those indices, the three that performed the best were the 2BDA, NDVI, and SABI indices. We found that log transforming the y-axis resulted in stronger predictions. Um, and the R-squared values for these predictions were all around 0 0.7. We then incorporated these band index models into the Google Earth Engine API to analyze the chlorophyll prediction results. Here you can see a user interface tool that I built to play around with these predictions um, and to compare predictions to the three different models and to export the data. Um, we've also brought in a few auxiliary data sets. As you can maybe see, um, the tributaries are an option, depth is an option, um, and we've also provided an ability for users to change the color scheme or to export the rasters to mess with in ArcGIS Pro if they would like. This is another tool I built for comparing the outputs of a given model for di different dates. Um, it synchronizes the location between all six maps. So when you move one to look closer at a spot, it moves the rest of the maps with you, with it. Um, I will be putting the code for these on my GitHub pretty soon. So if you're interested in messing around with them and seeing if they might work for your study site, um, don't hesitate to reach out or look there in the coming days. Well, all three of the selected indices performed fairly well, um, as previously mentioned, the NDVI-based model exhibited a predictive contrast without producing the irregularities that we found in the 2BDA model. So you can see this pattern here. Um, this is an example from November 11th, 2017, which is a also happens to be a date where we captured an algae bloom in our in-situ water quality sampling. Um, you can see the high levels of contrast for the 2BDA model um, and lower levels of contrast in the NDVI and SABI model. Um, on the far right, you have the true color model, which is what you would see if you were an airplane looking down at the lake, um, which is useful because there we can see that there's a little cloud that hadn't been filtered out by the um, cloud filtering, filtering algorithm, which you see shows up in the 2BDA and the NDVI model results. We also found that particularly shallow parts of the lake ended up having an artificially low predicted value of chlorophyll A concentration. This is likely due to the bottom water reflectance interfering with the brightness signal. Um, so it was just something to keep in mind as we we're analyzing this to take that as a result of the process, not a result of actual things going on in the lake. The utility of this model can be demonstrated by looking at a case study of predicted chlorophyll levels in the late summer. In these maps, higher chlorophyll concentrations are covered, are colored green, and lower chlorophyll concentrations are dark blue. Here you can see the northernmost basin, which is the shallowest basin and has the most developed watershed. It's typically where the highest chlorophyll A concentrations are found according to historical monitoring. Um, this pattern is reflected in the model chlorophyll predictions shown here as well. Circled here is a shallow sill between basin one and basin two. Um, 
In this example, this cell has uniformly high chlorophyll predictions throughout the year's study. Other areas in this part of the lake that had high chlorophyll A predictions were the northwestern shorelines in Basin 1, circled in orange here. Um, you can also see that they vary in intensities, um, with the 2016 example being the highest bloom levels in general. One area that had surprisingly low predicted chlorophyll concentrations was a bay circled here, which is the northernmost bay of Basin 2. These model results are exciting because they sh are showing us the potential patterns and the dynamics that our previous monitoring efforts sampled at the orange points hadn't previously revealed. Here's another area of the lake just offshore of the Southern Valley Marina and Gulf course to the south. Um, this was another area where we found where we saw uniformly high predicted chlorophyll A values just offshore. Um, and again, this is pretty cool because up until now, our closest sample site would not have picked up on this pattern, which is a pretty interesting pattern. The final part of this case study that I'll show you is from the southernmost area of the lake, which has been shown to have fairly low chlorophyll concentrations. And that pattern is reflected in the chlorophyll prediction results shown here as well. Circled here is South Bay, a narrow inlet that we were interested to find had very low predicted chlorophyll values. And by contrast, this area close to the, this is an area that's close to the outflow of Branian Creek, um, and it tended to have somewhat higher predicted chlorophyll values, which an example, which this is an example of a finding that could warrant further analysis pretty easily, since we actually have water quality data sets for that particular creek. And so these results are really encouraging. Um, this analysis technique has widened the scope of our monitoring efforts. Um, and as we refine it further, it will allow us to answer some really interesting questions about Lake Whatcom and how we can manage it, um, particularly at times when we might not be monitoring as much, such as when um, we were unable to monitor during, monitor during the coronavirus pandemic um, in the early spring, and also just understanding at a more fine spatial scope um, where the chlorophyll really is, especially in the shoreline areas that we aren't picking up in our middle of the lake monitoring efforts. Um, in the future, I could see working with um, a little bit more data collection to see where are we picking up on aquatic macrophytes and where are we picking up on algae blooms. I think that would be very useful. Um, this is also going to lead, hopefully, into a study of more environmental factors, such as season, weather, and wind, and how those might impact algae hotspots, as well as more close watershed analysis of areas such as the Brainian Creek watershed that might have higher chlorophyll levels for some reason. Um, and it would also be interesting to look at how these chlorophyll predictions match up with the MODIS chlorophyll predictions that are available um, also through Google Earth Engine. This work could not have been done without the contributions of a whole lot of people. So I'd like to thank the dedicated people at the Institute for Watershed Studies at Western, um, the geology department, and for the city of Bellingham for making it possible. Um, and I'd also definitely like to thank my advisor, Dr. Angela Strucker, for helping me a lot with this project and always being ready to answer some questions. Um, and thank you all for being here and for being my wonderful virtual audience. Please do not hesitate to reach out if you have any questions or comments, um, or if you'd like to play around with any of my Google Earth Engine scripts, I'd be happy to send them your way. And now I'd be happy to take some questions. Thanks, Emily. Um, how about holding questions <laughs> for Emily? And we will move on to Curtis Gaspari of King County Water and Land Resources. Curtis? Hello. Hello, there's myself. My name is Curtis DeGasper. I work at King County Water Land Resource Division. And today I'm going to be revisiting some work that was done by a graduate student at the University of Washington several, several years, years ago. ago. Um, she looked at, actually looked at Lake Washington and Lake Sammamish, but today I'm going to focus mostly on Lake Sammamish. And basically she looked at uh, the relationships among uh, 
the timing and duration of thermal stratification and summer uh, hypolimnetic anoxia and phosphorus concentrations. So with that, uh, let's get started. For those of you that aren't familiar with uh, Lake Sammamish or where it's located, it's east of uh, city of Seattle, um, in King County, actually east of Bellevue, uh, east of uh, its better known counterpart, Lake Washington. Uh, it's a relatively large and deep lake, a maximum depth of 32 meters or about 105 feet. And both lakes have a very well-documented uh, history of their recovery from eutrophication following wastewater diversion in the 1960s. Lake Washington recovered very quickly, but Lake Sammamish not so quickly. And uh, one of the reasons given for that is that Lake Sammamish becomes anoxic during the summer. Uh, phosphorus accumulates in the hypolimnion, and then uh, following turnover, that phosphorus is redistributed into the water column. And uh, initially, the phosphorus release rate from the sediments uh, didn't change so much, uh, did eventually decline. Um, and this is a fairly well-known phenomenon uh, the, of the sediment feedback process delaying the recovery of aquatic systems uh, following wastewater diversion. Uh, another thing I want to point out is um, the data that we'll be discussing for Lake Sammamish. It comes from this central deep location here, and we'll also touch on some data collected off of Madison Park and Lake uh, Washington. As I said, the bottom waters of Lake Sammamish become anoxic in the summer. You can see that in this color contour plot of dissolved oxygen in Lake Sammamish based on data from 1993 to 2019. Uh, in the spring, uh, oxygen concentrations actually become elevated uh, as a result of the spring phytoplankton bloom. Those phytoplankton settle into the bottom waters of Lake Sammamish and decompose, and that decomposition process consumes oxygen. There's also sediment oxygen demand, and so by late summer, oxygen concentrations are essentially zero. Um, and coincident with the decline in dissolved oxygen in the bottom waters of Lake Sammamish, uh, the decomposition of phytoplankton and uh, release of phosphorus from the sediments uh, result in elevated phosphorus concentrations in the bottom waters, uh, reaching high levels in uh, October. And uh, it's believed that the summer hypoxia is likely a natural phenomenon uh, based on sediment coring analysis. Uh, it appears that the lake has been mesotrophic for at least the last 150 years. So the primary reason that oxygen levels go down in uh, Lake Sammamish or in any, any lake for that matter uh, in the summertime is uh, because of thermal stratification. And so here you can see a color contour plot of temperature in Lake Sammamish and basically isothermal in the winter. Um, and then as stratification develops weekly, the, we get our, and the sun of course is starting to increase in strength, we get a uh, spring uh, bloom of phytoplankton that increases the oxygen levels. And then as stratification is initiated, um, we can start to see how oxygen levels begin to decline in the bottom of Lake Sammamish. And uh, as thermal stratification uh, increases and uh, the oxygen levels continue to decline until we have the uh, fall overturn event, which brings the lake back to more isothermal conditions and reoxygenates the lake. So the graduate student, uh, Tala Woodward, um, finished her thesis in 2014, and um, she had this question, uh, is there a relationship between the timing of spring stratification and subsequent summer hypolimnetic oxygen and phosphorus concentrations? And as I mentioned, she looked at uh, that situation in both Lake Washington and Lake Sammamish, and she used uh, uh, data from King County uh, a 20-year data set collected from 1993 to 2012. And the answer that she she concluded that yes, at least in Lake Sammamish, uh, that the, these relationships uh, did exist, um, but not in Lake Washington. Um, and, and like I said, we'll sort of explore, uh, revisit the uh, these relationships here with, the, with additional data that we've collected since then. So as I mentioned, we have another additional seven years of data. Um, that we can look at. And uh, that includes uh, the snow drought of 2014-2015. Uh, if you recall, there was uh, very little snow that winter, uh, more or less normal precipitation, uh, but an extremely or an unusually warm spring. So that in Lake Sammamish, thermal stratification was earlier 
and the duration and extent of anoxy was greater mm -hmm. in 2015 than any other year since 1993. So um, the data analysis was based on the same routine profiling data that, that Tali used uh, from our program. I did a few things uh, differently though, um, just because I, I, it was easier for me to do them that way than probably the way she did them. Um, and I you know, uh, don't know the details of some of her uh, methods, but um, for example, the timing of strati uh, stratification onset and duration, I use uh, this uh, Schmidt stability approach uh, with a threshold that's uh, been used before on work that's been done on uh, Lake, Saman uh, Lake Washington. I believe Tali used a, a temperature difference of the surface and bottom waters of the lake. And uh, we used the same timing and onset uh, duration of hypolimnetic anoxia using a threshold of two milligrams per liter. And, um, and then looked at the uh, average uh, hypolimnetic total phosphorus and found the maximum concentration during the summer uh, between June through October. And, and those are the, the metrics that I'll be looking at. So first we can look at uh, the stratification, the thermal stratification onset and duration. So the, here on the left, we have the stratification onset date, uh, range from about mid-March to the end of April, uh, range, of about 50, uh, range of 53 days. And um, that uh, the trend here is not st statistically significant. So no, no apparent trend. And then uh, the duration of stratification ranged from 203 to 256 days, uh, difference of about 53 days overall. And again, no statistically significant uh, trend in the duration of stratification from the period uh, 1993 to 2019. So what about the relationship between the onset of thermal stratification and anoxia. Um, first, we have this, the onset uh, timing of anoxia versus the onset timing of stratification. And we can see that that's a, a positive relationship. That's uh, statistically significant. Um, I'll just point out that this is the data point for 2015. And uh, the relationship here in gray is the one that uh, Tala found, so very similar uh, linear regression statistics to, to her work. Um, and that makes sense that the timing of stratification onset would, would track well with the timing of the onset of anoxia. And here we're looking at the duration of anoxia and the uh, timing of uh, stratification onset. And in this case, a uh, negative relationship, which is what we would expect. Um, as the onset of stratification becomes earlier, the duration of anoxia would be longer. Uh, that relationship is not uh, quite statistically significant, and uh, Tala did find a statistically significant relationship, but uh, in general, the, her uh, linear regression statistics are very similar to the ones that I found. So what about the relationships with um, hypolimnetic phosphorus? So first we can look at uh, hypolimnetic uh, total phosphorus, the maximum levels in late summer versus onset of stratification, the timing of onset of stratification. And uh, we see a negative relationship. It's not statistically significant. Um, but as we would expect, uh, if uh, stratification sets up earlier, uh, then we end up with higher total phosphorus levels in later in the summer. Uh, also point out that um, Tala's um, slopes, I'm a little unsure if those are correct. If you, um, she reported her slopes as micrograms per liter per day. And uh, if you take the slope here of minus 0 0.005 and log TP, uh, it, that's roughly a microgram per liter per day, which is more consistent with the range of, of actual phosphorus measurements. The maximum total phosphorus levels here range from 17 to 102 micrograms per liter. So roughly for each day change in the onset of stratification, the regression equation says it'd be about a microgram per liter change in hypomimetic total phosphorus. Um, better news is that the relationships with uh, hypomimetic total phosphorus and anoxy onset and hypomimetic total phosphorus and versus the duration of uh, anoxia are much more consistent with uh, 
Tolan's results, except for the slope. Um, they're both statistically significant. And um, as you'd expect, if uh, anoxia sets up earlier, then uh, later in the summer we have higher total phosphorus levels. And if the duration of anoxia is longer, then we will end up with higher total phosphorus levels uh, in the hypolimidian in the late summer. So that's, that's good, confirm that. So that's all real interesting, right? Um, the lake stratifies earlier, the uh, lake becomes anoxic earlier, the duration of anoxia is longer, phosphorus concentrations are higher. Um, but what does that really mean for uh, the production of phytoplankton in the lake, the kind that would uh, cause problems for human use as a lake and, and other issues? Um, and I think maybe, maybe not much of an issue, at least for now. Um, there's this concept that that, that that phosphorus that's being released for in, to the hypoluminian under anoxic conditions occurs because it's um, um, in a complex with iron that, uh, it dissol that uh, is dissolved under anoxic conditions. And then at fall overturn, the iron and phosphorus recombine, uh, precipitate and uh, settle back down into the sediments, essentially uh, resetting the lake every year to, uh, to a, a, a relatively similar uh, phosphorus concentration before the next spring bloom. And maybe to sort of illustrate that that might be the case, um, plotting up uh, summer, June through September, chlorophyll A concentrations in Lake Sammamish observed since from 1993 to 2019, and there have been some ups and downs, basically ranges from about two to six micrograms per liter. And uh, there was an interesting uh, high value in 2015, but uh, not a high value in 2016 following that uh, uh, elevated phosphorus that accumulated in, in the bottom waters in 2015 as a result of that uh, early onset of stratification. So um, at least right now from the data, it doesn't suggest that this uh, phosphorus release phenomenon is, uh, plays much of a role in determining how much phytoplankton are get, gonna grow, at least in the summertime, in Lake Sammamish the following year. So what about climate change? Well, uh, we're gonna need longer data sets. If you recall, we uh, didn't see uh, much of a trend in the onset timing of stratific thermal stratification in Lake Sammamish, and that was with a, a 27 year long data set. Um, we look at something like the Pacific Decadal Oscillation Index with negative values indicating cool wet conditions in the region, positive values indicating uh, warm, dry conditions, that that has changed uh, over the, since the 1960s from cool, wet, uh, warm, dry, back to cool, wet, and then looks like back into uh, warm, dry conditions uh, again in the last, say, the last five, 10 years. And those uh, conditions that are reflected in the, in the PDO index, uh, basically conditions, climate conditions off our coast that influence our local uh, weather and uh, the conditions in our lakes. You can see that reflected in uh, Lake Washington temperatures, uh, that warming period, a leveling off, and then a, a potentially you can see a little bit of a warming trend here at the end. Um, and then uh, looking at air temperature data from SeaTac International Airport, uh, more distinctly that rising trend in temperature leveling off and then uh, a distinct rise in the last decade in uh, air temperatures in the region. And if we just look at uh, the trend in Lake Washington stratification, the onset date of stratification, uh, previous work uh, looking at data through the, um, to about, uh, through about 2000, uh, found a downward tr uh, trend in the uh, timing of onset of stratification. So stratification was occurring earlier and earlier since the 1960s. Uh, but you can see that that's more or less leveled off uh, since then. And we can look again at the air temperature trends, but look at the uh, annual average air temperatures uh, reported at SeaTac International Airport. And you can see more clearly that, that increase in temperature to the, um, through the 1980s. Uh, leveling off, even a, maybe a slight uh, downward trend in air temperature. And then uh, now we're looking at a pretty dramatic rise in temperature since about 2010. Uh, and that uh, actually 
appears to influence the maximum thermal stability of Lake Washington quite a bit. There appears to be a fairly close relationship with annual average air temperature and thermal stability of the lake. So uh, that's something else that uh, might be interesting to look at with respect to changes that are occurring in these lakes. So with that, I'd like to uh, leave the remaining time uh, open for questions. Thank you. Um, now we're going to move to Laura Castadone, and she's going to talk to us about... Uh, My name is uh, Laura Costadone. and I'm a PhD candidate at State University. Uh, thank you so much for watching my presentation. Um, first of all, I just wanted to apologize uh, because I changed the title of my presentation at the last minute. Um, today, I will be talking about the impact of alternative urban growth scenarios on the water quality and ecosystem services provided by a major urban lake. So let's start with a little bit of background. So first of all, why should we care about urban lakes? Well, these systems are a hot spot for ecosystem services. Lakes provide a large variety of opportunity for recreation, but also um, aesthetic benefit. Um, they are also very important for wildlife habitat, both aquatic and terrestrial, but also lakes provide services like helping mitigating the urban heat island, for instance. Most of these uh, uh, ecosystem services and benefits are, are water quality related. And urban development is a major driver of um, water quality deterioration. Because urban development means more uh, impervious surfaces. Um, and as we know, the increase um, in total impervious uh, area can alter the flow of nutrient, pollutant, and runoff. For this study, I focus on nutrient runoff, particularly phosphorus, because um, um, high phosphorus level uh, coming from the watershed can uh, uh, impact the lake productivity with negative uh, result uh, on the ecosystem services provided by the lake. And if we think that uh, in the next uh, decade, about 70% of the global population will be living in cities. Um, uh, and this will mean like um, a higher demand for these ecosystem services. Then we can really realize how important it is for us to um, really understand the impact that urban development can have on this important ecosystem. So when we talk about urban development, uh, we talk about two main patterns of development urban sprawl or cluster development. Usually, um, urban development trajectories are developed al at a large scale, for instance, um, across like a, a big region. And often, this approach fails to incorporate um, the consequences more at the local scale, for instance, uh, on individual ecosystem, like lakes. So, um, Bolti and Vash, uh, with um, the major stakeholders of the Puget Sound region, developed uh, um, these alternative scenarios um, to explore uh, plausible options for urban and population growth um, uh, across the entire Puget Sound region. These uh, scenarios capture trajectories of changes uh, resulting from a range uh, of possible policies and management strategies. So they um, develop uh, three alternative scenarios of growth. The status quo, which as we can uh, easily imagine, is the continuation of current trends, so business as usual. The managed growth, um, concentrated the growth uh, more around regional growth center, so within the urban um, growth uh, boundaries. Um, and this resulted in more like a clustered urban development with a limited shoreline development. Uh, the unconstrained growth, uh, um, on the other hand, focused more um, on growth outside the urban growth areas um, and resulted more in a urban sprawl type of development. Um, under these scenarios also, um, shoreline development was uh, um, promoted. Um, 
Also, um, I just want to mention that um, under any scenarios, um, public land was considered for conversion. So only um, private land was considered. So the main goal of my study was to downscale these scenarios that, was, that were developed for the entire Puget Sound region uh, to infer pattern um, at the watershed level. Um, so um, I've been looking at the impact that this alternative uh, urban growth development uh, can have on the water quality and ecosystem services provided by Lake Sammamish with the um, underlying goal to inform management effort. So the study site, Lake Sammamish, um, is um, one of the most important lakes within the, um, Washington state. Is, um, this lake is surrounded by one of the fastest um, developing region of the entire United States, uh, the Central Puget Sound. This region is projected to grow by about 2 million people between now and 2050. Uh, and the lake uh, is uh, very important because it provides uh, uh, a large variety of services and benefits. It's a very important recreational destination. Um, it's important for like uh, cultural values, but also very important for wildlife habitat, particularly salmon. So this is just a brief overview of my methodology. So as I say, I started from these uh, scenarios uh, of land use, land cover change. And I use a model, a nutrient delivery ratio model that was developed by the Natural Capital Project at Stanford. Uh, this model is a part of um, uh, a suite of software that help um, studying different ecosystem services across the landscape. In this case, I was interested in mapping the amount of phosphorus loading, uh, which means like a external loading that can result from these alternative uh, uh, growth scenarios. Um, uh, so the invest software provided me a value of uh, uh, loading in terms of like kilogram per hectare per year. And I imported this uh, uh, external loading into a mass balance uh, phosphorus model that was developed and calibrated for Lake Sammamish. It's a simple mass balance model that allow me to um, assess the impact in terms of water quality response. And then I look at the ecosystem services related to the water quality response. So let's briefly start with um, the land use land cover results. So as I say, I started for, uh, from these um, uh, scenarios developed across the entire region. So as we can easily imagine, uh, the unconstrained growth of these scenarios across the Puget Sound resulted in more developed land, 62%, um, uh, compared to the status quo and the managed growth. The status quo is somehow in between um, the two scenarios. Um, um, all the development occur uh, at the expenses of the forest, uh, but again, only the uh, private forest was considered for conversion. When I look uh, at the um, result uh, at the watershed scale, something was really different. Um, the unconstrained growth, very surprisingly, resulted in less developed area and more forest retention compared to the status quo and the managed growth scenarios. Um, the status quo or, or business as usual was the war scenario that allocated uh, more um, development um, than the other two. And this development occurred more in the form of like medium and high uh, density developed. So if we look more closely to what's going on at the watershed scale, so as I mentioned, the um, unconstrained growth uh, allocated more growth outside the urban growth areas uh, and also allow more uh, shoreline development. So across the Puget, uh, across the watershed, the Lake Sammamish watershed compared to the Puget Sound, there were like less opportunity for growth outside the urban growth areas. And so this uh, um, resulted in less growth for these scenarios allocated uh, within these urban growth boundaries. 
And um, so across the water, so like more forest was, retain, uh, was retained. Uh, we can see here that the growth was allocated in the southeastern portion of the watershed and some growth uh, within the Issaquah Basin. Basin. Um, different is the, the case uh, of the status quo and the managed growth. We can see that in both scenarios, more like density, density, uh, more density developed um, um, areas were developed uh, within the urban growth boundaries, uh, which resulted in uh, um, more like a cluster development just in the area uh, surrounding the lake. So if we translate this uh, urban development pattern in terms of like total phosphorus, um, I obtained from the INVEST uh, um, model that the unconstrained growth, as we can easily imagine, resulted in less total phosphorus uh, compared to the other scenarios. So um, if we consider the 2006 like baseline, the status quo resulted in an increase in external phosphorus runoff by up to 32%. Uh, the managed growth resulted in uh, almost 25% more phosphorus runoff and the unconstrained growth uh, um, almost like 2.6% more. So if we translate this in terms of like whole lake total phosphorus, um, we start from uh, values uh, of total phosphorus uh, ranging around 18 microgram per liter. This is like kind of the baseline situation of Lake Sammamish. The lake uh, is um, in a mesotrophic state. So if we increase the external loading uh, to the lake, the um, all lake total phosphorus uh, as a result uh, will increase. And um, the lake, uh, based on the model, uh, is uh, forecasted to shift toward more like eutrophic condition under any scenarios. Uh, even the best case scenario, which is the unconstrained growth, uh, um, kind of forecasts an increase uh, in total phosphorus uh, by uh, about almost 17 percent, which means the water, uh, the phosphorus in the lake uh, will increase to almost uh, 22.8 microgram per liter. Um, the status quo, the worst case scenario, um, 26.8 microgram per liter. I also um, imagine like three scenarios with a higher sediment release rate because um, um, internal loading has always been a big part of the phosphorus budget of the lake, especially in the past. And so I imagine that uh, year after year, more external loading will uh, replenish the phosphorus pool in the sediment that can really contribute to the, this uh, high internal loading. And we can really see from this result uh, that uh, high uh, sediment release rate can have a really um, negative impact on the whole lake total phosphorus. So high um, sediment release rate pair with like uh, high external loading can increase the lake total phosphorus up to 73%. So if we want to have more like a, a comprehensive, uh, comprehensive uh, um, vision of like the historic uh, all lake total phosphorus trend in Lake Sammamish, we can look at this data. So in the past, Lake Sammamish had a um, bad um, history of water quality deterioration due to both point and non-point uh, phosphorus sources. Um, in the mid-60s, a larger uh, lakes restoration project was conducted to divert uh, the point sources from the lake. Um, so the lake uh, water quality significantly improved, the phosphorus uh, decreased uh, um, and was maintained uh, above, uh, was maintained, sorry, below the threshold of management of 22 microgram per liter. So as I say earlier, the phosphorus uh, in the lake ranges around 18 microgram per liter. So we look at the different scenarios and we can see that under any scenarios, the uh, phosphorus in the lake will likely increase to values above the management threshold. Also, this uh, translate in higher chlorophyll A, uh, which means like more lake productivity. And this also mean 
lower sake transparency value. The lake has a water transparency goal of 4 meters, uh, which has been maintained uh, in the last uh, decades. Um, the water transparency of the lake ranges around 5 meters. So the model kind of forecasted a reduction in water transparency up to like 2-3 meters under any scenarios. Of course, the scenarios that also included a higher um, internal loading were the worst. What about management consequences? So these maps are the output I got from the invest model. They represent the total phosphorus uh, um, across the entire watershed um, on the uh, for the different scenarios. Um, so the total phosphorus is expressed in terms of like kilogram per pixel per year. So we can uh, easily see that the scenarios like the status quo and the managed growth that um, um, illustrated like a more like um, cluster development within the urban growth areas um, were the scenarios that resulted in more phosphorus runoff compared to the unconstrained growth um, which resulted in less phosphorus runoff. The purple dots are the stormwater facility. So now the stormwater facility are mostly located um, within the Issaquah Basin, basin and um, at the fringe of the urban growth area in the east side of the watershed. So perhaps in the future, uh, we can kind of see that it may be uh, appropriate maybe to increase the number of stormwater facility, even within the urban growth area, somehow to better management uh, this increased amount of phosphorus runoff. So in conclusion, um, this study kind of show how urban development um, can progressively shift the productivity of the lake toward more eutrophic condition. Um, lake Samami's uh, beneficiaries are somehow accustomed to a good water quality uh, level, the water quality of uh, around five meters. So a reduction in two, three meters in water transparency can have really negative consequences in terms of recreational and aesthetic benefit, um, without even mention the potential impact on uh, water um, wild, uh, wildlife habitat, because more eutrophic system can be um, really detrimental for the wildlife habitat. So uh, this study is particularly relevant because um, uh, show the potential impact that alternative urban development can have on the ecosystem services provided by a major urban lake. And also kind of uh, show the importance um, uh, of conducting uh, ecosystem service trade-off analysis across multiple spatial scales, for instance, the regional versus the local scale. For instance, the scenarios that allow for more shoreline development, uh, the unconstrained growth, um, um, maybe resulted in negative impact for the ecosystem services at the coastal area. But if we look at the impact on uh, uh, lakes, so, you know, more like a local scale, uh, that was not bad. Actually, it was the best, scenario, the best case scenarios. Um, so the lakes should be really considered into the analysis of this potential trade-off among different ecosystem services across the landscape. Um, on the top of everything, uh, I'm just going to briefly mention climate change can eventually make things worse because uh, especially for this area, climate change forecast uh, an increase in precipitation level, especially during the winter, which can uh, um, increase the runoff of the lake. Uh, runoff of total phosphorus in the lake, uh, which over time can uh, contribute in replenish this um, um, sediment pool of phosphorus uh, that can really drive up the productivity of the lake during the summer. So thank you so much for watching my presentation. Um, I really hope to see you live at the Q&A um, to um, discuss uh, my project and address your question. And if you have more comments, please feel free to reach out anytime. My email is laura27 at pdx.edu. Thank you so much and I will see you later. Bye.
Thank you, Laura, and thank you to all three uh, presenters today. We do have some questions, which I will read. So the first one is for Emily. Emily, can you talk about wind velocity, direction, and uh, fetch in relation to your identified algae hotspots in Lake Whatcom? We find a good relationship for this at Green Lake in Seattle. You need to unmute. <laughs> Great. Yeah, um, that, that's a really astute uh, question because that is one of the reasons we wanted to get this sort of spatial data. Um, we haven't actually looked yet at the wind direction and fetch on these algae hotspots. So that's kind of where this project is going. But what we'll be doing is, or what we would like to do is look at different wind events and then pull up the algae predictions for those dates in that area. It'll take a little bit of data wrangling, but nothing we can't do. Um, and then look to see to what extent those wind directions are affecting um, where the algae is. And then asking, is this always the case or is this a factor creating um, variance in our results? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, another question for Emily. Are you able to distinguish algae from macrophytes or other things that might show similar coloring? For example, the reflectivity of the lake bed in shallow water. Yeah, so we haven't um, gone through and parsed between the aquatic macrophytes and the algae. And I think that's a pretty important thing that's going to require a little bit of in-situ data validation. Um, and that's one thing that would take this from a technique that gives us an idea of where problem areas might be to a technique that can tell us quantifiable, reliable hotspot values. Mm -hmm. um, so from macrophytes, we haven't looked at that yet, but um, we've talked about it. Uh, for the lake bed, it actually shows a very different signal. Um, when you can see the bottom, it actually shows up. I had in one of my slides, I showed the shoreline interference. Um, it actually shows a very small, it shows like a zero algae prediction um, or zero chlorophyll prediction right in the um, areas where you're getting the bottom water reflectance. So that's pretty obvious because we know we wouldn't see such a hard line from three or four to zero. So we can tell that that is the shoreline reflectance. Mm -hmm. Okay. And question for Curtis. Curtis, could, could the chlorophyll peak in 2015 be due to low surface phosphorus loading resulting from the low snow melt and inflow rates? I wonder if that's backwards. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I don't have a good explanation. I mean, I guess the other thing I'll point to is the, the increased stability in 2015. The thermal stability was um, kind of off the charts. So there's a mm -hmm. stratification during the summer. So mm -hmm. I, one possibility is that uh, it makes it more difficult for the algae to settle through the thermocline into the hypolimnion. Um, it also, uh, I guess, that mixing is going to be perhaps, you know, it's going to be a little better defined in a uh, in the surface layer. So keeps the algae uh, in the light and happy, I guess. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but it may have something to do with uh, loading in the spring or uh, some, some feature of the that unusual warm spring that we had that uh, translated into potentially more. So you have the spring bloom, it basically consumes the nutrients in the in the lake and then it, whatever the diatoms don't consume kind of gets translated into the epilimnion and that's the, the nutrients that the algae sort of in zooplankton cycle on through the summer. So maybe they got a, an extra boost at the end of the spring uh, because of the the quick onset of uh, strong stratification in spring. That's a, another okay. thought I've had. Okay, another question for Curtis. Years ago, in comparing Lake Washington and Lake Sammamish, differences were attributed to the difference in basin shape, Lake Washington being more U-shaped or flattened W-shaped, and Lake Sammamish being V-shaped. As a result, the epilimnetic production was more concentrated in Lake Sammamish hypolimnion. Does that still hold up? 
Um, yeah, so I've never heard that explanation. And so the one that the, the explanation that's given in uh, in uh, Gene Welch's EPA report from 1977, and I believe it's been it's appeared probably in, a, in something that Edmondson's written is that it's not so much the shape, it's the the hypo, the epilimnetic to hypolimnetic volume ratio. So they have a very right. simple shape, but their Lake Sammamish is much shallower, but they have the same uh, epilimnetic thickness. So and this roughly mm -hmm. the amount of phosphorus aerial loading. Um, mm -hmm. the same amount of phytoplankton production. So that same amount of phytoplankton production uh, gets uh, uh, decomposed in a much smaller volume in Lake Sammamish mm -hmm. than Washington. So the ocean levels in Lake Washington go down to maybe five, six, seven milligrams mm -hmm. in the in the summer, but they never be, it never becomes anoxic um, just because there's so much more oxygen in the high balloon into that the bacteria can work on. Mm -hmm. From what I recall, in the 60s, Lake Washington oxygen levels in the hypolimnion, deep hypolimnion did approach too. But after sewage diversion, uh, that recovered quite quickly. Right. Um, okay, another quick one. Uh, is the data from Lake Washington about thermal stability published? Um, the initial trends were published, um, but we, there's nothing been published since the papers that uh, Monica Winder and George R. Panditsis published back in uh, mid 2000s. Right, right. Okay. Now, a question for Laura. There is probably, wait a minute. I got to, I'm having a problem here. This would take just a second. Is there a risk that someone who quickly glances at the study might use it to advocate for uncontrolled growth based on? Oh, let's see. If so, how do you manage that in your communications and sharing your results with the public? Yeah, that's a very good question. And um, um, there has been a like, few studies that have been looking at the difference uh, between the urban sprawl and urban density development and the impact that these have on water quality. Um, some of the studies were conducted actually in Puget Sound um, by Marina Alberti. And, um, you know, we all think like uh, sprawl development is bad for, you know, some of the ecosystem services. But some studies show that actually can be better than more like a density development, especially around the, uh, the lake, you know, um, the urban growth area. Uh, if we look at the map, it's like a buffer zone around Lake Sammamish. And if we put like a more concentrated growth within those areas, then the result in terms of like total phosphorus and then, you know, lake water quality response is obvious. Um, so I know this is kind of like, um, I want to say, a political question and it's tricky when we communicate the, the science result because I don't want to say like, yes, let's do like urban sprawl. Maybe the study was more like toward we should really carefully consider decision made like a big uh, regional scale toward like a, a single habitat uh, because something that can be um, detrimental, for instance, for like the coastal system, if we put more like uh, pressure on that area, uh, we can be better for the lake if we put like less uh, growth around that uh, in, within that uh, watershed. So I think that's a very tricky question to um, at the end, like to communicate because, um, mm. you know, we don't want to say yes, go for urban sprawl growth, but we just want to make sure we carefully consider um, all the impact in, you know, a uh, large scale of ecosystem services. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a final quick, quick question for Laura. Have you considered evaluating a scenario where clustered and controlled development was focused away from the lake? I think that might be a zoning question. But yeah. yeah, that's a good question and I would like to do it. The problem is the limitation of data available because to run this model, you really need to have this, um, this map, this raster map um, with um, the, you know, the, the scenarios. And I, the only data I was able to find is this study that was part of this Envision in Puget Sound. It was conducted mm -hmm. like a few years ago and those are the only like, uh, raster data available to run this kind of software. Mm -hmm. So okay. um, 
probably there is a way in GIS to kind of create my own map, and that would be really good. But even if we allocate more growth, but it's within the watershed, you know, the, that runoff can still reach the lake. Mm. And at the end, of, you know, it kind of comes down to the amount of forest that is retained because, you know, in terms of like phosphorus runoff, the forest has a really like a, um, the largest, largest capability of really retaining phosphorus. Thank you. Well, that's going to conclude our question and answer session. If we didn't get to your question, um, please make sure it got sent to info at walpa.org and we'll see about getting a response to you. So right now we have a 10 minute break. We will reconvene at 1130 and that will be for the Walpa business meeting. Uh, following that, we'll have a lunch break and we will take up our afternoon sessions beginning at one o'clock. So thank you so much for attending. I hope you'll come to the Walpa business meeting and find out what we're up to.
macam tu. Hello. I believe that we are getting ready to start the business meeting. So this is 2020 wrap up. And we're gonna start with a list of important thank yous. And first of all, thanks to our conference sponsors, whose logos you've seen on the screen. At the gold level, we have Aquatechnics, who not only sponsored this conference, but has also donated more money to support the Dave Lamb Scholarship next year. Also at the gold level, we thank Herrera Environmental and CD3 Systems. We really appreciate it. At the silver level, we have to thank FICO Tech Incorporated. And unfortunately, their logo did not get onto our slideshow because they were a little bit of a late entrant. But we really appreciate their support. And next year, we promise to get you on the slide. At the bronze level, we want to thank Advanced Ecosystems, Eco Solutions, excuse me, Insight You and Western Washington University Institute for Watershed Studies. We really appreciate all your support for this association and its mission. Next, I wanna thank all the registrants for this conference, and especially those who paid to become voting members or who donated to help keep WALPA afloat. Because this virtual format doesn't lend itself to doing our customary fundraising that we do at hotels, we're facing a bit of a lean time, and your generous, generous support really matters to us. Um, if you're not yet a voting member and you would like to join, there is a link on our homepage that will allow you to become a voting member or make a donation. We also want to thank the UW Tacoma Information Technology Department and especially Mark DePaul and his crew. Um, they're hosting this conference on the YouTube channel, UW's YouTube channel, and they're making all the mechanics and links work today. We much appreciate it. We don't really know how to do this. We're limnologists. We need computer wizards to make this conference successful. And so far, they're doing a fabulous job. We also want to thank the members of the WALPA Conference Committee who worked very hard to make this conference a success. Um, especially Rob Suzette, who did an amazing amount of work to get and keep this conference on track. He gets five gold stars from us. Other members of the committee included Jen Oden, Rachel Gravon, Katie Ruthenberg, and myself. We also got help from the entire board when we needed it. And finally, many, many thanks to our retiring board members who will not serve beyond this conference. Rachel Gravon is retiring as our past president and will make a hopefully short vacation from the board. Rachel, thanks for all your hard work and your long tenure. We would like to present Rachel with a gift certificate to REI to help support her backpacking and running habits. Uh, please look for an email on Friday from REI in the best virtual tradition. Thanks also to retiring board members Jennifer Parsons, Lizbeth Seabacher, and Darren Brandt for their four-year tenures as board members. We hope to get those recognition certificates into snail mail for you as soon as possible, but just know in the meantime, we really ap appreciate everything that you have done. Now I'm gonna move on to the announcement of the slate of candidates that we have for the 2021 board. We're going to be sending an election email for approval of the entire group, who are highly capable candidates, by the way, to the voting members of WALPA by Friday. Um, voting will be open through October 30th, so please look for this email. As incoming president, we thank Jennifer Oden of Snohomish County. She will be responsible for working on the conference committee next year, putting together our in-house in conference at Richland, we hope. Rob Suzette, who is incoming this year, is going to move to president. And he is from Herrera Environmental. 
and I am moving from president to past president, and I am retired, most lately from King County, where I was for 15 years. Our new treasurer will be Rebecca Styling, who's a graduate student at the University of Washington Central Campus. And our new board members include Paula Cracknell of Thurston County, Wafa Tefesh of King County, Shannon Bradabo of Tetra Tech, and Matt Colston from Island County. We welcome you all. We're really excited about next year. And a reminder to our voting members, please send in your yes. Um, and if it's a no, let us know why by October 30th. So now we're going to move on to our 2020 scholarship winners. They will be announced by our scholarship committee chair, Jennifer Parsons. Jennifer? Oops, can't hear you. Helps to unmute, sorry. Um, we had a great suite of candidates this year. Um, the first winner was for the Nancy Weller Memorial Scholarship for a PhD, and that was for $1,250. Um, and it went to Catherine Swinson. Catherine is a third year PhD student in environmental and natural resource science at Washington State University in Vancouver. Um, the title of her study is Impacts of Warming Climate and Reburn Events on Water Storage and Transport in the Washington Cascades. And um, the next one was for the Dave Lamb Memorial Scholarship, which goes to a master's degree student, and it's for $1,000. And the winner of that is Salvador Rob Chavez. And he is a master's student in environmental science at Washington State University in Vancouver again. And the title of his study is Broad Scale Distribution, Abundance and the Habitat Association of the Invasive Asian Clam Corbicula flum fluminea in the Lower Columbia River. And the last scholarship is for an undergraduate student for $500, and that went to Hannah Hackenstad. And Hannah is a student at the University of Idaho who is studying seasonal spatial distribution of zooplankton in Willow Creek Reservoir in relation to hypolimnetic anoxia. And all of these pre um, have posters during the poster con um, the poster presentations tomorrow morning. So please be sure to tune in for that session and learn more about their studies. And that's it. Um, about the posters, if you would like to see them in advance, they're currently posted on the WALPA web's website under the conference link. And you'll be able to look at them up close and think about what they're doing before the session tomorrow. So thank you, Jen. Now we're going to go to our annual Secchi Award, which is a recognition of someone who has really um, gone above and beyond, both for lakes and for our association. This year's award winner will experience something unique in the annals of Walpa, and that is this person will be awarded the 2020 disc but won't actually receive it until next year. And the reason for that is that we do plan to have a live conference that will make it possible for well-wishers to sign the awarded SECI before we make the presentation. Um, not much point in sending a blank SECI. We think this person probably has a lot of them already. Much better to wait and get those signatures. So who better to understand how to make things work somehow than our chosen winner this year, who is Jim Gowell of University of Tacoma. Jim, I hope you're there. Congratulations. And here to share a little about you is your fellow UW faculty member, Avery Shinneman. Thanks, Avery. You're welcome. And congratulations, Jim. It's very weird to not know if you're here uh, or to, to be able to uh, see you <laughs> joining us. Um, but as Sally said, the, the Walt Basecki Award honors every year someone for their outstanding contributions to science, management, and protection of lakes in Washington. 
uh, and I'm, I'm happy to, pre to, to present that to, to Dr. Jim Gall. I'm also honored to present this because I know many of the people in this virtual room uh, that are out here today can probably also speak to the many things that Jim uh, has contributed to lakes in Washington. Um, and, and really everyone probably has something they, they can add. And I encourage you, if you do, to add that in the chat as we go or send us an email, send Jim an email and let him know uh, how how uh, how you have seen his influence at work uh, protecting lakes in Washington. For those who may not know him yet, um, Jim is an associate professor in the School of Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences at the University of Washington Tacoma, where he came in 1999, I think directly from finishing his PhD uh, in, in uh, civil and environmental engineering at MIT. Uh, at UWT, his primary research has been in the fate of arsenic and other contaminants in lakes. Um, and that alone, I think, is, is uh, worthy of the Secchi Award. Um, but really, Jim has gone far beyond that uh, and has done a lot to build community partnerships in Tacoma and with everything from um, pub talks to K-12 partnerships uh, has really made that science meaningful to non-limnologists uh, in Tacoma and throughout Washington as well. Uh, I also want to acknowledge Jim as a, as a teacher and a mentor. He has an outstanding undergraduate research lab uh, that has many students, uh, gotten many students on their feet with research experiences that have gone on uh, to, to management agencies and, and uh, local positions in water management and environmental management. And also lots of students who haven't, uh, students that have just gotten a great research experience and learned more about the environment and gone off uh, in other ways. Jim has also been a great mentor to, to newly arriving faculty and researchers in the region, myself included. Uh, I, I got looped into a project with him at Spirit Lake that's been uh, a really wonderful experience and built a lot of great partnerships um, through that. And he's really a, a welcoming mentor to a lot of, uh, to a lot of people in the region. Um, I also want to say that this award doesn't necessarily go to someone for their contributions to WALPA directly, but Jim has made more than more than enough contributions to WALPA to, to merit this award on, on those alone. He's been on the board for nine of the last 10 years, twice as president, uh, and really got out of his way to support WALPA in its mission to, to really um, get people to devote their time uh, and devote their resources in working for lakes uh, and making sure that they're they're here for all of us uh, for generations to come and, and, and clean and, and safe places to be. So uh, I know that it's disappointing to not get the sucky disc in person, if for no other reason than I'm sure that uh, Jim's thinking hard about his Halloween costume, and at least twice now that has been his sucky disc. Um, and so I hope that he has a spare one to use uh, as his Halloween costume this year while he waits for the signed one to come in uh, in 2021. So congratulations to Jim, and I hope people can join me in congratulating him Wherever you find him, if it's on Twitter or in the YouTube comments or by email, uh, reach out and, and give him a big congrats. So, Thank you, Avery. Um, maybe we can all send him secchi discs in the meantime. But uh, I'm sure that he is delighted. Unfortunately, we can't take your delight live right now. I see that there is a YouTube chat going on. Um, so maybe that way. However, I'm thinking that you could probably express your true feelings in a pithy comment that we could publish in the December waterline. So let's see what you can come up with. Now that I am past president and waterline liaison, I might be bugging you for that. Now we're going to go to talking about 2020, which is me. So, well, my this year, uh, in which I was president, has been interesting, but certainly different from what I expected at the outset. COVID-19 came along and didn't waste any time impacting our work. No sooner had we signed a contract with the Red Lion in Richland to hold our fall conference there, than the quarantine began. And it soon became apparent that the conference was unlikely to go on live as scheduled. So we ended up spending a fair amount of time trying to renegotiate the contract. And ultimately we succeeded in getting our live conference moved by contract to October of 2021. And I think Rob, if you remember, the dates are the 21st to 23rd, something like that. So you can put that on your schedule for Sorry. next year. 
Okay, so everybody keep your fingers and toes crossed and your masks on and maybe we'll be able to meet together then. I hope so. Um, we also agreed with Ola that our future joint conference, which had been planned for 2021, should be moved to 2022. And that will be in the fall of that year in Vancouver. So we took care of that. Now I'm going to move on to another sheet of paper. We also had to table our plans for moving along the hosting of a Western Regional Conference because of the pandemic and also because having a large in-person conference was just not going to be planable for the, the near future. In addition, um, we had to put our plans on hold for the creation of an HOA small grant program because of our current financial instability. Um, we're hoping that once we can get back on track with our full conference, that we will be able to find more sponsors and do more fundraising to get that small grant program moving along. But we are excited about the opportunity presented in response to and in conjunction with the current social justice movement that's occurring throughout the country. Our WALPA boarders, board members decided to create a diversity and social equity committee that is looking into what we as WALPA members and board can do to encourage and support the diverse representation in our own group, as well as in our various career organizations that we belong to. This committee was originally conceived as ad hoc, but it's becoming clear that this work is so important that it probably needs to go on for a while, if not just become an ongoing committee to keep us on track. The creation of the virtual conference in place of our live conference offered a lot of challenges and it took up quite a bit of the board time this year. But, you know, it felt good to be able to find a way to keep our members in touch and to be able to hold a conference in this very strange year. Um, we were just overjoyed by the number of people who registered. And we're thinking that we may gain a lot of members this way. And thank you so much if you decide to join. We love to have more members. I've enjoyed being able to help WALPA to keep on going this year. And I hope many of our new members and our old members will consider taking on a more active role to maintain momentum for lake protection and stay productive. So thank you very much. And now I'm going to turn it over to Rob Suzette for his remarks about what he foresees next year. Well, thank you, Sally. Um, I foresee continuing on the great work that you've started in, or can, you continued in 2020. I don't have any great new visions, but I think there's a lot of work still to be done. Um, one thing I would be say is, uh, well, let's assess this virtual conference thing. What, what are the pros and the cons of it? Financially, socially, um, uh, access wise, I think there's lots of things to think about and how it may uh, or may not be incorporated into future WALPA conferences. Of course, um, I'll be there here uh, supporting uh, WALPA's conference in 2021 in Richland and with Ola in 2022. That's set. Those are great. We need to uh, ensure that um, those are very successful uh, conferences as they, as I fully expect them to be. Um, I also would like to continue uh, supporting uh, our committees. Uh, the new one, uh, as Sally mentioned, which is very exciting and, and there's a lot more work to be done with our diversity, equity and inclusion committee. Uh, along with one that was mentioned was the financial health committee that Jen Owen started and to really evaluate sort of WALPA's uh, income and expenses and, and look actually at ways of perhaps uh, ultimately funding additional outreach through either the Western Regional Conference or an HOA grant program. So I think these are all great ideas that we really didn't have time to, um, or the energy to address in 2020. And, and I hope to uh, uh, progress some more on those in 2021. 
And finally, I do think that, uh, I mean, our outreach to our members is critical. Our newsletter, our website are very important um, mechanisms for our communication with uh, not just WALPA members, but um, the lay community in general. And of course, it's important for us to continue um, managing that and improving those communications. I encourage everyone in the audience to submit uh, uh, ideas or articles for our newsletter. Um, it's a very well produced um, uh, newsletter that I, I think uh, could be further um, improved our communication. And also uh, we're looking to get a webmaster to help uh, update that website more regularly as Jen uh, moves from that role into president elect. And um, so we're looking for uh, that uh, role to fill. And that's about all I have for now, but I will open it up to the our WAPA members and community. Uh, we accept and welcome ideas for how WAPA, WAPA can better serve um, its members and the Lake community in general. So thank you. I also would like to share uh, my thanks for everybody coming today. It's very exciting to have this many people attending our conference. Um, and it's just been a real interesting experiment for me to be involved with. And I'm very excited to see um, how it's worked and, and how we're going to proceed. And with that, uh, that's about all I have to say here. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, we're now going to adjourn and we will be back after lunch, reconvene at one o'clock when we will deal with our first session of the afternoon, session number three, algae. So hope to see you then. Enjoy your lunch and thank you very much.
All right, everybody, it looks like we are going to get started with our next session uh, at one o'clock promptly. Um, hi, my name is Rachel Gravon, and I'm going to be moderating our afternoon sessions today with the help of Darren Brandt, who is working uh, invisibly in the background as my silent moderator. So I hope everyone enjoyed their lunch. Uh, we're going to get started with our next session, which is one very near and dear to my heart. It is about algae. Hi, everybody. So let's get started. Our first talk is going to be with, I'm sorry, I'm getting a ton of feedback on my computer. Okay, there we go. I don't want to hear my own voice. That's weird. Uh, <laughs> we're going to get started with Theo Dreher's talk. Thanks, Theo. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Um, have we got the first slide up? Uh, yeah, right. So this is work that uh, we've done over the last uh, few years. Uh, it's been really exciting for me. I retired at the end of, as a professor at Oregon State University at the end of December last year. And so as things were winding it down in the last year, uh, I was doing a, quite a bit of this work myself. And since I've been, during the pandemic, I've been working about half time uh, on this after retiring. But I have got a lot of help and that's uh, reflected here with uh, Ryan Miller's name. He's a colleague in the Department of Microbiology, and Ed Davis, who is in the uh, Center for Genome Research by Computing at Oregon State University. So we've analyzed uh, cyanobacterial blooms, next slide please, uh, the filamentous uh, blooms of the Nostocalus. So there's no uh, microcystis in this work. And this slide shows the um, the uh, lakes that we've sampled, so it's, it's mostly been Oregon. In the past, we've sampled Anderson Lake up there at the top left and de determined the genome sequence of the dolichospermum that produces anatoxin. Uh, that's Anderson Lake up near um, Port Townsend. <clears throat> and Brown's Lake in eastern uh, Washington was the one Washington Lake. The others, as, as you can see, are in Oregon, and there's one at the bottom, the Iron Gate Reservoir in northern um, California. And in Oregon, these are mostly alpine lakes or reservoirs on the major rivers draining the Cascades. So a fair number of lakes. And in the next slide, uh, this outlines the procedure that we've used to determine the genome sequences. Our intent was not to get um, partial genome sequences, but the complete so-called closed or finished genome sequences. So you get as much information about the genome as, as you can. So we've sampled, we've not cultured any of these uh, uh, strains. That's the usual sort of case. So we've, we've done direct sequencing um, because it does have some advantages. It gives you, as we'll see, it gives you direct information on the, pop, the standing population. And all of this has been done over the last few years. So these are quite recent HABs from the Pacific Northwest. So we've always documented microscopically what's been there. And then we've filtered the samples to get rid of small stuff, particularly free living bacteria. And then we've done two types of sequencing that's illustrated by, <clears throat> if you're bakers, by the um, um, decorative, um, we call them hundreds and thousands in Australia. Uh, so at the bottom there is the, the bigger ones. This represents long read sequencing. So the technology we've used there gets rather large segments the idea being that um, genomes have repeat sequences that are maybe four or five thousand nucleotides long and these can confuse <clears throat> most the, the traditional sort of sequencing acquisition pipeline and and by getting these large chunks all at once you maximize the ability to put them together again um, to to produce a, a genome because you you have to fragment the physically fragment the DNA in order to sequence it and then use the computer again to put together that fragmented information to assemble a genome. At the same time, we've, we've done short read sequencing and that's illustrated on the far right uh, where you get little snippets. You get tons of them though, whereas the long read sequencing, you don't get quite so much information. And the combination of the two gives you the sort of uh, information, the rich information that I'll talk about and um, and we'll see what, what that can do in the next slide. So this is the, um, <clears throat> we'll go through these steps one by one. Uh, the questions that we were interested in is first, 
what cyanohabs, what, what the cyan, that, what, which of the cyanohabs do produce toxins or taste and odor compounds and which ones? And you can infer this from the genes that you find. The second question, how does the morphotype, that is what you see in the microscope and described as say in a phanosomenon plus acle or a dolichospermy, how does that relate to the genotype? Um, because that's not obvious. It might be that you see one sort of morphotype and underlying that could be actually a few different strains, different genotypes. Uh, third question, what's the cyanohab population structure in a given bloom? I just mentioned that. Could there be perhaps a number of, of strains? And what happens from year to year? Over, over wintering, the, the bloom virtually disappears and then comes back to, to a raging presence that fills the lake. So you go from boom to bust. And what happens there in, in a lake from, from year to year? Um, the fourth question, how do cyanohabs differ um, from, from lake to lake across a region? If you're looking at, at say, dolichosperma that has fairly similar sort of um, morphology under the microscope, do you find the same strains or are they fairly different? The fifth question, uh, what's the taxonomic relationship between anadena, dolichosperma and aphanosomin and flosacre? And those are the very thorny questions that I'll get to at the end. Uh, the last question there is, what sort of co-occurring bacteria exist? There's the idea that there's a phy uh, phycosphere, so that there are other bacteria and probably have, have a, a shared lifestyle with the same bacteria and perhaps provide some sort of benefits, maybe produce vitamins or something. Um, and so there's a lot of interest in the field about this. Now, this I just won't have time to touch on. Uh, next slide, please. I also won't discuss this one for very long, but the idea here is that if you look at that green column, there are a lot of entries. So we've really got quite a lot of genomes. And the ones that are dark green, uh, they're the ones that we've completely finished. So those are completely closed and finished genomes. So that really all the information that you can glean from this type of an approach is available. In other times, the, the, the say the lighter green ones, they're not quite finished. So the, the, the true arrangement of the genes around the chromosome is, is, is in, in, in a bit uncertain. Um, I'll get to the details of this later on. Next slide. This shows the, um, these associated bacteria. And again, just the same thing. I want to say that we have quite a lot of these and um, I won't be able to talk about that because of time limitation. So if we go to the next slide. Uh, next slide, yeah, that one, yep. Yeah. Um, this is the first question. So what do we find in interpreting the genes present once we've finished these genomes in terms of the presence of, of uh, toxin genes and taste and odor compounds? Because these are, these are the compounds that are important to us in terms of getting uh, good, clean drinking water and, and with respect to public health. So the good news, and you kind of know this, is that not all of these cyanobacteria are toxic. And, um, and perhaps certainly more than half of them, half of the isolates we've got are, are not toxic. We didn't find any toxin genes associated with aphanosomenon plus acrae, and we have a number of, of those isolates, uh, nor from Glovia trichia. Glovia trichia on the east coast is toxic. But, but perhaps not here, certainly not, we, we haven't found that to be. Amongst dolichospermum, or I've got them entered here as anabina, <laughs> but think dolichospermum, um, because these are all planktonic, these are all free floating blooms. Um, <clears throat> a number of these are not toxic, but some also are. And that includes anatoxin producers. Now in this case, it's a Finnish isolate, but I mentioned previously we'd sequenced the genome from uh, the dolichospermum in Anderson Lake up near Port Townsend, and that's a potent anatoxin producer. We've seen cylindrospermopsin genes and microcystin genes. So all of those do exist in the Pacific Northwest, just not in all of the um, genomes. Geosmin is also present, but again, selectively. And, and so we have four strains of about, about over, over a dozen that a, a geosmin producers. So some of, the, some of the cyanobacteria bottom line is produce toxins or geosmin and have the genes to do so. Others don't, and they won't be able to produce uh, any of those compounds. They just don't have the genetic capacity. Next slide, please. This shows geographically in Oregon where we've seen the toxin producers. So C for cylindrase bimopsin, that was found in the Memorial Day bloom. It occurs really around Memorial Day every year. 
in Detroit Lake that's upstream on the Santiam River, upstream from Salem. And that you might remember a couple of summers ago, there was a problem with drinking water in Salem. There was an emergency and there was a do not drink uh, order for uh, pregnant women and, um, and, and young infants. So there was low concentrations of cylindrospermopsin and microcystis that broke through into the finished water. So we iso we've isolated here this genome sequence of the cylindrospermopsin producer and the microcystin producer. We also saw microcystin in, um, in three other lakes. Two of those were the same, I'll talk about that later, the same strain in, in lakes that are a couple of hundred kilometres apart. Uh, and then on the bottom right down there in the southeast on the map, that M relates to the picture of the uh, dead cow over there on the left. Uh, this was a, a dolichospermin producing microcystin that was associated with a steer die-off of about 30 steers in summer, I think it was 2018. So we see microcystin producers amongst dolichospermin are sort of scattered in Oregon. There are a number of different strains. Uh, and the Globia trichia producing isolates are shown. There were two dolichospermin and two diosmin that were um, geographically distributed. Next slide, please. <clears throat> now, the second question is how do the, does the genotype, how does the genome sequence relate to morphotype with a microscope? And of course, we all know if you've looked at these cyanobacteria, they're really beautiful under the microscope. They're easy to see because they're big cells and they make these great big long filaments and, and aggregations and colonies. And even with that crummy little cheap uh, microscope there on the bottom right, which we take on all our field trips, it's fantastic. You can see all this stuff. So it's tremendously important to use morphology to see what you've got. Uh, and fortunately, what we've seen is the relationship, at least in these uh, HABs that we've, we've, we've sampled, between genotype and, and morphotype is quite simple. Where there's a single genotype, morphotype, we found a single genotype. And in the case on the right, where there are two, we've found two. Now, what I would say you cannot do though, is infer the genotype from the morphotype across lakes, because very similar looking um, uh, uh, morphotypes can yield very different genotypes. Next slide, the question of succession from year to year. Um, <clears throat> What this shows is the genomes aligned from left to right. And then, then uh, if the same color bar appears, that means the same sequence is present, the same genes are present in the same arrangement. And what you see here in, on the left for Detroit Reservoir, where we've sampled four years running um, <clears throat> and twice in one year, we get the same strain every year. Very interesting. So overwintering where you've hardly got any cells and there could easily be a genetic bottleneck and then it roars back to a new, new um, hab, same strain. And that was also seen in Odell Lake over two years. So I don't, I don't know that that happens all the time. It's probably not going to be totally generalizable, but it perhaps is more the default state, which is kind of nice because it means that if you get to know the habs in your system, in your lake, that there's, there's a, you could expect reasonably a certain amount of consistency. Next slide. On the other hand, if you compare the genomes of dolichospermin on the top there, the, the genome diagram at the top, um, from different lakes, you get this jumble. So rather than one long pink bar, you get a whole lot of different colored bars reflecting that the genome has been segmented. Each of those colored bars is found in each genome, but they're much smaller, uh, shorter sequences. And if you then look at the lines that connect the two vertically, some of those are quite quite slanted, meaning that the gene, those gene segments have shifted from one part of the chromosome to a very completely different type, different part. So that's the usual case for anabina. And that's why I say that the morphotype relates, that does not lay, relate very well to genotype if you're sampling different lakes. Gloria tricky, on the other hand, doesn't seem to have quite so much genome fragmentation and, 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 um, and randomization. Uh, next slide. Um, occasionally, when you look geographically, you will find the same strain, evidently, because that's happened here. But we seem to see the same strain as a microsystem producer from Odell Lake and then from much further north in Lake Galicia North. Next slide. And so I'll just finish with this in a couple of minutes. 
Um, when we look at relationships between genomes, there are two ways you can do it. You, you can build a phylogenetic tree that's like a family tree on the left. And that in, from that, this follows from inferring the sequence changes that accumulate between different genomes. And you infer the, the time specific order in which they, 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 they were incorporated and you get a family tree. And what you see there, as we recognized in that paper in 2018, is that there's an ADA clade. That's, that's A for anadena, D for dolichosperm, A for aphanosomenon, floss aqua that is, is that colored uh, uh, branch that represents most of our genome uh, sequences from, from our standing halves. The, on the right, is, ref reflects the analysis of average nucleotide identity. And um, there you take this a lot, these aligned sequences and you see how many changes have occurred, you quantitate the changes. And then you compare them on the graph uh, the list of, of genomes vertically and horizontally, and the diagonal represents the self against self. And then there are relationships where you get boxes. And those boxes, the largest box there that's mostly fairly yellow, that reflects that ADA clade. And you see that those boxes are very separate from other uh, genus or species boxes. So in the next slide, <clears throat> what you, um, the, the left, the left, branch reflects, uh, just reproduces what we had on the previous slide. On the right branch is a rather large book that uh, was published earlier this year from a group in Finland. And I'm not presenting our new tree that incorporates all the new sequences because we're just about to submit that, but that's reflected in the middle. The bottom line is that all of these, these uh, Aphanosomonon floss aqua and Dolichosperm and blooms are from, we're finding are from the same branch of this, this Nostocales um, uh, um, family of cyanobacteria. So they're all fairly closely related. And the evidence is that this, this ought to be, this branch ought to be considered a genus. A genus normally has one name. It doesn't have a, you know, an Amadena name, a Dolichospermum name, and an Aphanosomenon name. So there's a taxonomic problem. And further, we've found that the Cuspidothrix is such in koi is also included in this. So there are some sequence, some problems that we can identify from sequencing that that were introduced into, into taxonomy over, over the previous period. And we think there are probably 10 different species within this, this genus. We can talk more about that in questions. The next slide just is a summary. I don't think uh, we need to go over that. And then finally, if you go to the last slide, yes, the um, next slide, the acknowledgements. I mentioned my colleagues Ryan and Ed Davis. Um, there have been a few other people, and particularly a lot of people helped with uh, sample providing samples. In uh, Washington, um, Sally has, and Fran Sweeney from, um, we've had a long relationship, long interactions at the King County Labs. Um, so that's about it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Theo. Um, that was fantastic. Um, I did forget to mention earlier that we will be taking questions at the end of all of our talks as we did for the previous sessions this morning. Uh, so up next, we have a recorded presentation from Angelica Lichetto. And Angelica is here to answer your questions after the presentation as well. So take it away. Thanks. Hello everyone, my name is Angelica Lucchetto and I am an undergraduate student in environmental science at the University of Washington Bothell. Today I'll be presenting the influence of floating logs on lake ecosystems, a comparison of Coldwater Lake and Spirit Lake on Mount St. Helens. And I've been a part of this research project for three years now, so I'm excited to present our findings so far. I'd like to thank the faculty members who've helped me with this project, which are Avery Shinneman, Kena Fox-Dobbs, and Jim Gowell. 
All right. As a little bit of an introduction, Mount St. Helens erupted on May 18th, 1980, and it eliminated almost all vegetation in the blast zone. The debris avalanche and pyroclastic flow, which you can see in beige and pink in the top picture, altered the blast zone's hydrology. The pyroclastic flow blocked off the outlet of Spirit Lake, which raised the surface elevation by 64 meters. And also the debris avalanche blocked off Coldwater Creek, which formed Coldwater Lake itself. Although Coldwater wasn't hit directly by the pyroclastic flow, the lakes are comparable because their most recent geologic configurations were formed from the same event. The key feature that distinguishes the lakes is the presence of the floating log mat on Spirit Lake, which is outlined in red on the bottom left picture. Our original research focused only on Spirit Lake, but we decided to compare them because Spirit Lake was inaccessible this year due to COVID camping and travel restrictions. But it actually ended up being a good opportunity to compare otherwise similar lakes that have one intriguing difference. So the main question or goal of the study is, how does Spirit Lake's floating log mat impact the lake's ecosystem? So our original reason for sampling at Spirit Lake in the first place was Jim Gowell's previous work, which found that there was a nutrient imbalance where there was far more nitrogen output than nitrogen input, which was pretty unexpected. Our original goal was to determine the source of the excess nitrogen, and we had the hypothesis that the nitrogen-fixing cyanobacteria on the log mat could be a major contributor. We did some rough calculations based on our results from 2018, but we didn't end up finding cyanobacteria in a high enough abundance to prove that hypothesis from log mat growth alone. However, our sampling prompted continued research on the role of the log mat, which is the topic of this presentation. Sampling the log mat also gives us a better idea of the lake's ecology, as sampling has been pretty spotty between the 1980s and now, and it's only targeted plankton suspended in the water column. So by sampling the periphyton, we're learning more about the unique habitat niches in the lake. The methods we used to get a comprehensive sample of the lake's ecosystem included plankton toes, surface sediment samples, macrophyte samples, and log scrapes, and a suspended rack of microscope slides beneath a smaller log mat that we constructed. And we constructed the smaller log mats in Duck Bay out of logs that were already floating on the lake, which we roped together and secured to logs sticking vertic vertically from the lake bottom which you can see Jim doing on the left there. Because the constructed log mats were secured in Duck Bay, it would be easy for us to return to them and retrieve samples throughout the summer. So here are some of the most common taxa we saw in both plankton toe and periphyton samples from Spirit Lake. These taxa represent several algal groups, including diatoms, chrysophytes, green algae, and cyanobacteria. And these particular taxa were found in different proportions in plankton toe samples and periphyton samples. For example, nostoc, which is the primary type of cyanobacteria we found, was much more abundant in the periphyton because it has to grow attached to a substrate. From our two years of sampling at Spirit Lake, we noticed that taxa diversity in plankton toe samples was highly variable from year to year, as can be seen in the bottom two graphs. The top graph shows taxa richness on the log mat for 2018 and 2019, which was also highly variable from year to year. Unfortunately, since we only have two years of data, we can't draw any conclusive patterns about diversity or richness, though. However, we did notice that log mat periphyton samples displayed much more taxa diversity and richness than plankton toe samples. Cyanobacteria made up an average of about 30% relative abundance in periphyton samples and were even present in plankton toe samples, although to a much lesser extent, which is represented by the tiny 2% red wedge of the July 2019 pie chart. The presence of cyanobacteria is actually unusual for an alpine oligotrophic lake, which is further evidence that the log map provides unique ecosystem niches. And here are the sediment results from Spirit Lake. So the graph on the left shows the concentrations of carbon and nitrogen from dredge sampling at various locations around Spirit Lake. Although there's low organic content in the sediments overall, the highest concentrations of both carbon and nitrogen are found in the west arm, along the east shore, and in the case of nitrogen, in Duck Bay. 
Looking at the graph on the right, we can see that throughout the summer and into the fall, the logma is most frequently found in the east and west arms of the lake. So since the highest concentrations of carbon and nitrogen were found in those areas, it's likely that the logma is a major contributor to those nutrient inputs. All right, so now moving on to Coldwater Lake. Again, our decision to sample at Coldwater as a comparison to Spirit Lake really stemmed from the limited access to Spirit Lake this year due to COVID. But fortunately, we can use Coldwater Lake as a kind of natural control model to see how the presence of the logma impacts Spirit Lake. So to do that, we use the same plankton toe surface sediment and macrophyte sampling techniques that we used previously. But to get paraphyton samples from cold water, we scraped the paraphyton off of partially submerged rocks that we collected from the shoreline. And here are the most common algae taxa we found in cold water lake. Like Spirit Lake, the most common taxa all come from different algal groups, but the last three on the list differ between the lakes. However, all the algae taxa that we found in cold water were also found in Spirit Lake, so there weren't actually any taxa unique to cold water. Interestingly, as the pie charts at the bottom show, the plankton toes exhibited greater taxa diversity than the paraphyton samples, which is the exact opposite of what we saw in Spirit Lake. Our cold water lake samples also support the idea that Spirit Lake's log map provides unique habitat niches, as we found no cyanobacteria in either the plankton toes or paraphyton samples. Again, though, our sampling was extremely limited. We only sampled a small area of the lake and only got two days worth of samples, so the comparison between the lakes is imperfect. When comparing the two lakes to each other, we found that plankton toe samples are similar in terms of taxa richness and diversity. However, Spirit Lake paraphyton samples displayed greater diversity of taxa and algal groups than cold water lake samples, as shown in the graphs on the left. This could be because the log mat is a more ideal substrate that provides more habitat niches than the partially submerged shoreline rocks that we sampled from in Coldwater Lake. And again, cyanophyta were only present in Spirit Lake. So moving on to the sediment samples, the graph on the left shows the carbon to nitrogen ratio of the items we sampled from both lakes. It demonstrates that percent carbon and percent nitrogen of primary producers are pretty comparable between the lakes as shown by the circled groupings. It also notably shows that both lakes have low organic content in the sediments, which is to be expected in alpine oligotrophic lakes. The graph on the right shows the range of percent carbon values found in each lake. As you can see, there's a larger range of percent carbon values in Spirit Lake, notably on the higher end of the range. This indicates that the log mat contributes to the higher nutrient levels in the lake. Overall, the sediment records show that the log mat does create spatial heterogeneity in the lake ecosystem. All right, so to wrap everything up, here are the key takeaways from the past three summers of research. Firstly, the taxa present in plankton toes from both lakes are pretty similar in richness and diversity. Spirit Lake has a slightly greater overall number of taxa present, but that's likely due to more comprehensive sampling from Spirit Lake. Next, taxa diversity in benthic paraffin differs greatly between the lakes, with the Spirit Lake log mat hosting a greater number of taxa and algal groups than the Coldwater Lake shore rock paraffin. Most notable is the presence of cyanobacteria in Spirit Lake, but not in Coldwater Lake. And finally, the floating log mat on Spirit Lake contributes to the heterogeneity of the lake's ecosystem by depositing organic matter from shedding paraffin and log debris in the areas the log mat occupies most frequently. All right, so here are the references that I use for this presentation. Thank you all so much for listening, and I'll be available on Zoom now to answer any questions you might have. Great. Thank you so much, Angelica. And again, another reminder that we will be doing our Q&A at the end of the session. So please send your questions to info at walpa.org. Next up, we have another pre-recorded session with a speaker, Sarah Norber, who will also be available afterwards for questions. So let's get started with that one. Wapato Lake, located in South Tacoma, is a small urban lake 
that has been plagued with ongoing water quality problems since the late 1900s. The primary factor contributing to poor water quality, toxic algal blooms, and repeated closures of the lake from recreational use is the input of excessive nutrients, primarily phosphorus. This harmful nutrient derived from urban sources, such as lawn fertilizers and pet waste, enter the lake in stormwater runoff. Efforts have been made over the past 50 years to improve water quality in Wapato. Removal of aquatic plants, dredging, alum treatments, and even the introduction of drinking water have been mostly ineffective or temporary in preventing toxic algal blooms. In an attempt to limit intrusion of harmful nutrients from urban sources, a diversion dam was installed, creating two separate basins, north and south. The north basin acts as part of Tacoma's stormwater detention and conveyance system. An estimated 390 million gallons of primarily stormwater runoff from a large urban area enters the north basin each year carrying with it approximately 150 kilograms of phosphorus. Around 50% of the phosphorus entering the North Basin exits through a bypass drain, where it then enters the city's stormwater system. That phosphorus-laden water then flows directly to Puget Sound. Hi, my name is Sarah, and I'm an environmental specialist for the city of Tacoma in our stormwater group. Whether it's through stormwater sampling or public education and outreach, my job is to help prevent stormwater pollution. The influx of harmful nutrients into our stormwater runoff is an issue of growing concern. Changing human behavior to prevent the introduction of harmful nutrients into stormwater runoff is the ultimate solution. However, actions need to be taken now to protect affected water bodies like Wapato Lake, as well as other lakes, streams, and Puget Sound. Managed attached algae production has been used for over 50 years as an effective and low-cost means for filtering water. Algae turf scrubbers are very popular in the reef aquarium community as an effective biofilter, which is how I learned about them. One of my hobbies outside of work is building and maintaining reef aquariums. The concept behind an algae turf scrubber is simple. Water is pumped across a mat or screen at a controlled rate. With proper flow rate, exposure to light, and nutrients in the water column, algae growth is promoted. As the algae grows, it removes excess nutrients from the water and incorporates it into its tissues. Once the mat or screen has reached loading capacity, the algae is harvested and the excess nutrients are permanently removed from the water. I started to wonder if an algae turf scrubber could be built that could remove excess nutrients out of an infected lake like Wapato. After searching through the literature, I found many cases of large-scale algal production being used to filter effluent from everything from wastewater treatment plants, dairy farms, and overland runoff. I approached the University of Washington, Tacoma with my idea, and much to my surprise, they said, let's give it a try. The objectives for our project were to design and build a small-scale floating algae turf scrubber for deployment in Wapato Lake, establish algae or native periphyton growth, and determine the uptake rate of total phosphorus through periphyton growth. Our initial design for the scrubber included a three by five foot frame with three separate mat surfaces, all positioned at approximately two degree angle. We mounted the frame on a dock float and attached a six inch drainage pipe intended for sample collection and flow monitoring. Each mat section had its own 500 gallon per hour pump and spray bar. The scrubber would be tethered to an anchored John boat in the North Basin. The John boat would hold the solar panels, batteries, and sampling equipment. We had hoped to deploy the scrubber during the peak growing season in July 2019. However, due to delayed funding, we were not able to deploy the scrubber until early October. Right away, we started having issues with power due to the shorter days, increased cloud cover and rain. The single 100 watt solar panel was just not enough to keep the pumps flowing 24 hours a day. Another issue we ran into was maintaining a consistent two degree slope on a floating structure with water flowing over it. 
The drain pipe we added at the base of the scrubber retained the water long enough to shift the weight of the entire platform. Conversely, any wind or additional water from rain would cause the entire platform to shift back and divert the water flow over the back of the platform as opposed to across the mat surface. Through a lot of trial and error, we were able to fix the balance issues. However, even with an additional 200 watts of solar, we could not keep up with the power demands of the three pumps. We removed one pump and the mat in the center, but flows were still intermittent, especially at night. We were successful in establishing some periphyton growth, but the colony was primarily made up of diatoms, and our average dry weight of collected material was less than two grams. We took this first deployment as a good in-field trial run and decided to try again the following summer when we could deploy earlier in June. For our next deployment, we removed the dividers from the scrubber to create one single mat surface that was approximately one meter square, fed by one 2,000 gallon per hour low amperage pump with an inline valve to adjust flow rate. We installed larger solar panels for a total of 400 watts and three 110 amp hour batteries. The outlet drain pipe was also removed, which allowed water to flow off of the scrubber more evenly without creating a large shift in weight across the platform. We maintained flow over the mat at approximately 1,200 gallons per hour, which was calculated based on the one meter square area of the mat surface. The scrubber was deployed in the lake on June 14, 2020, and allowed to work for 26 days so that native periphyton could seed the mat. Periphyton and lake water samples were collected three times between July and September at 14 to 28 day intervals. We used a battery powered shop vac to collect periphyton from the mat surface. Water samples were collected from the pump outlet and later analyzed for total phosphorus and heavy metal concentrations. Paraphyte samples were dried, weighed, and sent off for nutrient analysis. A sample of paraphyton was collected and preserved in Lugol's iodine solution for later species identification. Our average dry mass was 83.79 grams, with an average daily production of 4.55 grams. As expected, the phosphorus concentrations in the north basin of Wapato are high, with an average of 0 0.163 milligrams per liter. To put that in perspective, normal levels of phosphorus in lakes not experiencing an influx of excess nutrients range between 0 0.03 and 0 0.05 milligrams per liter. Dried paraphyton contained an average of 0.31% total phosphorus. Uptake efficiency of total phosphorus by paraphyton remained close to a one-to-one -one ratio and showed that as more phosphorus and water became available, the better paraphyton was at accumulating it. Based on the dry weight of the collected paraphyton, the average uptake of total phosphorus was 9.55 milligrams per day per meter squared. In addition to measuring total phosphorus uptake, we examined the ability of paraphyton growing on an algae turf scrubber to filter out heavy metals from the surrounding water. The results indicate that paraphyton was very effective in accumulating aluminum, arsenic, cadmium, chromium, copper, iron, nickel, and lead. The bioconcentration factor, or the ratio of heavy metals in the paraphyton compared to the concentration in the surrounding water, was very high for aluminum, chromium, and lead by a factor of over 100. The results from this study indicate that paraphyton grown on an algae turf scrubber is very effective at removing phosphorus from Wapato Lake. In addition, it's also effective at removing heavy metal contaminants. The values reported here are similar to those reported in the literature for other large-scale algae turf scrubbers. The recovered paraphyton biomass from the August 7th sample was notably lower than the other two. This may have been caused by a seasonal shift in paraphyton species, as the mat community switched from one dominant species to another. Despite this shift, the percent of total phosphorus incorporated into the paraphyton tissue over the course of the study 
steadily increased. It would appear that the paraphyton is accumulating phosphorus at or near saturation levels, which are estimated to be 0.35 to 0.42%. This is likely due to the optimal conditions of an algae turf scrubber, which promote greater water to cell contact. Finally, the ability of the algae turf scrubber to accumulate heavy metal contaminants was impressive. Most notable were the values for aluminum, chromium, and lead. Arsenic removal was also high with a bioconcentration factor of 23. This is notable in Tacoma because of the history around the Asarco smelter. The smelter was to blame Do you have a couple questions? Because we're about to start over. <laughs> we're going to go live in two seconds. Okie dokie. Hi, everyone. We are having some technical difficulties with our last presentation. So uh, our wonderful friends at UW are going to work on that while we get started with some Q&A. Uh, we're going to start with a question for Theo. Um, the question is, has there been or are there any plans to sequence Wernicia to identify if it has toxin producing genetic strains in this region? And you're muted. Right. Should be good. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, yes, I, did. I, I have a very nice sample from um, Robin Matthews up at um, Bellingham, Western Washington. And, um, and that was just submitted for sequencing uh, a couple of weeks ago. So it'll be a little while. But that's a Warren and Chinia sample from, um, I think, up there somewhere near Bellingham. So we'll see. We'll see what that looks like. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Theo. Um, our next question is for Sarah. If this technique were ramped up to use as a method for management, how could you dispose of the paraphyton with heavy metals? Good question and something we were asking um, ourselves. Um, that would be a whole nother experiment that I'd love to do is looking at the application of this byproduct in reusable resources. Um, I think ideally incorporating it into some sort of biofuel would be the most profitable. Um, but as far as like a slow release fertilizer, we would have to do some, some testing to see what could be done with that, especially after the metals data. <laughs> okay. Next, we will have a question for Angelica. Your slide suggests that the shoreline for Coldwater Lake is forested, but perhaps not at Spirit Lake. It seemed likely that this could also be a major difference between the two. Have you estimated the end fixation amount from cyanobacteria on the log mat? Uh, I talked a little bit in one of the slides that we did do some initial calculations from our 2018 data, but we found that the cyanobacteria weren't actually abundant enough to be that major missing piece that we were looking for that contributed all that nitrogen. So we still don't actually know uh, the main source of that nitrogen.
And I think I, I think I fudged that one up a little bit. I believe those were two different um, questions. I think one was about the shoreline, one was about the end. So I apologize for that if I uh, <laughs> negated anyone's inquiries there. I'm sorry. Um, okay, let's see. Next question for Sarah. Can you estimate what percent of the total volume of heavy metals and toxic algae that is present in the lake was removed by the summertime algae scrubber project? And what would be needed to remove a significant amount? Actually have not crunched that data yet. So we were primarily focusing on the total phosphorus. Uh, the heavy metals portion was uh, kind of a plus and added on towards the end of the project. But it, that's a very good question and something that would be interesting for us to look at. All right, and then kind of an add on to that, would this be feasible to scale up to remove phosphorus at the scale for Wapto or other highly eutrophic lakes? I believe so. Um, it would be a significant feature, uh, but I believe, especially in the case of Wapto, where you literally have two separate basins, the north and the south, you could almost use one as the filtration basin and then move that filtered water to help keep the south, south basin, you know, clean, more or less. Um, so, yeah, it's, I, I think that it's totally possible. And then there's finding the use for the collected material afterwards and how that can be best resourced uh, so that it's not just waste. All right, thank you, Sarah. And it looks like we are kind of at the end of our questions for the session. Um, uh oh, it looks like we're having some chatting difficulties, it says. And then we're still trying to get Christian online for his presentation. So maybe if we want to give like a two minute break for everyone, uh, hopefully we can get Christian up and in this room because I think we all want to hear his presentation. Um, so we'll be right back in maybe like 90 seconds. Um, and given the number of questions we have coming in from her, it sounds like everyone really wants to hear the end. So we're going to try and cue that back up for you guys. Five milligrams per liter. Dried paraffin contained an average of 0.31% total phosphorus. Uptake efficiency of total phosphorus by paraffin remained close to a one-to-one -one ratio and showed that as more phosphorus and water became available, the better paraffin was at accumulating it. Based on the dry weight of the collected paraffin, the average uptake of total phosphorus was 9.55 milligrams per day per meter squared. In addition to measuring total phosphorus uptake, we examined the ability of paraffin growing on an algae turf scrubber to filter out heavy metals from the surrounding water. The results indicate that paraffin was very effective in accumulating aluminum, arsenic, cadmium, chromium, copper, iron, nickel, and lead. The bioconcentration factor, or the ratio of heavy metals in the paraffin compared to the concentration in the surrounding water, was very high for aluminum, chromium, and lead by a factor of over 100. The results from this study indicate that paraffin grown on an algae turf scrubber is very effective at removing phosphorus from Wapato Lake. In addition, it's also effective at removing heavy metal contaminants. The values reported here are similar to those reported in the literature for other large-scale algae turf scrubbers. The recovered paraffin biomass from the August 7th sample was notably lower than the other two. This may have been caused by a seasonal shift in paraphyton species, as the MAP community switched from one dominant species to another. Despite this shift, the percent of total phosphorus incorporated into the paraphyton tissue over the course of the study steadily increased. It would appear that the paraphyton is accumulating phosphorus at or near saturation levels, 
which are estimated to be 0.35 to 0.42%. This is likely due to the optimal conditions of an algae turf scrubber, which promote greater water to cell contact. Finally, the ability of the algae turf scrubber to accumulate heavy metal contaminants was impressive. Most notable were the values for aluminum, chromium, and lead. Arsenic removal was also high with a bioconcentration factor of 23. This is notable in Tacoma because of the history around the Asarco smelter. The smelter was to blame for the contamination of area water bodies around South Puget Sound with high levels of arsenic, a problem that is yet to be resolved. In conclusion, this data suggests that the use of an algae turf scrubber to remove harmful nutrients as well as heavy metal contaminants from affected water bodies like Wapato is promising. The area needed to remove about half of the incoming phosphorus into the north basin of Wapato would be around 600 meters square. 600 square meters may sound like a large number, but in reality, it only makes up about 6% of the total area of the north basin. 6% to filter approximately 390 million gallons of incoming overland runoff. Despite the space requirements needed for an algae turf scrubber big enough to filter a large body of water, the benefits of producing a potentially profitable and eco-friendly byproduct must be taken into consideration. The popularity of using algae in biofuels is growing as our need for renewable fuel sources increase and the introduction of algae into products like slow-release fertilizers can actually help to reduce the introduction of harmful nutrients into our stormwater runoff. Hi everyone, it sounds like we're back. Uh, we're still trying to get Christian uh, in his presentation up. Um, I heard from a coworker via message that uh, Sarah was looped on saying the smelter was to blame. So maybe we can just blame all of these technical difficulties on the smelter. It works, right? Um, any word from the UW folks about whether or not we can get Christian up and running? I am here and ready to go. Oh, we hear Christian. Maybe we Okay, great. Impeccable timing. All right, sounds like we're good to go, <laughs> you guys. Yay, okay, fantastic. Go, Christian. All right, thank you so much, um, first of all, for your patience and a little bit of uh, technical delay there um, in getting this together, but I'm really glad um, to be here and be able to present on nanobubbles as a chemical-free uh, method for algae control. Um, so as a sort of brief outline of getting into this presentation, I want to sort of start off by introducing this probably unfamiliar concept of nanobubbles and how these are genuinely different from the bubbles that you and I uh, are traditionally familiar with, and then get into a little bit about uh, the impacts that we see that these have when injected into water bodies, a little bit into the science um, behind that and what Molier has been doing as a company to sort of develop this new field of water treatment, and then lastly, uh, get into a couple case studies talking about where we've installed nanobubble uh, generation or injection technology across the country and talk about the changes in water quality that we've seen how long it's taken how long it's taken to see a difference in impact and uh, the impact on the algae communities the impact on oxygenation within that water body so let's start off by talking about uh, nanobubbles themselves and how they're different uh, next slide please So, as I mentioned, uh, everybody here, I'm sure, is familiar with bubble in terms of that being just a sort of gas vehicle um, within a, within a liquid, or in, this, in our case, within water. And really, what it is, gas is less less buoyant, or sorry, more buoyant than, uh, or less dense than the liquid, and therefore the gas rises to the surface surface and uh, gets released to the atmosphere. That's what happens with most bubbles that you and I are familiar with. Um, sort of like a blowing through your air through a straw into water, the bubble rises from the bottom up into the uh, surface and bursts. Now, 
nanobubbles rather are significantly smaller, even than the small, even than the smallest bubbles that can be achieved with traditional aeration. And uh, they're about 10 to the third to 10 to the fourth times smaller. So that's a thousand to 10,000 times smaller in diameter than a uh, traditional micro bubble. And what that means is that they really have a significantly higher um, surface area than traditional bubbles. And that transfers into a very efficient transfer of mass or the tra transfer of that oxygen from within the bubble into the surrounding liquid. And what's really unique about these, and we can get into the next slide here, is that <clears throat> nanobubbles, uh, even though they're, they contain gas, their, their motion is actually driven by something called Brownian motion. And that is that dominates over buoyancy. So what happens is rather than rising to the surface and releasing, releasing that gas, to the atmosphere, uh, the bubble consistently stays in liquid, sort of vibrates in place essentially, and continuously transfers that contained gas into the surrounding liquid. And that's sort of where the comparison between nanobubbles and traditional bubbles stops. Um, because what's really unique about these and where they're really distinguished from simply just a gas injection technology is that the bubble itself has a surface charge. And this isn't really unique to, um, to nanobubbles or to bubbles themselves, um, as all bubbles have a surface charge. But as the bubble gets smaller and smaller, that surface charge gets sort of more concentrated. And when that bubble collapses, when that nanobubble collapses, in itself, that charge is released and that creates an oxidative in impact. And we'll get to the next slide to discuss how the, the uh, benefits from really efficient oxygen injection and nanobubble oxygenation provides value in water bodies. So what I have separated here is in the first two rows, uh, how nanobubbles provide value as um, through just sheer oxygen, uh, oxidation, excuse me, really through addressing um, persistent algae blooms and then really comparing them against uh, what we normally use for chemical algicides in water bodies. And that's because that oxidation effect, that oxidation impact by the nanobubble, when that bubble collapses, does have a direct impact on sort of the integrity of the algae cell and then um, can sort of compromise that ability for the algae cell to survive and thrive and reduce algae blooms. Now, as we know, when we're injecting oxygen into water bodies, we also provide various impacts to the overall health of the water body. And one of the things that's unique about nanobubble um, in oxygenation is that uh, we're able to inject oxygen into water in a, um, in a form that does not break stratification. So really what we're doing here uh, is we're able to inject oxygen directly into a thermocline, um, whether that's at the surface or at the hypolimbian, hypolimbian where, we're, where we're able to provide the most value to that water body. And when we're oxygenating that hypolimbian we certainly know that in certain in anoxic conditions, uh, oxygen can reduce the internal nutrient cycling, reduce um, metal concentrations, especially methyl mercury concentrations within water, also addresses the heart of odor complaints, we see. Um, and then oxygen is also essential to mitigating um, fish gills that are certainly a, a negative byproduct of algae blooms. And lastly, due to the unique way that nanobubbles um, provide oxygen and sort of act as that vehicle for oxygen delivery when it, within the water body and delivering oxygen to the sediment layer, you do see a bit of um, call like sediment or muck remediation. So really turning that sediment from a dark sort of odorous um, brown color to certainly in sandy regions to a sandier, brighter color. Next slide, please. And this is essentially just a visual representation uh, of what we just covered in the last slide. So in certainly the impacted water bodies that um, we're treating, they're often, uh, we often um, encounter fish kills, only that algae overgrowth, both in planktonic algae and then from suspended algae, uh, that in turn can release um, algae toxins, especially in harmful quantities during algae blooms. And then uh, in terms of oxygen delivery at the muck layer, uh, we we'll routinely see high internal nutrient cycling, especially with phosphorus, uh, and that anoxic condition does create conditions that, are, uh, that allow fish flies to thrive. So with, ne with nanobubble injection, nanobubble oxygenation, really able to see those water bodies change from um, that poor, very turbid water quality to increase water clarity um, and just increase an, in, um, create an environment that really does allow fish to thrive. And we'll go briefly through the next slide just as a visualization for how um, we are able to provide 
uh, oxygenation in a method that does not break thermocline. And that really is unique to that neutral buoyancy of the, water, of the bubbles. So rather than injecting bubbles at depth um, and uh, them rising to the surface and breaking thermoclines, really just vertically mixing that water body, um, in, uh, in comparison to that, nanobubbles do provide that, um, that neutral buoyancy and maintain that thermocline. And I'll very briefly go through the equipment that Moliere uh, manufacturers to provide this. We have on the next slide here sort of three different main units that we sell or we produce um, for the surface water and aquatic management space. On the left hand side we have the clear uh, model unit and this is meant to be located outdoors. This is primarily for nanobubble, nanobubble injection at surface conditions really to impact um, or mitigate uh, algae blooms, prevent um, you know persistent um, harmful algae and improve, improve water quality. And then in situations where oxygen is required or in larger installations, then we do have the NEO, which is in the middle, which has onboard oxygen generation. We can provide this in larger um, sort of configurations, such as in trailers, um, as shown on the right. So that's the quick background on sort of Moliere and, and nano bubbles. And we'll go into the next couple of slides <coughs> to talk about some of the research that we've done uh, we, Moliere has a very active relationship with many American or U.S. universities, um, where we work with um, we work with the researchers across uh, the U.S. to really understand the fundamentals of nanobubbles and explain why we're seeing the benefits um, and the unique benefits of uh, of improvements in this water body, improvement in overall water body health. That sort of goes beyond just the injection of oxygen or um, what you would normally see with even uh, certainly distinguished from traditional aeration. And I have here, just to sort of put some visuals to it, uh, as a recent installation that we did uh, in the San Francisco area. And this is in, this is actually in a brackish water installation, but you can very you know clearly see the difference between before and after. Um, this is about eight weeks after installation of the removal of the algae on the surface. But we want to go significantly dip deeper than this, of course, and um, on the next slide, we provide a, a brief review of how we impact both algae directly on animals of providing that impact on algae directly, and then also on the conditions that allow algae to thrive. So across our installations, um, so far we have observed um, treatment across various species of um, planktonic and filamentous algae, certainly uh, on the blue-green algae, microcystis, cylindrospermopsis, and this is often um, sort of represented in an increase in water clarity. And certainly, the, um, every, everything treatment from these blue-green soup that you can occasionally see, which is associated with that um, really severe blue-green algae blooms. And then certainly the remo removal of the uh, surface, surface algae mats as well. But how is this happening, right? Um, that's sort of the, the ultimate question here. And so that bubble itself, when it is injected into a water body, we find that it has two main impacts on this, on the sort of integrity of the algae cell and the ability of that algae cell to thrive. One of which is uh, that bubble does have a, a surface charge to it, and so it is uh, attached to um, other charged or pol polar particles within the water. And in a way, we do see that this is, some of the earlier work has suggested that this may um, impact an algae cell's ability to um, regulate or self-regulate some buoyancy. And then what we believe or we understand currently is the driving impact of that immediate impact on algae cells we see is the, um, the chemical free oxidation provided by nanobubbles. So that really is on the collapse of that nanobubble. Um, when it does release, uh, we have to say reactive oxygen species, and that is going to provide um, sort of compromise that integrity of the algae cell. And then we know with the introduction of oxygen into a water body, we are impacting sort of the root the root or the heart, impacting the um, the overall water body health. And we're doing this by in, you know, introducing oxygen, which will certainly reduce uh, nutrient and phosphorus or nitrogen and phosphorus cycling, and then enabling that water body to sort of promote the growth of healthy microorganisms, beneficial bacteria. And one last thing to note here, some of the uh, early work that we've done also suggests that the oxidation from the nanobubbles does provide not only an impact on the algae cell itself, um, but also on algae toxins. So that, that oxidation from that reactive oxygen species is sort of an indiscriminate oxi oxidant, meaning that it will impact um, 
not only oxygen cell, but also algae toxins themselves. Um, I want to, just for the sake of time here, to breeze, can we go to slide um, 11, please? Thank you. So I wanted to get into some of our uh, university research, but I think the most important one to address here uh, is some of the work with Arizona State that we've done where they've really dived, dived into the oxidation provided by or produced by the nanobubble. And we did this work in conjunction with Paul Westerhoff um, of uh, nanotechnology or uh, nanotechnology engineering and water treatment department. And he really dived down into the creation of that reactive oxygen species on the collapse of the nanobubble. What we find is that this occurs primarily in the um, in the uh, environment where we have sort of some sort of external stimulus, such as aeration or mixing, something that's going to cause the collapse of that bubble and release that oxidation. And in that case, um, that's really where we see the most significant impact on algae cells. And I wanted to highlight this because that is where it's most differentiated between just traditional oxygen injection. Again, for the sake of time, let's go down to uh, slide 14, please. And uh, a bit heavy, I guess, in the beginning here on um, sort of the background of nanobubbles, what they are and the properties that they provide. I want to talk mostly about an installation that we've done recently in the uh, San Francisco and the Bay Area, where we installed uh, three of our nanobubble generators. This was in uh, two trailers that were provided or supplied, um, where we installed nanobubbles on about a 10 acre, 120 acre foot water body they're really looking for that combined effect of oxygen injection. They do not want to see thermal um, or break in thermal, thermal stratification. And then also they want to see a reduction in, in algae um, populations in their lake. This is a public um, recreational res reservoir and the persistent historical harmful algal blooms did cause routine closures of this water body. This is where they really sought a unique chemical free solution to not only deep water oxygenation, but a removal of the algae in their water body. And uh, we you know, have rather extensive uh, historic information or data on this water and certainly have documented blooms of microcystis, Dolichus firmum, uh, Lingbia, Phenazomenon, uh, and other um, certainly uh, toxin releasing algae. So we'll go on to the next um, slide here. And what we did with this installation we had two nanobubble generators or two trailers, as I mentioned, they were installed on um, the east side of the lake. Now this, uh, the north side is to the left here, and they are labeled as 1X and 2X. And then here we pumped in 450 gallons a minute of a nanobubble solution that's produced with pure oxygen. Uh, and this was injected at depth. And we monitored water quality here with two different sons. Um, we used in situ um, sons, which the company um, donated those to this project, it was very generous of them. And that was to measure um, water quality, not only at surface, but also at depth in real time. And we looked at parameters such as dissolved oxygen, ORP, um, uh, phyco, yeah, phycocyanin levels um, and temperature and several others. And that was really to look at the improvement of oxygenation and um, the maintenance, maintain, maintenance of stratification in the lake throughout the um, installation. Next slide, please. And uh, what we saw was was uh, quite compelling. So we installed the nanobubble generators. They were officially turned on about August um, 16th, so 816. And we had um, recorded um, pretty extensive uh, real-time monitoring. This is from the sensor at depth. Pretty extensive real-time monitoring of the dissolved oxygen conditions um, prior to our installation. And this was not only coupled with the real-time monitoring that we had done, but also years of historic data that had showed anoxic conditions at depth. Um, about a meter off the sediment layer. And about two weeks after um, the installation of the nanobubble generators, we were see, we did see, or we did see me begin to see a response in oxygen um, increasing at depth. And really the metric for us was uh, to get, to get the water body above about two ppm. Um, we know that at that level, that's really where it's, you know, we, the literature suggests you'll provide a stable um, sort of baseline of oxygen for uh, for the water body. And so within about two weeks of injection, two weeks with the beginning of injection, we did see um, the 
uh, the oxygen depth increased from about zero all the way up to about three and a half. And uh, I have not uh, updated this with the very most recent data, but we did see that continue to climb up to about a baseline of between four and five, fairly consistently, um, the water. And this was coupled on the next slide with a very dramatic um, swing in ORP. So the ORP in this water body, again, along with that, it was on a, those an anoxic conditions. I mean, along with those anoxic conditions, um, the water was also measured at about negative 400 millivolts of ORP. And this is really just indicative of poor water, water, uh, water body health and overall water quality. So this is, these are gonna be conditions where phosphorus is very easily um, released from the sediment and um, you're gonna have anoxic or uh, anoxic uh, anaerobic, excuse me, microbial activity. And corresponding with that shift in dissolved oxygen, we did see a shift in ORP of about 750 points up to a positive 370, which are conditions where you will see that sequestration of phosphorus um, and certainly a, a shift to nitrification or uh, nitrifying microbial activity. Um, I do have another case study in here, but for the sake of time, I think that I may want to go to slide 21 and just quickly wrap up on the application summary. Uh, discussing, you know, again, we've used uh, nanobubbles, certainly have many installations of nanobubbles for simple algae control installations of filamentous, the control of filamentous and planktonic algae. Um, but a way that it's certainly an area that we're getting into is um, more hypolimnetic oxygenation as a demonstrated approach to not only control algae, but also, also address the root cause of overall poor water body health. And just to highlight a couple other sort of points in here is with the reduction of algae, um, often that comes in uh, combination with the reduction in taste and odor, odor compounds, um, which can be very relevant for surface drinking water reservoirs. Um, and uh, we have, yeah, certainly seen installations of, uh, or we do have installations on fish, niche fly control and sediment decomposition. So I um, apologize for the technical issues at the very beginning of the presentation. This were a, a bit unforeseen, but I do really appreciate time today and certainly appreciate and look forward to any questions. Thank you so much. Yay, thank you so much, Christian. I'm so <laughs> glad that we got to hear your presentation. Uh, and thank you to all of our presenters. You guys did great, uh, you know, I suppose, with this uh, brave new world of online conferencing, there's going to be some bumps that we have to navigate, but I think you all did a great job. So thank you. Uh, I think we do have a couple minutes. So maybe Christian, we can squeeze one question for you, uh, which is, have you seen any impacts to fish from the nanobubbles, such as total dissolved gas, supersaturation impacts? Um, that is an excellent question. And certainly a question we get often from our fishery customers. Uh, with nanobubbles, especially in, in fishery applications, we would probably tend to use um, either what we call an enriched nanobubble, it's something uh, nanobubble generated with 40% oxygen or a high purity nanobubble. And with those higher oxygen content um, bubbles, fish are very easily able to um, process the, the oxygen in those bubbles and prevent things like um, any gill disease from bubble attachment. It's not an issue. We have no no reported cases of fish kills or any impacts, negative impacts on fish health. Great. Thanks so much, everyone. Uh, we're going to jump to our break. So we have a 10 minute break before our next session, which is our lake ecology session that starts at 230. So we will see you then. Thanks, everybody.
All right, everyone, welcome back. It's 2.30 and we are going to get started with our lake ecology session for this afternoon. This is our last session of the afternoon. Uh, once again, we're gonna be doing our Q&A at the end of the session. So please send your questions to info at walpa.org and Darren will field them for us um, as we reach the end of our session today, which is scheduled for 3.50. Uh, to start today's session on lake ecology, we have Becca Styling. She's going to be talking to us about some rainbow trout populations in the high, eleva high elevation lakes. So thanks, Rebecca. Hi, I'm Becca Styling, and I'm excited to share with you some results from my master's research exploring sources of carbon to lake ecosystems. My talk is titled Determinants of Resource Use by Rainbow Trout in High Elevation Lake.
our complex systems are in our minds and on our maps. We also know and have evidence that ecosystems around the world have our complex systems where energy and nutrients are constantly moving across these delineated boundaries. These movements of nutrients and energy and the links that form between habitats can support secondary production. Primarily stems from three distinct habitats. In the open water habitat, we have pelagic primary production. The submerged illuminated edge habitat is the littoral zone. And here we have littoral benthic primary production, attached algae essentially growing in a thin layer on the bottom, which is grazed by primary consumers. Littoral benthic algae can be a significant contributor to the overall amount of carbon supporting upper trophic levels in lakes. And last, terrestrial primary production can be a contributor to the energetic base of lakes too. And in this case, carbon fixed by terrestrial plants is exported from the surrounding watershed to the lake as dissolved or particulate organic matter or in the form of organisms that wind up as prey to an aquatic predator. Research demonstrates that aquatic consumers reliance on basal resources from these three habitats fluctuates widely. Rachel, we're going to reload the video and start again. If you could just uh, give us one. All right, everyone. Uh, we are, you know, going through it together. <laughs> We're going to try reloading Becca's presentation. So what we're going to do is move forward to our next presentation. Uh, just so you all know, all of these presentations for this particular session are pre-recorded, but our speakers are all present for our Q&A at the end. So we're going to start up Angela Strucker's presentation now, and we're going to try and work on Becca's presentation to get reloaded for you all to listen to later. Hi everyone, my name is Angela Strucker and I'm here to talk to you about primary succession and community assembly in ponds created by the historic eruption of Mount St. Helens. And before I get started, I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors on this work, uh, Meredith Holgerson, Tara Lee Pritzfeli, and Jim Gowell. So the eruption of Mount St. Helens was a massive landscape change. Um, so this uh, occurred in 1980, and most people in Washington and surrounding states will be really familiar with, with this event, um, maybe having visited there themselves. It's an amazing place to visit if you've never been. And um, many, you know, there were many different forces, destructive forces that occurred uh, relating to the blast, including um, the blown down forest and the light green and the scorched forest and the dark green and the pyroclastic flows, um, as well as lands, landslides, mud flows, and debris avalanches. And this last one, the debris avalanche in uh, yellow, is what we're most interested for the purposes of this talk, because it's in this um, region that uh, more than 100 ponds were created following the eruption. So this is a USGS picture showing, um, looking roughly uh, northwards um, from the the kind of western side of the Mount St. Helens um, in that yellow zone that I was kind of pointing out on the map in the previous slide. Um, so the debris came and went kind of this direction um, to the west and um, this was Coldwater Creek and um, is now Coldwater Lake. So the debris blocked that. Um, and you can see from the kind of topographic complexity in this uh, lower part of the photo that these um, depressions in the land are getting filled with, with water, either by um, groundwater or surface water. Um, and this is showing, uh, this is from four years after the eruption. So you see this, this was a, a process that didn't, you know, happen kind of um, instantaneously, but, you know, developed uh, over time. Today, these ponds look a lot different. Um, and so um, this is an example of uh, kind of a steeply sided, a more kind of 
um, hummocks pond. And um, we see that there's a lot of, you know, there's a great difference in the um, terrestrial environment. Um, there, there was very little organic material in the debris avalanche. And so um, since that time, there's been great um, change. Um, and these ponds vary quite dramatically in terms of their, um, their depth and their size and their shape, as well as the degree to which they have uh, canopy cover. So this is an example of a really open pond. And then we can contrast that with some ponds that look like this that have almost an entirely um, covered canopy and a great deal of both terrestrial and aquatic vegetation. So the kind of overarching question that we're um, asking here is, you know, how does primary succession succeed in aquatic environments? And, you know, this is a question that's been studied in, in terrestrial systems, you know, for, um, you know, decades, if not centuries, but there's very few good examples in, in aquatic environments. And so the question that we're kind of um, trying to answer is, you know, does it proceed in the same way that terrestrial succession does? And can we study um, community assembly and un try to understand the factors that um, influence it through time? And this um, Mount St. Helens system is perfect for this question because it's essentially um, a natural experiment with a lot of replication because all the ponds were created at roughly the same time. Um, and there's a large number, so over 100 of them, that, as we said, vary you know, quite dramatically in terms of... Um, a number of different features. So it gives us kind of a nice palette to work with. In the broader context, we can try to understand which species end up where by thinking about the regional species pool. So what species are in the region? Um, and the first kind of uh, filter is this dispersal and chance um, events that occur. We call this a stochastic filter. And this kind of sorts um, and works to influence, um, you know, which species kind of move around. The next set of filters are more deterministic. So the, these are things like the environment and biotic interactions that happen in communities. And ultimately, we have these local communities that look um, are a subset of the regional species pool and may look more or less similar to each other, depending on how species kind of interact with these different um, these different filters. So our question was whether or not the assembly of invertebrate communities in these Mount St. Helen ponds was influenced more by deterministic or stochastic factors and whether or not we can still kind of see legacy effects of, um, you know, this and um, the fact that these are still pretty new communities. Okay, so um, I showed a map um, before um, that was shortly after the eruption, and this is a more recent one, and we see that there are quite dramatic changes have occurred in the landscape. Here's the, um, the cone of Mount St. Helens. Here's Coldwater Lake. And so we're interested in this region that was part of the debris avalanche zone, so south of Coldwater Lake. And if we look, um, here's the outflow. Um, you can kind of see where it goes under um, the highway and then it goes down to the North Fork of the Toodle River. And so we have kind of two main um, complexes, we call them, of ponds um, that are have some differences that may influence how succession proceeds. And so we have the upper set, um, the Marauda ponds, um, and then the lower set, the Hummocks ponds. And if anyone's ever been to this um, part of the state before, there's a, actually a really nice hiking trail that you can go around to, um, a lot, and you can see a large number of these ponds. It's really, it's quite, um, it's quite amazing. And you tend to see a lot of school kids there, so it's very fun. Um, so um, these ponds also, in terms of, um, they differ in terms of, you know, their... Um, uh, environmental conditions, so differences in terrestrial vegetation, which I'll talk about a little bit more in the following slide. But they also um, differ in terms of their spatial arrangement. And so the ponds in the Murata tend to be denser and closer together on average than the ponds in the hummocks. And you can kind of see that the ponds here are quite a bit more spaced out and, and, and farther from each other than the ponds in the Murata complex. This is a, um, an aerial from uh, 19, um, 1995 in Google Earth, and it kind of shows that even, you know, 15 years past the blast, still the terrestrial um, succession was still ongoing, and there was still 
uh, lots of places that were relatively barren, um, but still you see some, you're starting to see some pockets of um, what will be green in the following photo. In um, 2004, we see that the Murata has really filled in in terms of terrestrial vegetation, um, almost complete coverage. And we see that in the hummocks region, um, there's more, but still quite a bit of um, more bare ground. And that that has kind of proceeded up until 2014, the most recent photo where um, we see, again, lots of terrestrial vegetation up in the Murata and then filling in. And we also see that the, some of the ponds are starting to get kind of encroached upon um, by the terrestrial um, wetland vegetation. Okay, so um, I kind of mentioned some of these broad in, um, gradients in terms of sizes and shape, but there's also differences in terms of um, canopy cover. And so this map is showing, you know, anywhere from essentially, you know, one to 99% canopy cover um, within the Murata complex up here and then the Hummocks complex down here. Big differences in terms of pond area um, here on, a, a, on this meter squared but also in terms of chemistry, big differences in terms of um, conductivity, uh, hydro period ranging anywhere from, um, you know, essentially only holding water for a couple months in spring to ones that are perennially wet, uh, as well as um, differences in the terrestrial matrix and aquatic productivity. So in 2015 and 2017, we went out in the spring and sampled ponds um, for physical and chemical parameters. So kind of your basic suite of um, variables that you'd want to know. Uh, we also sampled for chlorophyll, zooplankton, and macroinvertebrates, um, and some landscape variables as well. And this is kind of, you know, it's interesting because these ponds, some of them are so short-lived that you really have a short window of time to get out there and sample. And so sometimes it was, um, we just weren't able to get to some ponds in time. Okay, so the first results I want to show are looking at environmental structure across the two regions of ponds. And this is a principal components analysis that um, shows, you know, similarities in, um, in the uh, ordination space uh, and, and um, how that relates to the actual ponds themselves. And so ones that are closer together would be more similar. And so we see that there's, um, you know, a lot of correlation between um, the aquatic productivity um, in terms of chlorophyll, nutrients, carbon, um, and that's also highly correlated with pond canopy cover. So that makes a lot of sense that the high nutrient ponds are more productive and probably that's linked to terrestrial um, productivity as well. And then on the other side, we see ponds that tend to be um, larger, deeper, and have a longer hydro period. And those tend to be less, um, less productive, but also have warmer temperatures in them. And so when we overlay the sites on here, I'm not going to show the individual sites, but just kind of drawing a circle around where they are. Most of them are kind of on the right side of this, um, the warmer, larger, deeper, longer hydro period. Um, and then the Murata ponds are more on the left-hand side of this that tend to be more productive, more canopy cover, um, but smaller um, and, and less sh and shallower. Looking in terms of species richness or taxon richness, uh, first showing zooplankton, uh, we don't really see any differences um, between regions or differences over time. So 2015 and 2017 results were pretty similar. And pretty um, depauperate, um, so that's not really a really large number of, of taxon to find in a, um, in a pond. And looking now at, at macroinvertebrates on the bottom here, we see, again, um, no significant differences between the two regions, um, nor are there really big differences over time. And so, um, again, also very, um, a very small number of taxa present um, in these ponds on average. The last analysis I want to present um, is uh, looking at beta diversity, which is essentially what is the similarity between the composition of all, you know, any pairwise combination of ponds. And to do this properly, we have to control for differences in alpha diversity, because as alpha diversity increases towards its uh, maximum of the regional pool size, um, beta diversity has to get uh, smaller and smaller because, you know, there all the species are present. Um, and the reverse of this is that when alpha diversity is low, beta diversity is, is, has to be high because there's um, so much more turnover between ponds. Okay, so what this means is that we can use this construct to kind of understand stochastic and deterministic factors. 
And so um, we can think about this in terms of, you know, where um, all pairwise combinations of pawns fall in this space. And so if you fall kind of below the line, your composition is more similar than you would expect by chance. If you fall above the line, you're less similar than expected by chance. And then I think kind of along the line is the, the you know, essentially the null expectation. So then we can ascribe some um, mechanistic explanations to these. So um, for the less similar, we can predict that um, strong biotic interactions are occurring. Dispersal is probably very low um, because you're getting, you know, um, communities that are not very similar to each other with uh, variation in environmental conditions driving differences in communities. In this lower, um, more similar component, we think that environmental filtering is strong. And so the environment is selecting for just a subset of species that can tolerate conditions. And therefore they're really, the communities are very similar to each other. And then if we get something kind of along this line, we predict that dispersal is high and random events are having a big effect on community composition. Okay, so what this translates into is um, beta scaled between positive one and negative one. And so a value of one would be completely dissimilar, a value of negative one completely similar, and then around zero would be kind of a, our stochastic effect. Okay, so looking at the results for um, beta diversity, first for zooplankton, with uh, in the bottom here a reminder about what a positive or negative value uh, means. And I'm kind of giving away the plot a little bit here um, because you see these are all negatively scaled values. Um, but what we see in 2015 is that um, the hummix ponds tend to be pretty negative, um, meaning that the communities were much more similar than we would expect by chance. The Murata was um, a little bit um, kind of intermediate, maybe a little bit closer to zero. But interestingly, when we sampled in 2017, we saw the opposite trend. We saw that the hummix ponds were a lot more stochastic and um, closer to zero compared to the Murata. So that's a good lesson to just stick to one year sampling if you can. <laughs> um, when we look at macroinvertebrates, I'm just kidding. And um, when we look at macroinvertebrates, um, we see that the um, trends were kind of more similar in the sense that the hummix was always kind of more negative than the Murata. Um, but again, differences between years. And we see that, um, you know, values a lot closer to zero for um, macroinvertebrates in the Murata, which probably reflects the fact that the ponds are really close together and, and macroinvertebrates are a lot more mobile and can get around and disperse more um, and across the pond landscape. Okay, so to quickly sum up, um, assembly seems to have been shaped by different mechanisms in different regions in different years. And so that's not necessarily very satisfying, but it does tell us that there's, you know, this is a really dynamic process and it's, it, it's going to be influenced by a number of different factors over time. Um, despite the fact that we had pretty strong environmental gradients, uh, we found that communities were really similar. And so what to me this says is that um, there's, you know, we're getting generalist species that can survive almost anywhere. And so um, the environment isn't really having kind of a more nuanced effect. It's just like a big filter that, you know, only lets in super to tolerant organisms. We also, the interannual variation in patterns is interesting. And we think, you know, potentially that has to do, we could use traits to try to understand that a little bit better. And um, for example, um, we look at zooplankton and we can kind of categorize taxa into good and poor dispersers. We see that, you know, this is, um, it differs from year to year and it differs from, um, you know, region to region. And so traits may be a helpful way to kind of understand, you know, do we see um, the years with more stochastic, do we see more good dispersing species in ponds? And hydrology may also be an important factor. So um, this is kind of ongoing work with collaborators at the University of Regina. And um, here we're looking at isotopes of oxygen and hydrogen. And I'm not going to get deep into this, but suffice to say that it's really different between years. And so um, in 2015, we see this big spread. There's lots of potential water sources that are playing a role in their hydrology in that year and a lot of evaporation signaling that potentially it was a really warm year. 
Um, whereas in 2017, and the snowpack was much more influential in, in, in pond hydrology, likely suggesting a single water source was important. And so that, again, is, gonna, is bound to have effects on um, you know, the organisms that live there. Okay, so I'm going to wrap up by um, just kind of reiterating this is a really useful study system to understand, you know, our theories about community assembly and primary succession. Um, and, you know, we only saw kind of signals of some processes occurring, but that might change in the future. Um, it's, a, it's really dynamic. More generally, this is, a, you know, kind of an important way for us to understand how humans affect the landscape and how communities respond to those disturbances. So I'm gonna wrap up by thanking um, a number of different field and lab assistants that have worked uh, with us over time and I'll happily take any questions. Great, thanks so much, Angela. And Angela will be here to answer questions live at the end of our session. So again, please email them to info at walpa.org. Uh, up next in a twist of events, Becca is going to use her PowerPoint to give us her presentation live. Um, thank you so much, Becca. I'm super excited that we're getting this to work out and take it away. Great. So I can start on slide four um, to the crew. This will be a wild ride. My heart is beating really fast right now. <laughs> All right, should I start? Thumbs up? Okay. All right, so the backdrop of this project is that the carbon supporting upper, upper trophic levels in lakes is originating in three distinct habitats. We have uh, the standard pelagic primary production occurring, pulling carbon out of our CO2 out of the water and making it available to the rest of the food web littoral, which is attached algae, and terrestrial. And upper trophic levels um, can rely on varying amounts of carbon from different places. So here, starting with a pretty simple plot, um, looking at attached algae. And it's looking at the importance of littoral-derived carbon to fish communities. Um, and it's the mean values of littoral-derived carbon to 75 different communities uh, worldwide. And what I like uh, about this plot is it shows you high variability. So we have some lakes that do not rely at all on uh, littoral benthic carbon and others that are highly reliant on it. And my project is looking at some of, oh, and then in terrestrial ecosystems, you are in lakes, there are also some systems that rely heavily on terrestrial carbon and others not at all. Okay, next slide. Um, and one advance. So there are, what drives this variability? It could be, there are, is some evidence that differing amounts of littoral uh, availability, littoral carbon, derived carbon could be driving it. Uh, next, it, one more. Um, it could be differing amounts of terrestrial carbon inputting being more terrestrial carbon availability. And then one more. There is also evidence that uh, population density can influence how uh, fish populations use carbon. So for example, um, increased density can drive fish to utilize resources that they otherwise would not be. All right, next slide. So we observe variability in reliance on carbon sources. And what drives this variability? My question hones in on that and just says, does relative habitat availability and fish population abundance determine rainbow trout reliance on littoral benthic, terrestrial, and pelagic derived carbon in lakes? And specifically for my research, I'm looking at two categories of factors for relative habitat availability, littoral extent and terrestrial extent around the lake. Next slide. To address this question, my approach was to first quantify the proportional reliance on littoral benthic, pelagic, and terrestrial carbon by rainbow trout. And two, identify shifts in reliance associated with physical and biological factors and their interactions. 
Uh, next slide. And mountain lakes provide an ideal study system to address these questions. So we selected 16 lakes in Washington that shared climate, geology, ge geological fe features, and were in under de undeveloped catchments. They all had intact shorelines. And we also selected lakes that were naturally fishless, but had been stocked with rainbow trout, which gives a little bit of uh, lever on density and the food webs were similar and relatively simple. And these lakes are all primarily in the south, southwestern corner of the Alpine Lakes Wilderness in Washington State. And we included uh, three lakes outside of that wilderness. The lakes were all reasonably close to each other, no more than four kilometers to get to a lake from one of our backcountry base camps. And you can also see on this map that some of the lakes near our lakes we did not sample, and that was because they were stocked with uh, a species other than or in addition to rainbow trout. Uh, next slide. So first we established that we had gradients among the lakes related to the relative amount of littoral habitat, differences in terrestrial inputs, which we calculated as a total area into total volume and also uh, a range of population abundances, which we measured as CPUE, catch per unit effort. Um, we also, uh, we made bathymetric maps at each lake, um, and we also measured light attenuation, and the light attenuation measurement was to estimate each lake's littoral extent, which we calculated as the portion of lake bottom receiving 1% or more of surface light. We estimated terrestrial loading. Okay, I said that. I haven't practiced this for like a week. Okay. At each lake, along with the fish we captured, we also collected samples of primary producers from each source pool. So pelagic cestin from the open water habitat, littoral paraphyton from rocks in the littoral zone, and terrestrial vegetation. We completed stable isotope analysis on all samples from all lakes. Oh, next, you can advance one. There we go. So stable isotopes on all lakes. Uh, next slide. Um, so my first objective was to quantify proportional reliance on littoral benthic, pelagic, and terrestrial carbon by rainbow trout. And that was completed with stable isotope mixing models. Next slide. Oops. For those of you new to stable isotopes or mixing models, I want to quickly explain in differing habitats, there is natural variability in carbon and nitrogen stable isotopes that occurs during primary production. We can use knowledge of this natural variability to quantify portions of those sources that end up contributing to a whole. And this is a mixing model. I like to think of it as mixing paint. Isotope values for carbon are like the range of colors from blue to red. And each carbon source has a value that corresponds with the color. Pelagic may be blue, littoral red, and terrestrial purple. And if we have a fish with quote unquote purple body carbon, we don't know if that carbon is a mixture of blue and red, i.e. 50-50 pelagic and littoral, or if it was all purple, um, all originating in the terrestrial environment. But with a second stable isotope, you can hit one or forward. Like nitrogen, which in this metaphor ranges from black to white, if I assess the grayness alongside the purpleness, then there is only one combination of portion values that will give both the purple tone and the gray shade in question. And that is essentially what, a, what occurs in, a in stable isotope mixing models, except instead of using colors, we are using numbers. And there are also uh, ways to incorporate uncertainty. Um, next slide. So I, qu I first quantified the proportional reliance on terrestrial, pelagic, and littoral sources for each fish according to the source values of the lake that that fish was captured in, which means that for each fish, I had a composition of proportional reliance, three components that summed to a whole. The uh, portion of fish muscle tissue that contained carbon that was originally fixed in a terrestrial habitat, a littoral habitat, and a pelagic habitat. Uh, advanced one. The second step was to use the composition for each fish and complete a series of linear regressions to evaluate what predictor variables, so littoral extent, terrestrial loading, 
and population abundance best, best explains the changes to that entire composition. Uh, next slide. So uh, the results from the proportional reliance. So first proportional reliance among pelagic, littoral and terrestrially derived carbon was variable among and at times within the lakes. Overall, many fish had high portions or relatively high portions of pelagic derived resources. And a good portion of fish relied primarily on some combination of pelagic and littoral derived resources. And a few had some terrestrial lines in there as well. And so the question was, are there factors that sort of drive the variability that we observe? Next slide. Okay. And so my second step was to uh, look at a bunch of, was to take our full model and test iterations dropping predictor variables and the, their interactions and rank the models uh, for best fit. And so here I presented the top five models and you could advance one slide. And um, what is recorded here is the PLIS trace statistic, which demonstrates that most of the variability explained in the models for all five of them was the interaction term between population abundance and littoral extent. And um, next slide. Okay. It is challenging to interpret the coefficients for compositional regressions, especially with an interaction term. So here I'm using the best fit model to generate predictions of consumer resource use across a range of littoral extent and population abundance values. So when littoral extent is high, the orange points, resource use is predicted to be relatively similar among the fish, regardless of population abundance, the line thickness. It is balanced between littoral and pelagic dependence with low terrestrial lines. But when littoral extent is low, those green points, as population abundance increases, reliance on terrestrial resources is predicted to increase. And the panel I'm showing is a low terrestrial loading scenario. And um, you heard me right that it's a low terrestrial loading scenario and our model predicts increased population abundance led to increased reliance on terrestrial resources. And I will circle back to that. Um, next slide or one. Yeah. Um, okay. So looking at the predictors for when terrestrial loading is higher, the predicted reliance in these three resources, when habitat is hundred percent, littoral is similar regardless of population abundance, but as population abundance increases, reliance on pelagic resources is, uh, in predicted to increase. So one explanation for increased reliance on pelagic resources in the high terrestrial loading scenario, it is that it is possible that along with terrestrial inputs are nutrients that promote primary pelagic primary production. And in the low loading lakes, pri pelagic primary production potentially is nutrient limited. And so as uh, fish with increased population abundance need to look for other uh, prey options. They are using terrestrial play, spiders um, or whatever insects they can forage for. So my study did not get at mechanisms. So that is my speculation as to the mechanism uh, behind these results. Okay, next slide. So never, uh, so my study or our study demonstrates that interactions between littoral habitat availability and population abundance influence how rainbow trout utilize basal resource pathways. And we found that resource use was relatively consistent among littoral, pelagic and terrestrial resources, regardless of littoral habitat availability at low population abundance. However, as abundance increased, that led to presume, leading to presumed interspecific competition. It, in lakes with low littoral extent, habitat structure became more influential, shifting resource use towards terrestrial and pelagic resources. Um, so these results overall suggest the heightened importance of biotic factors, um, such as sort of fish community composition or abundance as a determinant of resource use when littoral habitat is more limited. 
Um, oh, next slide. Uh, so increased understanding of how populations, species, or communities respond to and interact with changes in the physical environment will aid in understanding how future environmental change leading to gains or losses in specific resource pools, potentially to a total extent, might impact an ecosystem. Um, and especially in lakes that are going to have uh, that littoral extent changed by uh, lake level fluctuation. Um, and then another thought was potentially that lake stocking levels can sometimes be determined by lake surface area. Um, and it could be beneficial to consider littoral availability and or uh, the overall habitat around it. Um, next slide. So this project had a lot of support along the way, and I especially want to express gratitude to WALPA. I was the recipient of the David Lamb Memorial Scholarship in 2018, which was incredibly helpful as I kicked off uh, my season of field work, um, and many wonderful supporters and volunteers along the way, and to you guys right now who are making this, winging it work. So thank you very much. Yay, Becca, that was fantastic. Thank you so much for being adaptable. That was wonderful. Uh, I really enjoyed the uh, use of colors to explain that isotope model. That was pretty cool. Um, and thanks to everyone for being so flexible with this. Going pretty good, I think. Um, up next, we have Elizabeth Hoots, and Elizabeth is going to talk to us about the life of a caddisfly in Coeur d'Alene Lake. Thanks, Elizabeth. Hi, my name is Beth Hoots, and I'm a senior at the University of Idaho studying ecology and conservation biology. This research was conducted as part of my senior thesis here, and it is titled Life History of a Benthic Caddisfly in Coeur d'Alene Lake. My co-authors on this project are Frank Wilhelm, my thesis advisor and professor at the University of Idaho, and Ben Schofield with the Coeur d'Alene Tribe Lake Management Department. My talk will take us through an introduction to my study organisms and study system, through my objectives and how we conducted this research. I'll share my results and how I analyze my data, and then share some early conclusions. But let's start with the basics. Climate change is a global phenomenon, and as such, it affects water bodies around the world. This figure from O'Reilly et al. shows the change in surface water temperature for several large lakes across the globe between the years 1985 and 2009. A red dot on this graph, or on this figure, represents a leak whose temperature increased during that time interval, whereas a blue dot indicates a lake that cooled during that time interval. And we can see that there are both red and blue dots on this figure, but the red dots greatly outnumber the cooling lakes. Especially, we can see that we had a lot of lakes warming in the Pacific Northwest and no lakes that were surveyed cooled. O'Reilly concluded that on average, lakes across the world are warming at a rate of 0.34 degrees Celsius per decade. In the Pacific Northwest, we are of course not immune to this climate change and we see climate change and this warming trend manifested so clearly in our droughts that we've been receiving. Marshall et al. studied the percent change in frequency of two-year drought periods across the West and found that they were increasing almost everywhere. In the Idaho Panhandle region where my study was conducted, this frequency of two-year drought periods has increased by up to 80%. And this can be attributed to a lack of snowfall, largely, as well as an earlier and faster melt in the spring. Now, while humans as endotherms have a little bit of flexibility to um, adjust to these new temperature changes, other organisms are ectothermic or poikilothermic, and their development rate is directly tied to the temperature, even if it's warming at a very quick rate. We can measure that rate um, between their development rate and the temperature of their surroundings, that relationship with the Van Hoff coefficient or a Q10 relationship. 
which measures the change to an organism's development rate as the temperature of its surroundings changes by 10 degrees Celsius. So for example, a common Q10 relationship is a Q10 of two graphed here. In a Q10 of two relationship, we would expect to see development rate double as temperature increases by 10 degrees Celsius. One such poikilotherm is my study organism, Nectocyhe albida. They are benthic case-building caddisflies found in Coeur d'Alene Lake, and they are pictured below in their adult form here. Nectocyche albida is of interest largely because they are a native predator of the invasive Eurasian water milfoil, which is pictured here, topping out the lake, fully grown and overgrown in 2015. Now, 2015 was a notable year for many reasons, but the macrophyte growth is really worth mentioning. As it stands, Nectocyche albida is not an effective biocontrol for Eurasian water milfoil, even though they do predate on the macrophyte. Essentially, by the time Nectocyche albida reaches a stage in its life under current conditions where they're able to consume a critical biomass of Eurasian water milfoil, the macrophyte's already established in the ecosystem, it's grown, it's past its overwintering and dying plants and really dominating the ecosystem again. However, if warming waters push Nectocyche albida to begin maturing earlier in the year and Eurasian water milfoil's growth is limited by number of daylight hours, it's possible that that shift could change their predator-prey relationship and make Nectocyte albida a more effective biocontrol organism. But let's talk about how Nectocyte albida does grow. They start as eggs, which hatch into larvae, and those larvae grow through five instar phases. Pictured here is a fifth instar, featuring that characteristic Nectocyche albida V on its head capsule. Once they grow through their fifth instar and complete their growth, they pupate for about three weeks by retreating into their case, sealing themselves off, and fixing to a macrophyte. A pupae emerge into winged adults, which live for about one to two days, during which time they mate, deposit eggs, and die. I studied Nectocyche albida to answer the following questions. First, how will the temperature of Coeur d'Alene Lake change under current climate change trends? And second, how is the pupation time of Nectocyche albida affected by those rising temperatures? These relate to my specific prediction, which is that Nectocyche albida responds to temperature changes in accordance with a Q10 of two relationship, similar to other insects. Many of you are likely familiar with my study site. It is Coeur d'Alene Lake, located in the northern Panhandle region of the state of Idaho. I was specifically working in the Chat Colette region in the south part of Coeur d'Alene Lake, pictured here. Now in Chat Colette Lake, the Coeur d'Alene Tribe Lake Management Department has been monitoring the temperature and collecting temperature data in 15 minute intervals since 2015. They accomplished this using Hobo data loggers, which they've deployed along the St. Joe River levee at about one meter depth. They fix these loggers to pilings with steel cable and leave them out there to autonomously collect data. Now, what I've done is take those 15 minute data points and condense them into monthly averages for every year they've been collecting data so far. Um, and this gives us a little bit of perspective to zoom out and see the interannual variability of these temperatures in the water. And what we see is more or less every year follows a pretty similar pattern of warmth through the seasons, with the notable exception of 2015, shown here in green. 2015 was a very warm year, so warm, in fact, that the tribe now considers it um, representative of what we may expect to see under climate change conditions toward the end of this century. Using these temperature data will help me answer my first question about how climate change trends will affect the temperature of Coeur d'Alene Lake. In the field, I collected caddisflies by wading in and by pulling up macrophytes into the boat and picking off the caddisflies that were feeding on them. I was looking for fourth and fifth instars about to pupate, 
and I would sort through the caddisflies that we pulled up uh, once they were in the boat to make sure that they were Nectosyche albida and not a similar caddisfly species found in the lake and to make sure they were in stars. Then I would take the caddisflies back to the lab for the observational experiment we were conducting there. I kept caddisflies at 22 and 35 degrees Celsius during their pupation process and monitored them daily to see if they'd begun or ended pupation. You can see here an about to pupate caddisfly on the left photo in the red circle and two caddisflies that have already pupated in the right photo. Once they did pupate and emerged as adults, of course, we had to keep them under a mesh tent to make sure that they didn't escape into the lab. They were all kept in lake water with a sandy substrate to mimic the Chapcolette benthos and some macrophytes to consume if they were hungry. And this study helped me establish a Q10 relationship for Nectopsyche albida, answering my question about how their pupation time was affected by rising temperatures into my results, I used temperature and climate predictions from the Abatsoglu and Brown climate toolbox. They have these projections for air temperature through the end of the century, but what I wanted was water temperature. So what I did was I regressed the temp water temperature data that the tribe has collected for the Chatcolet region with some temperature data collected at the Coeur weather station to come up with a relationship between air and water temperature for the area which I then applied to these temperature projections to get some water temperature projections for Chapcolette Lake through the end of the century. And to clarify here, when I say summer high warming or winter low warming, I mean the average summer or winter temperature under a high or low warming scenario. And what you'll notice right off the bat here is that these average temperatures are not 10 degrees higher than they were in 2015 out in 2099. However, they are not insignificant in their warming. In the summer, we're looking at a temperature increase of about 5.4 degrees Celsius under high warming scenarios. And in the winter, we're looking at about 4.5 degrees Celsius. How will that affect caddisflies? Let's look at their Q10 relationship first. My data showed an approximately Q10 of two relationship However, due to this global pandemic we're living in, I was not able to complete my temperature data and collect more than two data points, including a colder and more realistic to chat Collette Lake's water temperature trial at 12 degrees Celsius. However, I was able to complete trials at about 20 and 30 degrees Celsius, which has given us the following curve. Now, I don't expect you to take the word of these two data points, um, for Nectosyche albida having a Q10 of 2 relationship. So what I've done is conducted a literature review for the Q10 relationship of several um, poikilotherms living in aquatic environments across the literature. We've got fish, echinoderms, crustaceans, zooplankton, insects, etc. And what we see here is although their Q10 values range from 1 to 3.6, the average across taxa is about 2. And that allows me to confidently say that although I only have two data points reflecting a Q10 of 2 relationship for Nectosyche albida, they likely do not stray far from this trend. Therefore, using those data points, I conducted a log log regression to get a linear equation for the relationship between pupation length and water temperature. This relationship had a slope of 1.9, which is, again, very close to a Q10 of 2. This relationship could be applied to our temperature warm, warming data uh, to approximate the amount of days we would expect to see pupation time decrease under the warming predicted for the years between 2015 and 2099. And what we found was that we expect to see Nectosyche albida pupation occur between 9.2 and 12.3 days faster in 2099 compared to 2015. To summarize, Chattanooga Lake will warm between 2.2 and 5.6 degrees Celsius by 2099 in comparison 
with 2015 temperatures. My findings show that Nectopsyche albida grows with approximately a Q10 of 2 relationship with temperature. Therefore, caddis fly pupation in the wild in Chat Colette Lake will be up to 12.3 days shorter in 2099 than in 2015, which has some pretty significant implications for these organisms. Notably, their relationship with macrophytes. This has the potential to upend their predator prey relationship. And it could shift their hatch date, possibly making room for an additional generation per annual cycle over time. They overwinter as fourth or fifth instars, but with a couple of extra weeks, it's possible that they could be fully matured by then. To conclude, I'd like to bring us back to our 2015 temperature data. I've replicated that graph here and superimposed um, the climate toolbox predictions for summer and winter warming in the year 2099. And what we see here is that 2015, while an outlier now, will likely become the norm under a high warming scenario in the future. And while maybe this environment, this ecosystem can weather one 2015, when it becomes the norm, when that becomes the average summer temperature, we expect to see significant impacts on the temperature dependent organisms in this ecosystem. I'd also like to talk briefly about these light limited macrophytes and their growth related to caddisflies. While macrophytes grow in accordance with the number of daylight hours we see, Nectopsyche albida and other caddisflies grow faster when it's warmer, as we've seen. So while they may be hitting their peak growth after the macrophytes have hit their peak growth and really established themselves in the ecosystem, we could be looking at a shift to earlier where their peak growth occurs while the macrophytes are still establishing themselves in the ecosystem, potentially setting up Nectopsyche albida to be an effective biocontrol for Eurasian water milfoil in the future. To look at some future directions that I'd like to take this study in, I would like to look at specifically when macrophytes are growing in this ecosystem and look at a species breakdown of what occurs first and when. I'd also like to compare those species specific data with light data uh, collected by the tribe using Secchi disks um, for the past few years. I also plan to analyze some historic Coeur d'Alene weather data, which the weather station has back to the 1930s, to look at how the climate has changed in the past century, while also looking forward to how it may change in the coming century. I'd like to give thanks to the Coeur d'Alene tribe for their permission to study and collect samples on their land and for sharing their equipment and their knowledge with me during this project. I'd also like to thank Walba and the U of I Summer, Research, Summer Undergraduate Research Fund for their generous financial support of this project. I would also like to thank and recognize Stephanie Estelle for her guidance and early support of this project. Without her mentorship, I would have had a much harder time getting started. Thank you so much for watching my talk today. I hope to see you at the question and answer session later. Um, and feel free to contact me via email at ehoots at uidaho.edu. Thanks so much, Beth. Uh, that was great. It was really interesting. Um, I really appreciated hearing about how you had to deal with uh, not being able to collect as much data as you had hoped because of a global pandemic. Um, that's something I think many of us are dealing with, both in and out of academia. So. Uh, I look forward to hearing how your work progresses. Uh, next up, we have Drew Stang. Drew is going to be talking to us today about some fish habitat in Clear Lake, California. Thanks, Drew. Hey there. My name is Drew Stang. I'm here to present my thesis research on impacts of hydrodynamic processes on pelagic fish habitat in Clear Lake, California. I just recently graduated UC Davis with my master's in civil and environmental engineering. And I'm now an engineer at Herrera Environmental Consultants in Seattle. So my thesis research took place in Clear Lake, California. Um, it's a large, shallow, polymictic, hypereutrophic lake located in Northern California. It regularly experiences large algal blooms. Um, and because of this, it has 
received a lot of attention and, and now UC Davis is leading a scientific study to figure out what the cause is of these algal blooms and what's forcing them. And so there's plenty of research being conducted by a number of my lab mates right now. Um, but my study is really focused, one, on quantifying the hydrodynamic processes uh, actually occurring in Clear Lake and specifically the lower arm, and then also looking at how eutrophication and hypoxia and increased stratification are changing fish habitat in Clear Lake. And so specifically looking at the map on, on the right here, um, you can see Clear Lake and see that it's multi-basin. Um, and my study took place specifically in the lower arm there um, within the red box. And so it's only a sub portion of the lake, but it's also the deepest portion and representative of the rest. So really because of time, I'm only gonna focus on the fish side of this study, um, but just note that the hydrodynamics were also focused, but just really don't have time to cover it. So just gonna focus on the fish results and go from there. So the objectives behind this study really in regards to the fish were to look at how hypoxia was going to alter uh, their distribution throughout the water column. And so really, um, I guess the idea would be that hypolimnetic hypoxia is forcing these fish out of their preferred habitat. And then also that because of stratification that these fish are going to be forced out of maybe their preferred epilimnetic habitat. And when you combine both of these together, um, their habitat is going to be reduced and maybe they'll be squeezed into a confined area within the lake. Um, and there's been a few studies in the past that have referred this to this as the thermal dissolved oxygen squeeze. It's really limiting their habitat, increasing species overlap, um, and can have a number of, of other effects um, for, the, for the populations as a whole. And so these are a few of the fish um, just in this figure to the right. Um, that are common pelagic fish in Clear Lake. And so we have largemouth bass, common carp, threadfin shad, crappie, and a number of catfish species. So for the field study, we deployed a number of instruments and really it sort of narrows down to an echo sounder and a uh, instrument chain with thermistors and dissolved oxygen sensors. And so on the right first, looking at this instrument chain, it was subsurface to avoid any boating incidents. Um, it had thermistors, dissolved oxygen sensors, and uh, they were basically distributed throughout the water column and provided a full profile of temperature and, and DO um, through the study period. And then 100 meters away from this, we had an echo sounder that was deployed on the bottom, up, looking up with uh, pretty high vertical resolution and temporal resolution of one second sampling intervals and one centimeter vertical cells. This is just to capture any size of fish, um, any fish that would pass over the beam. And so as these fish are passing over the beam of this echo sounder and identified as fish, we associated temperature and dissolved oxygen to each one of these fish. And so at the end of the day, we had a pretty robust data set um, for these fish with associated temperature, DO, depth, time of day. And, um, you know, it was, it was a lot of data and a lot of process, but at the end of the day, um, using, you know, sort of these newer instruments really produced uh, a unique data set that you wouldn't otherwise get using standard methods such as gill nets or um, CTD profiles, you know, maybe three days of the month. And so we deployed all these instruments throughout August 2019 um, in hopes to see, I guess, some hypoxia develop during this time and sort of to prove this hypothesis of the thermal dissolved oxygen squeeze. And so looking first at the physical conditions before we dive into to more of the fish related data, um, we can see here there's, there's two contour plots, uh, temperatures on top and DO is on the bottom. And so this is over, you know, August 2019 and the instruments in their sort of spacing throughout the water column um, are on the y-axis and indicated by these white dots. Um, and the hypoxic periods are uh, identified by the black bars on the x-axis. And so you can see there were three hypoxic events um, you know, associated with these stratification events as well. And another thing to note, specifically looking at the temperature profile that the water column is oscillating and changing on this sort of diurnal um, period, or period. And, you know, 
this is largely because of diurnal winds. And this is really what we found in the hydrodynamic study. This is really what's forcing the system. And so you can also see this in the DO data as well. It's a little clearer in the temperature, but dissolved oxygen is also fluctuating quite significantly. And this is because of a lot of the horizontal transport. This is due to thermocline tilting. So it's a little bit of everything, but it is a really highly dynamic system. Um, but we did see some hypoxia develop um, not maybe not as much as we would have preferred, you know, just for this study improving this concept. But it was a great year for the lake. Not too many algal blooms, um, and overall, uh, I think it gave us, you know, enough data in these conditions um, to actually prove this concept. And so, these are what the raw sort of echo sounder results look like. And this is, in, I guess, what I will refer to it as as an echogram. On the x-axis, we have day of year. On the y, we have depth. And the color scale is volume, volumetric backscatter strength. And so this is basically just, you know, all these darker blobs in the water column are identified as fish. And basically, these echograms, all this data was input to an algorithm that I made that used uh, thresholding techniques to identify fish and sort of exclude noise. Um, you know, you can see a lot of other particles in the water, and this, these are likely algae, suspended sediments. Um, you know, there actually are a lot of micro bubbles in the upper water column um, that got excluded from this image, but largely you can just see that these fish are identified um, throughout this period. It's a rather active period, um, but this sort of gets the point across of how we actually identified these fish. So looking at the data, sort of data set as a whole, really, um, we have a few bar plots here. And on the y-axis, we have total fish count. And on the x, we have a few of these parameters, depth, temperature, time of day, and dissolved oxygen. And so first looking at depth, you can see this bimodal distribution. And this really brings out a great point from this data set in that it's, you know, we're identifying air bladders of fish. And we don't necessarily know which species of fish is associated with each one of these um, signals. And so this bimodal distribution really sort of points out that, you know, over the whole month of August, it's, it's really likely that there is several different species going on and two clearly preferred two different depths. And that's one hypothesis of this, but it, it does bring out a, a great point. And then looking at C, the time of day plot, we can see that most of the fish pinged and identified are around sunset and sunrise. Um, and then looking down at temperature, uh, we can see that, you know, it really doesn't tell us too much very clearly. And we'll get back to temperature in a few slides. But focusing now on dissolved oxygen, uh, you can see really that, that there's no fish identified below four milligrams per liter um, of DO. And so sort of the first question that I asked myself when I saw this was, you know, well, how much how much available habitat was below this four milligrams per liter? And so these next two plots sort of show this a little bit more clear. And on these, the bars, the lightly shaded bars are available habitat and sort of showing that distribution throughout um, each period. And then the dots and the lines are the fish distribution. And so looking first at the top plot, um, this is the hypoxic periods. And so this, this is basically Look, you know, reflecting back on that plot of temperature and DO, these were just the periods where hypoxia was present in the water column. And then the blue plot is periods where the water column was normoxic or there was the absence of hypoxia. And so for the normoxic um, the blue plot on the bottom, you can see that the fish distribution really matches the available habitat, meaning that fish were pretty well distributed throughout the water column. Uh, during this time. And then as we jump up to the hypoxic period, um, we can see that the distribution of fish and the distribution of available habitat don't really cross over very well and they're not similar. And there was DO uh, concentrations below four, mil four milligrams per liter, but more so, you know, looking at the fact that fish were found at higher DO concentrations. Um, and one hypothesis of this could be that you know, these higher DO concentrations are a result of, you know, more primary production. Therefore, there's most, more zooplankton there, you know, planktivorous 
fish um, and then piscivorous fish as well. So maybe just, you know, a lot more fish aggregated near this area. And then looking at the data set at, you know, maybe a finer temporal resolution here, um, we can see that the fish react to changes in the water column. And so at first on the left side of this plot, we can see that, you know, at this period, um, it was stratified, there was hypolimnetic hypoxia, and then there was a mixing event due to strong winds. The water column was mixed and the fish, you know, pretty quickly um, distributed back down um, into the hypolimnia and, and sort of filling in this area of the lake. And so that was also interesting to see sort of the response and how quickly that actually happened. And so another sort of key finding that we, we found was that there was a correlation between where the fish were and where the metalimnion or thermocline was located. And so as stratification increased, fish were more likely to be near the metalimnion. And then you can sort of see it in this image showing this bottom boundary of fish indicated by the white dots um, fluctuates up and down as temperature also fluctuates. And so this um, color map in the back is of temperature and you can sort of see this sort of color gradient or temperature gradient and as that oscillates up and down so does this bottom boundary of fish and the red line is um, hypoxia four milligrams per liter and then the white and black line is the mean biomass depth and so really this sort of points out that you know these fish are aggregating towards the metalimnion for one reason or another and this sort of supports this hypothesis that fish are aggregating closer to where there is food available. And so oftentimes in lakes, you're gonna get, um, you know, higher populations of zooplankton um, near the, the thermocline, thus um, you may also have more planktivorous fish there as well. So it was a really sort of interesting study and really the, the key takeaways here, one is that four milligram per liter hypox hypoxia avoidance threshold. Um, similar studies have come out with three milligrams per liter. Um, for Clear Lake, four milligrams per liter seem to be the ticket. Um, but then overall, these physical conditions really do seem to control fish either directly or indirectly, whether that be from hypoxia or thermal tolerances or um, food availability as well. And so as climate change sort of continues to affect, the, affect these lakes um, through time, you know, these conditions of hypoxia um, and, and stronger stratification of stratification events um, are likely going to be more frequent and this thermal dissolved oxygen squeeze is likely also to become more frequent. And there's a number of ecological impacts um, that this may sort of induce, um, but, you know, climate change certainly, um, amongst many other things, is, is not going to help this. And so another sort of key point of this study is that it sort of you know, shows how these newer technologies that are becoming more and more available to us in these instrumentation that we can deploy sort of provide insight to, to what's actually occurring in the lake um, that we wouldn't see otherwise. And so, um, you know, if we went out there once again with a gill net and a CTD, we wouldn't be able to capture the whole month of August as, as easily as we did here and likely wouldn't be able to make some of these conclusions that we, we were able to in this study. So. Um, overall, it's been, you know, a great study, and I've really enjoyed working out on Clear Lake. Um, hoping to publish it, so, you know, we'll see about that and see where that goes. But I really hope you enjoyed um, hearing about my research, and I'm looking forward to taking your questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Drew. And thanks to all of our presenters today. You guys did a great job uh, dealing with our last minute changes. Uh, so we're going to hop into some Q&A. Uh, if you guys have any more questions that you'd like to send our presenters, please send them along to info at walpa.org. Uh, our first question is going to be for Angela. Was there much diversity in macrophytes? And if so, was there much of a difference between the ponds? We did not look at macrophytes um, in part because of just time limitations of being out there when um, trying to get to as many ponds as possible in the shortest period of time. So we were kind of focused on getting, you know, some baseline conditions for nutrients, um, uh, macroinvertebrates and zooplankton, but there's certainly a lot more work that could and should be done. There certainly is a lot of um, 
uh, riparian vegetation in a lot of them. Uh, alder is a is a big player there, and we know that um, as an end fixer, that's certainly has an influence um, on the ponds themselves. So yeah, that's something we really like to look at uh, in the future. Okay, our next question is for Rebecca. Uh, first comment, great job adapting to the technical difficulties. And now our question, were the isotopic measurements of the fish done on muscle tissue or organ tissue? And would organ tissues give you a better idea of short-term or seasonal reliance? My uh, isotopes were done on muscle tissue, and I do not remember whether muscle or some or liver is uh, short term or a, better at short term versus better at long term. But I will review that. Fantastic. Okay, and a question for Beth. Is an albida a generalist herbivore or does it specialize on Eurasian milfoil? That's a great question. It is a generalist as far as we can tell. Um, Stephanie Estelle, who I think in my acknowledgments, her master's thesis actually goes more into depth on that. Fantastic. Okay. And we have one more question for Angela. That is what factors contribute to differences in chemistry, residence time, et cetera, between the ponds? Yeah, I wish we knew. Um, we know we kind of know part of the part of the answer to that. So how much groundwater is playing a role is going to influence conductivity, especially if um, some of these are drying out. So as they're drying, it's going to get more and more kind of concentrated. So um, the groundwater reliance, and I think that's partially, largely a function of just how deep they are. So how, you know, deep do they go down to the hip of the groundwater? Or are they more kind of shallow and superficial and are being mostly influenced by snowmelt and, and, and precipitation? And so our idea is that pairing the hydrology with, um, not the hydrology, but the uh, isotopes, um, they kind of represent the hydrology and pairing that with real-time measurements will help us get a better idea about what are driving some of those differences. Um, so that's kind of a work in progress. Great. Okay, that is all we have for questions for this afternoon. I want to thank all of our presenters once again, uh, not just for this session, but all of our presenters all day and all of our attendees as well as our sponsors and a congratulations to our scholarship winners. Um, I know this was a long day for everyone in our first online conference, but I think it went really well aside from our little blitz here and there. Um, I wanna remind everyone that our day tomorrow starts at 8 a.m. We have a really great panel set up for public access in Washington Lakes. Um, and I think that's all we have for now. Thanks again to everyone and we'll see you back here tomorrow morning at eight.